This is section thirty five of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume one, part one, eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six. Chapter thirty five. The Minor. He had about exhausted his own funds by this time, and it was necessary that Orion should become the financier. The brothers owned their Esmeralda claims in partnership and it was agreed that orion out of his modest depleted pay should furnish the means while the other would go actively into the field and develop their riches neither had the slightest doubt but that they would be millionaires presently and both were willing to struggle and starve for the few intervening weeks it was february when the printer pilot miner arrived in aurora that rough turbulent camp of the esmeralda district lying about one hundred miles south of Carson City, on the edge of California, in the Sierra Slopes. Everything was frozen and covered with snow, but there was no lack of excitement and prospecting and grabbing for feet in this ledge and that, buried deep under the ice and drift. The new arrival camped with Horatio Phillips, Raish, in a tiny cabin with a domestic roof, the ruins of it still stands and they cooked and bunked together and combined their resources in a common fund. Bob Howland joined them presently, and later an experienced miner, Calvin H. Higby, Cal, one day to be immortalized in the story of Roughing It, and in the dedication of that book. Around the cabin stove they would gather and paw over their specimens, or test them with a blowpipe and horn spoon, after which they would plan tunnels and figure estimates of prospective wealth. Never mind if the food was poor and scanty, and the chill wind came in everywhere, and the roof leaked like a filter. They were living in a land where all the mountains were banked with nuggets, where all the rivers ran gold. Bob Howland declared later that they used to go out at night and gather up empty champagne bottles and fruit tins and pile them in the rear of their cabin to convey to others the appearance of affluence and high living. When they lacked for other employment and were likely to be discouraged, the ex-pilot would ride the bunk and smoke and, without money and without price, distribute riches more valuable than any they would ever dig out of those Esmeralda hills. At other times he talked little or not at all, but sat in one corner and wrote, wholly oblivious of his surroundings. They thought he was writing letters, though letters were not many, and only to Orion during this period. It was the old literary impulse stirring again, the desire to set things down for their own sake, the natural hunger for print. One or two of his earliest letters home had found their way into a Keokuk paper, the Gate City. Copies containing them had gone back to Orion, who had shown them to a representative of the territorial enterprise, a young man named Barstow, who thought them amusing. The enterprise reprinted at least one of these letters, or portions of it, and with this encouragement the author of it sent an occasional contribution direct to that paper over the pen name Josh. He did not care to sign his own name. He was a miner who was soon to be a magnate. He had no desire to be known as a camp scribbler. He received no pay for these offerings, and expected none. They were sketches of a broadly burlesque sort, the robust horseplay kind of humor that belongs to the frontier. They were not especially promising efforts. One of them was about an old ragabones of a horse, a sort of preliminary study of Oahu, of the Sandwich Islands, or Baalbek and Jericho of Syria. If any one had told him, or had told any reader of this sketch, that the author of it was knocking at the door of the house of fame, such a person's judgment or sincerity would have been open to doubt. Nevertheless it was true, though the knock was timid and halting, and the summons to cross the threshold long delayed. A winter mining camp is the most bleak and comfortless of places. The saloon and gambling house furnished the only real warmth and cheer. Our Aurora miners would have been less than human, or more, if they had not found diversion now and then in the happy harbors of sin. Once there was a great ball given at a newly opened pavilion, 
and sam clemens is said to have distinguished himself by his unrestrained and spontaneous enjoyment of the tripping harmony cal higby who was present writes in changing partners whenever he saw a hand raised he would grasp it with great pleasure and sail off into another set oblivious to his surroundings sometimes he would act as though there was no use in trying to go right or to dance like other people and with his eyes closed he would do a hoedown or a double shuffle all alone talking to himself and saying that he never dreamed there was so much pleasure to be obtained at a ball it was all as natural as a child's play by the second set all the ladies were falling over themselves to get him for a partner and most of the crowd too full of mirth to dance were standing or sitting around dying with laughter what a child he always was always to the very end with the first break of winter the excitement that had been fermenting and stewing around camp stoves overflowed into the streets washed up the gullies and assailed the hills there came then a period of madness beside which the humbled excitement had been mere intoxication higby says it was amazing how wild the people became all over the pacific coast in san francisco and other large cities barbers hack drivers servant girls merchants and nearly every class of people would club together and send agents representing all the way from five thousand to five hundred thousand or more to buy mines they would buy anything in the shape of quartz whether it contained any mineral value or not the letters which went from the aurora miner to orion are humanly documentary they are likely to be staccato in their movement they show nervous haste in their composition eagerness and suppressed excitement they are not always coherent they are seldom humorous except in a savage way they are often profane they are likely to be violent even the handwriting has a terse look the flourish of youth has gone out of it altogether they reveal the tense anxiety of the gambling mania of which mining is the ultimate form an extract from a letter of april is a fair exhibit work not yet begun on the horatio and darby haven't seen it yet it is still in the snow shall begin on it within three or four weeks strike the ledge in july guess it is good worth from thirty dollars to fifty dollars a foot in california man named gephardt shot here yesterday while trying to defend a claim on last chance hill expect he will die these mills here are not worth a damn except clayton's and it is not in full working trim yet send me forty dollars or fifty dollars by mail immediately i go to work tomorrow with pick and shovel something's got to come by god before i let go here by the end of april work had become active in the mines though the snow in places was still deep and the ground stony with frost on the twenty eighth he writes i have been at work all day blasting and digging and damning one of our new claims dashaway which i don't think a great deal of but which i am willing to try we are down now ten or twelve feet we are following down under the ledge but not taking it out if we get up a windlass tomorrow we shall take out the ledge and see whether it is worth anything or not it must have been hard work picking away at the flinty ledges in the cold and the dash away would seem to have proven a disappointment for there is no promising mention of it again instead we hear of the flyaway and annapolitan and the live yankee and of a dozen others each of which holds out the beacon of hope for a little while and then passes from notice forever in may it is the monitor that is sure to bring affluence though realization is no longer regarded as immediate to use a french expression i have got my damned satisfy at last 
two years time will make us capitalists in spite of anything therefore we need fret and fume and worry and doubt no more but just lie still and put up with privation for six months perhaps three months will let us out then if government refuses to pay the rent on your new office we can do it ourselves we have got to wait six weeks anyhow for a dividend maybe longer but that it will come there is no shadow of a doubt i have got the thing sifted down to a dead moral certainty i own one-eighth of the new monitor ledge clemens company and money can't buy a foot of it because i know it to contain our fortune the ledge is six feet wide and one needs no glass to see gold and silver in it when you and i came out here we did not expect sixty-three or sixty-four to find us rich men and if that proposition had been made we would have accepted it gladly now it is made i am willing now that neary's tunnel or anybody else's tunnel shall succeed some of them may beat us a few months but we shall be on hand in the fullness of time as sure as fate i would hate to swap chances with any member of the tribe it is the same man who twenty-five years later would fasten his faith and capital to a typesetting machine and refuse to exchange stock in it share for share with the mergenthaler linotype he adds but i have struck my tent in esmeralda and i care for no mines but those which i can superintend myself i am a citizen here now and i am satisfied although ratio and i are strapped and we haven't three days rations in the house i shall work the monitor and the other claims with my own hands i prospected three quarters of a pound of monitor yesterday and raish reduced it with the blowpipe and got about ten or twelve cents in gold and silver besides the other half of it which we split on the floor and didn't get i tried to break a handsome chunk from a huge piece of my darling monitor which we brought from the croppings yesterday but it all splintered up and i send you the scraps i call that choice any damn fool would don't ask if it has been assayed for it hasn't it don't need it it is simply able to speak for itself it is six feet wide on top and traversed through with veins whose color proclaims their worth what the devil does a man want with any more feet when he owns in the invincible bomb-proof monitor there is much more of this and other such letters most of them ending with demands for money the living the tools the blasting powder and the help eat it up faster than orion's salary can grow send me fifty dollars or one hundred dollars all you can spare put away one hundred and fifty dollars subject to my call we shall need it soon for the tunnel the letters are full of such admonition and orion more insane if anything than his brother is scraping his dollars and pennies together to keep the mines going he is constantly warned to buy no claims on his own account and promises faithfully but cannot resist now and then when luring baits are laid before him though such ventures invariably result in violent and profane protests from aurora the pick and shovel are the only claims i have 
any confidence in now the miner concludes from one fierce outburst my back is sore and my hands are blistered with handling them today but even the pick and shovel did not inspire confidence a little later he writes that the work goes slowly very slowly but that they still hope to strike it some day but if we strike it rich i've lost my guess that's all then he adds couldn't go on the hill today it snowed it always snows here i expect and the final heartsick line don't you suppose they have pretty much quit writing at home this is midsummer and snow still interferes with the work one feels the dreary uselessness of the quest yet resolution did not wholly die or even enthusiasm these things were as recurrent as new prospects which were plentiful enough in a still subsequent letter he declares that he will never look upon his mother's face again or his sister's or get married or revisit the banner state until he is a rich man though there is less assurance than desperation in the words in roughing it the author tells us that when flour had reached one dollar a pound and he could no longer get the dollar he abandoned mining and went to milling as a common laborer in a quartz mill at ten dollars a week this statement requires modification it was not entirely for the money that he undertook the laborious task of washing riffles and screening tailings the money was welcome enough no doubt but the greater purpose was to learn refinering so that when his mines developed he could establish his own mill and personally superintend the work it is like him to wish us to believe that he was obliged to give up being a mining magnate to become a laborer in a quartz mill for there is a grim humor in the confession that he abandoned the milling experiment at the end of a week is a true statement he got a violent cold in the damp place and came near getting salivated he says in a letter working in the quicksilver and chemicals i hardly think i shall try the experiment again it is a confining business and i will not be confined for love or money as recreation after this trying experiment higby took him on a tour prospecting for the traditional cement mine a lost claim where in a deposit of cement rock gold nuggets were said to be as thick as raisins in a fruit cake they did not find the mine but they visited mono lake that ghastly lifeless alkali sea among the hills which in roughing it he has so vividly pictured it was good to get away from the stress of things and they repeated the experiment they made a walking trip to yosemite carrying their packs camping and fishing in that far tremendous isolation which in those days few human beings had ever visited at all such trips furnished a delicious respite from the fevered struggle around tunnel and shaft amid mountain peaks giant forests and by tumbling falls the quest for gold hardly seemed worth while more than once that summer he went alone into the wilderness to find his balance and to get away entirely from humankind end of chapter thirty five the miner read by john greenman this is section thirty six of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter thirty six last mining days it was late in july when he wrote if i do not forget it i will send you per next mail a pinch of decom decomposed rock which i pinched with thumb and finger from wide west ledge a while ago raish and i have secured two hundred out of a company with four hundred feet in it which perhaps the ledge i mean is a spur 
from the W. W. Our shaft is about one hundred feet from the W. W. shaft. In order to get in, we agreed to sink thirty feet. We have sublet to another man for fifty feet, and we pay for powder and sharpening tools. This was the blind lead claim of roughing it, but the episode as set down in that book is somewhat dramatized. It is quite true that he visited and nursed Captain Nye while Higby was off following the cement ignis fatus, and that the wide west holdings were forfeited through neglect. But if the loss was regarded as a heavy one, the letters fail to show it. It is a matter of dispute today whether or not the claim was ever of any value. A well-known California author, Ella Sterling Cummins, author of The, the Files, etc., declares, No one need to fear that he ran any chance of being a millionaire through the wide west mine, for the writer, as a child, played over that historic spot and saw only a shut-down mill and desolate hole in the ground to mark the spot where over-hopeful men had sunk thousands and thousands that they never recovered. The blind lead episode, as related, is presumably a tale of what might have happened, a possibility rather than an actuality. It is vividly true in atmosphere, however, and forms a strong and natural climax for closing the mining episode while the literary privilege warrants any liberties he may have taken for art's sake. In reality, the close of his mining career was not sudden and spectacular. It was a lingering close, a reluctant and gradual surrender. The Josh letters to the Enterprise had awakened at least a measure of interest, and Orion had not failed to identify their author when any promising occasion offered. As a result, certain tentative overtures had been made for similar material. Orion eagerly communicated such chances, for the money situation was becoming a desperate one. A letter from the Aurora Miner, written near the end of July, presents the situation very fully. An extract or two will be sufficient. My debts are greater than I thought for. I bought twenty-five dollars worth of clothing and sent twenty-five dollars to Higby in the cement diggings. I owe about forty-five dollars or fifty dollars, and have got about forty-five dollars in my pocket. But how in the hell I am going to live on something over one hundred dollars until October or November is singular. The fact is, I must have something to do, and that shortly, too. Now, write to the Sacramento Union folks, or to Marsh, and tell them I'll write as many letters a week as they want for ten dollars a week. My board must be paid. Tell them I have corresponded with the New Orleans Crescent and other papers, and the Enterprise. If they want letters from here, who'll run from morning till night collecting material cheaper? I'll write a short letter twice a week for the present, for the age, for five dollars per week. Now it has been a long time since I couldn't make my own living and it shall be a long time before i loaf another year nothing came of these possibilities but about this time barstow of the enterprise conferred with joseph t goodman editor and owner of the paper as to the advisability of adding the author of the josh letters to their local staff joe goodman who had as keen a literary perception as any man that ever pitched a journalistic tent on the pacific coast and there could be no higher praise than that looked over the letters and agreed with barstow that the man who wrote them had something in him two of the sketches in particular he thought promising 
one of them was a burlesque report of an egotistical lecturer who was referred to as professor personal pronoun it closed by stating that it was impossible to print his lecture in full as the type cases had run out of capital i's but it was the other sketch which settled goodman's decision it was also a burlesque report this time of a fourth of july oration it opened i was sired by the great american eagle and foaled by a continental dam this was followed by a string of stock patriotic phrases absurdly arranged but it was the opening itself that won goodman's heart that is the sort of thing we want he said write to him barstow and ask him if he wants to come up here barstow wrote offering twenty five dollars a week a tempting sum this was at the end of july eighteen sixty two in roughing it we are led to believe that the author regarded this as a gift from heaven and accepted it straightway as a matter of fact he fasted and prayed a good while over the call to orion he wrote barstow has offered me the post as local reporter for the enterprise at twenty-five dollars a week and i have written him that i will let him know next mail if possible there was no desperate eagerness you see to break into literature even under those urgent conditions it meant the surrender of all hope in the mines the confession of another failure on august seventh he wrote again to orion he had written to barstow he said asking when they thought he might be needed he was playing for time to consider now i shall leave at midnight to-night alone and on foot for a walk of sixty or seventy miles through a totally uninhabited country and it is barely possible that mail facilities may prove infernally slow but do you write barstow that i have left here for a week or so and in case he should want me he must write me here or let me know through you so he had gone into the wilderness to fight out his battle alone but eight days later when he had returned there was still no decision in a letter to pamela of this date he refers playfully to the discomforts of his cabin and mentions a hope that he will spend the winter in san francisco but there is no reference in it to any newspaper prospects nor to the mines for that matter phillips howland and higby would seem to have given up by this time and he was camping with dan twing and a dog a combination amusingly described it is a pleasant enough letter but the note of discouragement creeps in i did think for a while of going home this fall but when i found that that was and had been the cherished intention and the darling aspiration every year of these old careworn californians for twelve weary years i felt a little uncomfortable so i stole a march on disappointment and said i would not go home this fall this country suits me and it shall suit me whether or no he was dying hard desperately hard how could he know to paraphrase the old form of christian comfort that his end as a miner would mean in another sphere a brighter resurrection than even his rainbow imagination could paint end of chapter thirty six last mining days read by john greenman this is section thirty seven of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter thirty seven the new estate it was the afternoon of a hot dusty august day when a worn 
travel-stained pilgrim drifted laggingly into the office of the virginia city enterprise then in its new building on c street and loosening a heavy roll of blankets from his shoulders dropped wearily into a chair he wore a rusty slouch hat no coat a faded blue flannel shirt a navy revolver his trousers were hanging on his boot tops a tangle of reddish-brown hair fell on his shoulders and a mass of tawny beard dingy with alkali dust dropped halfway to his waist aurora lay one hundred and thirty miles from virginia he had walked that distance carrying his heavy load editor goodman was absent at the moment but the other proprietor dennis e mccarthy signified that the caller might state his errand the wanderer regarded him with a far-away look and said absently and with deliberation my starboard leg seems to be unshipped i'd like about one hundred yards of line i think i am falling to pieces then he added i want to see mr barstow or mr goodman my name is clemens and i've come to write for the paper it was the master of the world's widest estate come to claim his kingdom william wright who had won a wide celebrity on the coast as dan de quill was in the editorial chair and took charge of the new arrival he was going on a trip to the states soon it was mainly on this account that the new man had been engaged the josh letters were very good in dan's opinion he gave their author a cordial welcome and took him around to his boarding place it was the beginning of an association that continued during samuel clemens stay in virginia city and of a friendship that lasted many years the territorial enterprise was one of the most remarkable frontier papers ever published its editor-in-chief joseph goodman was a man with rare appreciation wide human understanding and a comprehensive newspaper policy being a young man he had no policy in fact beyond the general purpose that his paper should be a forum for absolutely free speech provided any serious statement it contained was based upon knowledge his instructions to the new reporter were about as follows never say we learn so and so or it is rumored or we understand so and so we go to headquarters and get the absolute facts then speak out and say it is so and so in the one case you are likely to be shot and in the other you are pretty certain to be but you will preserve the public confidence goodman was not new to the west he had come to california as a boy and had been a miner explorer printer and contributor by turns early in sixty one when the comstock load named for its discoverer henry t p comstock a half crazy miner who realized very little from his stupendous find was new and virginia in the first flush of its monster boom he and dennis mccarthy had scraped together a few dollars and bought the paper it had been a hand-to-hand -hand struggle for a while but in a brief two years from a starving sheet and a shanty the enterprise with new building new presses and a corps of swift compositors brought up from san francisco had become altogether metropolitan as well as the most widely considered paper on the coast it had been borne upward by the comstock tide though its fearless picturesque utterance would have given it distinction anywhere goodman himself was a fine forceful writer and dan de quill and r m daggett afterward united states minister to hawaii were representative of enterprise men the comstock of that day became famous for its journalism associated with the virginia papers then or soon afterward were such men as tom fitch the silver-tongued orator alf doten w j forbes c c goodwin h r mcgells clement t rice arthur mcgewen and sam davis a great array indeed for a new territory samuel clemens fitted precisely into this group he added the fresh rugged vigor of thought and expression that was the very essence of the comstock 
which was like every other frontier mining camp only on a more lavish more overwhelming scale there was no uncertainty about the comstock the silver and gold were there flanking the foot of mount davidson the towns of gold hill and virginia and the long street between were fairly underburrowed and underpinned by the gigantic mining construction of that opulent load whose treasures were actually glutting the mineral markets of the world the streets overhead seethed and swarmed with miners mine owners and adventurers riotous rollicking children of fortune always ready to drink and make merry as eager in their pursuit of pleasure as of gold comstockers would always laugh at a joke the rougher the better the town of virginia itself was just a huge joke to most of them everybody had money everybody wanted to laugh and have a good time the enterprise comstock to the backbone did what it could to help things along it was a sort of free ring with every one for himself goodman let the boys write and print in accordance with their own ideas upon any subject often they wrote of each other squibs and burlesques which gratified the comstock far more than mere news the indifference to news was noble none the less so because it was so blissfully unconscious editors mark or dan would dismiss a murder with a couple of inches and sit down and fill up a column with a fancy sketch arthur McEwen. it was the proper classroom for mark twain an encouraging audience and free utterance fortune could have devised nothing better for him than that he was peculiarly fitted for the position unspoiled humanity appealed to him and the comstock presented human nature in its earliest landscape forms furthermore the comstock was essentially optimistic so was he any hole in the ground to him held a possible even a probable fortune his pilot memory became a valuable asset in news-gathering remembering marks banks sounding and other river detail belonged apparently in the same category of attainments as remembering items and localities of news he could travel all day without a notebook and at night reproduce the day's budget or at least the picturesqueness of it without error he was presently accounted a good reporter except where statistics measurements and figures were concerned these he gave a lick and a promise according to de quille who wrote afterward of their associations de quille says further mark and i agreed well in our work which we divided when there was a rush of events but we often cruised in company he taking the items of news he could handle best and i such as i felt competent to work up however we wrote at the same table and frequently helped each other with such suggestions as occurred to us during the brief consultations we held in regard to the handling of any matters of importance never was there an angry word between us in all the time we worked together de quille tells how clemens clipped items with a knife when there were no scissors handy and slashed through on the top of his desk which in time took on the semblance of a huge polar star spiritedly dashing forth a thousand rays the author of roughing it has given us a better picture of the virginia city of those days and his work there than any one else will ever write he has made us feel the general spirit of affluence that prevailed how the problem was not to get money but to spend it how feet in any one of a hundred mines could be had for the asking how such shares were offered like apples or cigars or bonbons as a natural matter of courtesy when one happened to have his supply in view how any one connected with a newspaper would have stocks thrust upon him and how in a brief time he had acquired a trunk full of such riches and usually had something to sell when any of the claims made a stir on the market he has told us of the desperadoes and their trifling regard for human life and preserved other elemental characters of these prodigal days the funeral of buck fanshaw that amazing masterpiece is a complete epitome of the social frontier it would not be the part of wisdom to attempt another inclusive presentation of comstock conditions 
we may only hope to add a few details of history justified now by time and circumstances to supplement the picture with certain data of personality preserved from the drift of years end of chapter thirty seven the new estate read by john greenman this is section thirty eight of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter thirty eight one of the staff the new reporter found acquaintance easy the office force was like one family among which there was no line of caste proprietors editors and printers were social equals there was little ceremony among them none at all outside of the office the paper went to press at two in the morning then all the staff and all the compositors gathered themselves together in the composing room and drank beer and sang the popular war songs of the day until dawn s l c in 1908 samuel clemens immediately became sam or josh to his associates just as de quill was dan and goodman joe he found that he disliked the name of josh and as he did not sign it again it was presently dropped the office and virginia city generally quickly grew fond of him delighting in his originality and measured speech enterprise readers began to identify his work then unsigned and to enjoy its fresh phrasing even when it was only the usual local item or mining notice true to its name and reputation the paper had added a new attraction it was only a brief time after his arrival in virginia city that clemens began the series of hoaxes which would carry his reputation not always in an enviable fashion across the sierras and down the pacific coast with one exception these are lost to-day for so far as known there is not a single file of the enterprise in existence only a few stray copies and clippings are preserved and we know the story of some of these literary pranks and of their results they were usually intended as a special punishment of some particular individual or paper or locality but victims were gathered by the wholesale in their seductive web mark twain himself in his book of sketches has set down something concerning the first of these the petrified man and of another my bloody massacre but in neither case has he told it all the petrified man hoax was directed at an official named sewell a coroner and justice of the peace at humboldt who had been pompously indifferent in the matter of supplying news the story told with great circumstance and apparent care as to detail related the finding of a petrified prehistoric man partially embedded in a rock in a cave in the desert more than one hundred miles from humboldt and how sewell had made the perilous five-day journey in the alkali waste to hold an inquest over a man that had been dead three hundred years also how with that delicacy so characteristic of him sewell had forbidden the miners from blasting him from his position the account further stated that the hands of the deceased were arranged in a peculiar fashion and the description of the arrangement was so skillfully woven in with other matters that at first or even second reading one might not see that the position indicated was the ancient one which begins with the thumb at the nose and in many ages has been used impolitely to express ridicule and the word sold but the description was a shade too ingenious the author expected that the exchanges would see the jolt and perhaps assist in the fun he would have with sewell he did not contemplate a joke on the papers themselves as a matter of fact no one saw the cell and most of the papers printed his story of the petrified man as a genuine discovery this was a surprise and a momentary disappointment then he realized that he had builded better than he knew 
he gathered up a bundle of the exchanges and sent them to sewell also he sent marked copies to scientific men in various parts of the united states the papers had taken it seriously perhaps the scientists would some of them did and sewell's days became unhappy because of letters received asking further information as literature the effort did not rank high and as a trick on an obscure official it was hardly worth while but as a joke on the coast exchanges and press generally it was greatly regarded and its author though as yet unnamed acquired prestige inquiries began to be made as to who was the smart chap in virginia that did these things the papers became wary and read enterprise items twice before clipping them clemens turned his attention to other matters to lull suspicion the great dutch nick massacre did not follow until a year later reference has already been made to the comstock's delight and humor of a positive sort the practical joke was legal tender in virginia one might protest and swear but he must take it an example of comstock humor regarded as the finest assay is an incident still told of leslie blackburn and pat holland two gay men about town they were coming down c street one morning when they saw some fine watermelons on a fruit stand at the international hotel corner watermelons were rare and costly in that day and locality and these were worth three dollars apiece blackburn said pat let's get one of those watermelons you engage that fellow in conversation while i stand at the corner where i can step around out of sight easily when you've got him interested point to something on the back shelf and pitch me a melon this appealed to holland and he carried out his part of the plan perfectly but when he pitched the watermelon blackburn simply put his hands in his pockets stepped around the corner leaving the melon a fearful disaster on the pavement it was almost impossible for pat to explain to the fruit man why he pitched away a three-dollar melon like that even after paying for it and it was still more trying also more expensive to explain to the boys facing the various bars along c street sam clemens himself a practical joker in his youth found a healthy delight in this knock-down humor of the comstock it appealed to his vigorous elemental nature he seldom indulged physically in such things but his printed squibs and hoaxes and his keen love of the ridiculous placed him in the joker class while his prompt temper droll manner and rare gift of invective made him an enticing victim among the enterprise compositors was one by the name of stephen e gillis steve of course one of the fighting gillises a small fearless young fellow handsome quick of wit with eyes like needle-points steve weighed only ninety-five pounds mark twain once wrote of him but it was well known throughout the territory that with his fists he could whip anybody that walked on two legs let his weight and science be what they might clemens was fond of steve gillis from the first the two became closely associated in time and were always bosom friends but steve was a merciless joker and never as long as they were together could he resist the temptation of making sam swear claiming that his profanity was grander than any music a word here about mark twain's profanity born with a matchless gift of phrase the printing office the river and the mines had developed it in a rare perfection to hear him denounce a thing was to give one the fierce searching delight of galvanic waves every characterization seemed the most perfect fit possible until he applied the next and somehow his profanity was seldom an offense it was not mere idle swearing it seemed almost genuine and serious his selection of epithet was always dignified and stately from whatever source and it might be from the bible or the gutter some one has defined dirt as misplaced matter it is perhaps the greatest definition ever uttered 
it is absolutely universal in its application and it recurs now remembering mark twain's profanity for it was rarely misplaced hence it did not often offend it seemed in fact the safety valve of his high-pressure intellectual engine when he had blown off he was always calm gentle forgiving and even tender once following an outburst he said placidly in certain trying circumstances urgent circumstances desperate circumstances profanity furnishes a relief denied even to prayer it seems proper to add that it is not the purpose of this work to magnify or modify or excuse that extreme example of humankind which forms its chief subject but to set him down as he was inadequately of course but with good conscience and clear intent led by steve gillis the enterprise force used to devise tricks to set him going one of these was to hide articles from his desk he detested the work necessary to the care of a lamp and wrote by the light of a candle to hide sam's candle was a sure way to get prompt and vigorous return he would look for it a little then he would begin a slow circular walk a habit acquired in the limitations of the pilot house and his denunciation of the thieves was like a great orchestration of wrong by and by the office boy supposedly innocent would find another for him and all would be forgotten he made a placard labeled with fearful threats and anathemas warning anyone against touching his candle but one night both the placard and the candle were gone now among his virginia acquaintances was a young minister a mr rising the fragile gentle new fledgling of the buck fanshaw episode clemens greatly admired mr rising's evident sincerity and the young minister had quickly recognized the new reporter's superiority of mind now and then he came to the office to call on him unfortunately he happened to step in just at that moment when infuriated by the latest theft of his property samuel clemens was engaged in his rotary denunciation of the criminals oblivious of every other circumstance mr rising stood spellbound by this to him new phase of genius and at last his friend became dimly aware of him he did not halt in his scathing treadmill and continued in the slow monotone of speech i know mr rising i know it's wicked to talk like this i know it is wrong i know i shall certainly go to hell for it but if you had a candle mr rising and those thieves should carry it off every night i know that you would say just as i say mr rising god damned their impenitent souls may they roast in hell for a million years the little clergyman caught his breath maybe i should mr clemens he replied but i should try to say forgive them father they know not what they do oh well if you put it on the ground that they are just fools that alters the case as i am one of that class myself come in and we'll try to forgive them and forget about it mark twain had a good many experiences with young ministers he was always fond of them and they often sought him out once long afterward at a hotel he wanted a boy to polish his shoes and had rung a number of times without getting any response presently he thought he heard somebody approaching in the hall outside he flung open the door and a small youngish-looking person who seemed to have been hesitating at the door made a movement as though to depart hastily clemens grabbed him by the collar look here he said 
I've been waiting and ringing here for half an hour. Now, I want you to take those shoes and polish them quick. Do you hear? The slim, youthful person trembled a good deal and said, I would, Mr. Clemens, I would indeed, sir, if I could, but I'm a minister of the gospel and I'm not prepared for such work. End of chapter 38 One of the Staff Read by John Greenman This is section 39 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866 Chapter 39, Philosophy and Poetry there was a side to Samuel Clemens that in those days few of his associates saw. This was the poetic, the philosophic, the contemplative side. Joseph Goodman recognized this phase of his character, and while he perhaps did not regard it as a future literary asset, he delighted in it, and in their hours of quiet association together encouraged its exhibition. It is rather curious that with all his literary penetration, Goodman did not dream of a future celebrity for Clemens. He afterward said, If I had been asked to prophesy which of the two men, Dan De Quill or Sam, would become distinguished, I should have said De Quill. Dan was talented, industrious, and, for that time and place, brilliant. Of course, I recognized the unusualness of Sam's gifts, but he was eccentric and seemed to lack industry. It is not likely that I should have prophesied fame for him then. Goodman, like McFarlane in Cincinnati, half a dozen years before, though by a different method, discovered and developed the deeper vein. Often the two, dining together in a French restaurant, discussed life, subtler philosophies, recalled various phases of human history remembered and recited the poems that gave them especial enjoyment the burial of moses with its noble phrasing and majestic imagery appealed strongly to clemens and he recited it with great power the first stanza in particular always stirred him and it stirred his hearer as well with eyes half closed and chin lifted a lighted cigar between his fingers he would lose himself in the music of the stately lines. By Nemo's lonely mountain, on this side Jordan's wave, in a vale in the land of Moab, there lies a lonely grave. And no man knows that sepulchre, and no man saw it e'er. For the angels of God upturned the sod and laid the dead man there. Another stanza that he cared for almost as much was the one beginning, And had he not high honor the hillside for a pall to lie in state while angels wait with stars for tapers tall? and the dark rock pines like tossing plumes over his bier to wave and god's own hand in that lonely land to lay him in the grave without doubt he was moved to emulate the simple grandeur of that poem for he often repeated it in those days and somewhat later we find it copied into his notebook in full it would seem to have become to him a sort of literary touchstone, and in some measure it may be regarded as accountable for the fact that, in the fullness of time, he made use of the purest English of any modern writer. These are Goodman's words, though William Dean Howells has said them also, in substance, and Brander Matthews, and many others who know about such things. Goodman adds, the simplicity and beauty of his style are almost without a parallel, except in the common version of the Bible, which is also true. One is reminded of what Macaulay said of Milton, 
there would seem at first sight to be no more in his words than in other words but they are words of enchantment no sooner are they pronounced than the past is present and the distance near new forms of beauty start at once into existence and all the burial places of the memory give up their dead one drifts ahead remembering these things the triumph of words the mastery of phrases lay all before him at the time of which we are writing now he was twenty-seven at that age rudyard kipling had reached his meridian samuel clemens was still in the classroom everything came as a lesson phrase form aspect and combination nothing escaped unvalued the poetic phase of things particularly impressed him once at a dinner with goodman when the lamplight from the chandelier struck down through the claret on the tablecloth in a great red stain he pointed to it dramatically look joe he said the angry tint of wine it was at one of these private sessions late in sixty two that clemens proposed to report the coming meeting of the carson legislature he knew nothing of such work and had small knowledge of parliamentary proceedings formerly it had been done by a man named gillespie but gillespie was now clerk of the house goodman hesitated then remembering that whether clemens got the reports right or not he would at least make them readable agreed to let him undertake the work end of chapter thirty nine philosophy and poetry read by john greenman this is section forty of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty mark twain the early nevada legislature was an interesting assembly all state legislatures are that and this was a mining frontier no attempt can be made to describe it it was chiefly distinguished for a large ignorance of procedure a wide latitude of speech a noble appreciation of humor and plenty of brains how fortunate mark twain was in his schooling to be kept away from institutional training to be placed in one after another of those universities of life where the sole curriculum is the study of the native inclinations and activities of mankind sometimes in after years he used to regret the lack of systemic training well for him and for us that he escaped that blight for the study of human nature the nevada assembly was a veritable lecture room in it his understanding his wit his phrasing his self-assuredness grew like jack's beanstalk which in time was ready to break through into a land above the sky he made some curious blunders in his reports in the beginning but he was so frank in his ignorance and in his confession of it that the very unsophistication of his early letters became their chief charm gillespie coached him on parliamentary matters and in time the reports became technically as well as artistically good clemens in return christened gillespie young jefferson's manual a title which he bore rather proudly indeed for many years another entitlement growing out of those early reports and possibly less satisfactory to its owner was the one accorded to clement t rice of the virginia city union rice knew the legislative work perfectly and concluded to poke fun at the enterprise letters but this was a mistake clemens in his next letter declared that rice's reports might be parliamentary enough but that they covered with glittering technicalities the most festering mass of misstatement and even crime he avowed that they were wholly untrustworthy dubbed the author of them the unreliable and in future letters never referred to him by any other term carson and the comstock and the papers of the coast delighted in this burlesque journalistic warfare and rice was the unreliable for life rice and clemens it should be said though rivals were the best of friends and there was never any real animosity between them 
Clemens quickly became a favorite with the members. His sharp letters, with their amusing turn of phrase and their sincerity, won general friendship. Jack Simmons, Speaker of the House, and Billy Claggett, the Humboldt delegation, were his special cronies and kept him on the inside of the political machine. Claggett had remained in Unionville after the mining venture, warned his Keokuk sweetheart, and settled down into politics and law. In due time he would become a leading light and go to Congress. He was already a notable figure of forceful eloquence and tousled, unkempt hair. Simmons, Claggett, and Clemens were easily the three conspicuous figures of the session. It must have been gratifying to the former prospector and miner to come back to Carson City, a person of consequence, where less than a year before he had been regarded as no more than an amusing, indolent fellow, a figure to smile at, but unimportant. There is a photograph extant of Clemens and his friends Claggett and Simmons in a group, and we gather from it that he now arrayed himself in a long broadcloth cloak, a starched shirt, and polished boots. Once more he had become the glass of fashion that he had been on the river. He made his residence with Orion, whose wife and little daughter Jenny had by this time come out from the States. Sister Molly, as wife of the acting governor, was presently social leader of the little capital, her brilliant brother-in-law its chief ornament. His merriment and songs and good nature made him a favorite guest. His lines had fallen in pleasant places. He could afford to smile at the hard Esmeralda days. He was not altogether satisfied. His letters, copied and quoted along the coast, were unsigned. They were easily identified with one another, but not with a personality. He realized that to build a reputation it was necessary to fasten it to an individuality, a name. He gave the matter a good deal of thought. He did not consider the use of his own name. The nom de plume was the fashion of the time. He wanted something brief, crisp, definite, unforgettable. He tried over a good many combinations in his mind, but none seemed convincing. Just then, this was early in 1863, news came to him that the old pilot he had wounded by his satire, Isaiah Sellers, was dead. At once the pen-name of Captain Sellers recurred to him. That was it. That was the sort of name he wanted. It was not trivial. It had all the qualities. Sellers would never need it again. Clemens decided he would give it a new meaning and new association in this faraway land. He went up to Virginia City. Joe, he said to Goodman, I want to sign my articles. I want to be identified to a wider audience. All right, Sam, what name do you want to use? Josh? No. I want to sign them Mark Twain. It is an old river term, a leadsman's call, signifying two fathoms, twelve feet. It has a richness about it. It was always a pleasant sound for a pilot to hear on a dark night. It meant safe water. He did not then mention that Captain Isaiah Sellers had used and dropped the name. He was ashamed of his part in that episode, and the offense was still too recent for confession. Goodman considered a moment. "'Very well, Sam,' he said. "'That sounds like a good name.' It was indeed a good name. In all the nomenclature of the world no more forceful combination of words could have been selected to express the man for whom they stood. The name Mark Twain is as infinite, as fundamental, as that of John Smith, without the latter's wasting distribution of strength. If all the prestige in the name of John Smith were combined in a single individual, its dynamic energy might give it the carrying power of Mark Twain. Let this be as it may, it has proven the greatest nom de plume ever chosen, a name exactly in accord with the man, his work, and his career. It is not surprising that Goodman did not recognize this at the moment. 
we should not guess the force that lies in a twelve-inch shell if we had never seen one before or heard of its seismic destruction we should have to wait and see it fired and take account of the result it was first signed to a carson letter bearing date of february second eighteen sixty three and from that time was attached to all samuel clemens work the work was neither better nor worse than before but it had suddenly acquired identification and special interest members of the legislature and friends in virginia and carson immediately began to address him as mark the papers of the coast took it up and within a period to be measured by weeks he was no longer sam or clemens or that bright chap on the enterprise but mark mark twain no nom de plume was ever so quickly and generally accepted as that de quill returning from the east after an absence of several months found his room and deskmate with the distinction of a new name and fame it is curious that in the letters to the home folks preserved from that period there is no mention of his new title and its success in fact the writer rarely speaks of his work at all and is more inclined to tell of the mining shares he has accumulated their present and prospective values however many of the letters are undoubtedly missing such as have been preserved are rather airy epistles full of his abounding joy of life and good nature also they bear evidence of the renewal of his old river habit of sending money home twenty dollars in each letter with intervals of a week or so between end of chapter forty mark twain read by john greenman this is section forty one of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty one the cream of comstock humor with the adjournment of the legislature samuel clemens returned to virginia city distinctly a notability mark twain he was regarded as leading man on the enterprise which in itself was high distinction on the comstock while his improved dress and increased prosperity commanded additional respect when visitors of note came along well-known actors lecturers politicians he was introduced as one of the comstock features which it was proper to see along with ophir and gould and curry mines and the new hundred stamp quartz mill he was rather grieved and hurt therefore when after several collections had been taken up in the enterprise office to present various members of the staff with meerschaum pipes none had come to him he mentioned this apparent slight to steve gillis nobody ever gives me a meerschaum pipe he said plaintively don't i deserve one yet unhappy day to that remorseless creature steve gillis this was a golden opportunity for deviltry of a kind that delighted his soul this is the story precisely as gillis himself told it to the writer of these annals more than a generation later there was a german kept a cigar store in virginia city and always had a fine assortment of meerschaum pipes these pipes usually cost anywhere from forty to seventy-five dollars and one day dennis mccarthy and i were walking by the old german's place and stopped to look in at the display in the window among other things there was one large imitation meerschaum with a high bowl and a long stem marked a dollar and a half i decided that that would be just the pipe for sam we went in and bought it also a very much longer stem i think the stem alone cost three dollars then we had a little german silver plate engraved with mark's name on it and by whom presented and made preparations for the presentation charlie pope afterward proprietor of pope's theatre in st louis was playing at the opera house at the time and we engaged him to make the presentation speech then we let in dan de quill mark's closest friend 
to act the part of judas to tell mark privately that he was going to be presented with a fine pipe so that he could have a speech prepared in reply to pope's it was awful low down in dan we arranged to have the affair come off in the saloon beneath the opera house after the play was over everything went off handsomely but it was a pretty remorseful occasion and some of us had a hang-dog look for sam took it in such sincerity and had prepared one of the most beautiful speeches i ever heard him make pope's presentation too was beautifully done he told sam how his friends all loved him and that this pipe purchased at so great an expense was but a small token of their affection but sam's reply which was supposed to be impromptu actually brought the tears to the eyes of some of us and he was interrupted every other minute with applause i never felt so sorry for anybody still we were bent on seeing the thing through after sam's speech was finished he ordered expensive wines champagne and sparkling moselle then we went out to do the town and kept things going until morning to drown our sorrow well next day of course we started in to color the pipe it wouldn't color any more than a piece of chalk which was about all it was sam would smoke and smoke and complain that it didn't seem to taste right and that it wouldn't color finally dennis said to him one day oh sam don't you know that's just a damn old eggshell and that the boys bought it for a dollar and a half and presented you with it for a joke then sam was furious and we laid the whole thing on dan de quill he had a thundercloud on his face when he started up for the local room where dan was he went in and closed the door behind him and locked it and put the key in his pocket an awful sign dan was there alone writing at his table sam said dan did you know when you invited me to make that speech that those fellows were going to give me a bogus pipe there was no way for dan to escape and he confessed sam walked up and down the floor as if trying to decide which way to slay dan finally he said oh dan to think that you my dearest friend who knew how little money i had and how hard i would work to prepare a speech that would show my gratitude to my friends should be the traitor the judas to betray me with a kiss dan i never want to look on your face again you knew i would spend every dollar i had on those pirates when i couldn't afford to spend anything and yet you let me do it you aided and abetted their diabolical plan and you even got me to get up that damn speech to make the thing still more ridiculous of course dan felt terribly and tried to defend himself by saying that they were really going to present him with a fine pipe a genuine one this time but sam at first refused to be comforted and when a few days later i went in with the pipe and said sam here's the pipe the boys meant to give you all the time and tried to apologize he looked around a little coldly and said is that another of those bogus old pipes he accepted it though and general peace was restored one day soon after he said to me steve do you know that i think that that bogus pipe smokes about as well as the good one many years later this was in his home at hartford and joe goodman was present mark twain one day came upon the old imitation pipe joe he said that was a cruel cruel trick the boys played on me but for the feeling i had during the moment when they presented me with that pipe and when charlie pope was making his speech and i was making my reply to it for the memory of that feeling now that pipe is more precious to me than any 
pipe in the world. 1863 was flood tide on the Comstock. Every mine was working full blast. Every mill was roaring and crunching, turning out streams of silver and gold. A little while ago an old resident wrote, When I close my eyes I hear again the respirations of hoisting engines and the roar of stamps. I can see the camels after midnight packing in salt. I can see again the jam of teams on C Street, and hear the anathemas of the drivers, all the mighty work that went on in order to lure the treasures from the deep chambers of the great load, and to bring enlightenment to the desert. Those were lively times. In the midst of one of his letters home, Mark Twain interrupts himself to say, I have just heard five pistol shots down the street as such things are in my line i will go and see about it and in a postscript added a few hours later five a m the pistol shot did its work well one man a jackson county missourian shot two of my friends police officers through the heart both died within three minutes the murderer's name is john campbell mark and i had our hands full says de quill and no grass grew under our feet in answer to some stray criticism of their policy they printed a sort of editorial manifesto our duty is to keep the universe thoroughly posted concerning murders and street fights and balls and theaters and pack trains and churches and lectures and schoolhouses and city military affairs and highway robberies and bible societies and hay wagons and the thousand other things which it is in the province of local reporters to keep track of and magnify into undue importance for the instruction of the readers of a great daily newspaper it is easy to recognize mark twain's hand in that compendium of labor which in spite of its amusing apposition was literally true and so intended probably with no special thought of humor in its construction it may be said as well here as anywhere that it was not mark twain's habit to strive for humor he saw facts at curious angles, and phrased them accordingly. In Virginia City he mingled with the turmoil of the Comstock, and set down what he saw and thought in his native speech. The Comstock, ready to laugh, found delight in his expression, and discovered a vast humor in his most earnest statements. On the other hand, there were times when the humor was intended, and missed its purpose. We have already recalled the instance of the Petrified Man hoax, which was taken seriously, but the Empire City Massacre burlesque found an acceptance that even its author considered serious for a time. It is remembered today in Virginia City as the chief incident of Mark Twain's Comstock career. This literary bomb really had two objects one of which was to punish the San Francisco Bulletin for its persistent attacks on Washoe interests, the other, though this was merely incidental, to direct an unpleasant attention to a certain Carson saloon, the Magnolia, which was supposed to dispense whiskey of the Forty Rod brand, that is, a liquor warranted to kill at that range. It was the Bulletin that was to be made especially ridiculous, this paper had been particularly disagreeable concerning the dividend-cooking system of certain of the Comstock mines, at the same time calling invidious attention to safer investments in California stocks. Samuel Clemens, with half a trunkful of Comstock shares, had cultivated a distaste for California things in general. In a letter of that time he says, "'How I hate everything that looks or tastes, or smells, like California. With his customary fickleness of soul, he was glorifying California less than a year later, but for the moment he could see no good in that Nazareth. To his great satisfaction, one of the leading California corporations, the Spring Valley Water Company, cooked a dividend of its own about this time, 
resulting in disaster to a number of guileless investors who were on the wrong side of the subsequent crash. This afforded an inviting opportunity for reprisal. With Goodman's consent, he planned for the California papers, and the bulletin in particular, a punishment which he determined to make sufficiently severe. He believed the papers of that state had forgotten his earlier offenses, and the result would show he was not mistaken. There was a point on the Carson River, four miles from Carson City, known as Dutch Nick's, and also as Empire City, the two being identical. There was no forest there of any sort, nothing but sagebrush. In the one cabin there lived a bachelor with no household. Everybody in Virginia and Carson, of course, knew these things. Mark Twain now prepared a most lurid and graphic account of how one Philip Hopkins, living just at the edge of the great pine forest which lies between Empire City and Dutch Nick's, had suddenly gone insane and murderously assaulted his entire family consisting of his wife and their nine children, ranging in ages from one to nineteen years. The wife had been slain outright, also seven of the children. The other two might recover. The murder had been committed in the most brutal and ghastly fashion, after which Hopkins had scalped his wife, leapt on a horse, cut his own throat from ear to ear, and ridden four miles into Carson City, dropping dead at last in front of the Magnolia Saloon, the red-haired scalp of his wife still clutched in his gory hand. The article further stated that the cause of Mr. Hopkins' insanity was pecuniary loss, he having withdrawn his savings from safe Comstock investments and, through the advice of a relative, one of the editors of the San Francisco Bulletin, invested them in the Spring Valley Water Company. This absurd tale with startling headlines appeared in the Enterprise in its issue of October 28, 1863. It was not expected that anyone in Virginia City or Carson City would for a moment take any stock in the wild invention, yet so graphic was it that nine out of ten on first reading never stopped to consider the entire impossibility of the locality and circumstance. Even when these things were pointed out, many readers at first refused to confess themselves sold. As for the Bulletin and other California papers, they were taken in completely, and were furious. Many of them wrote and demanded the immediate discharge of its author, announcing that they would never copy another line from the Enterprise, or exchange with it, or have further relations with a paper that had Mark Twain on its staff. Citizens were mad, too and cut off their subscriptions. The joker was in despair. "'Oh, Joe,' he said, "'I have ruined your business, and the only reparation I can make is to resign. You can never recover from this blow while I am on the paper.' "'Nonsense,' replied Goodman. "'We can furnish the people with news, but we can't supply them with sense. Only time can do that. The flurry will pass. You just go ahead. We'll win out in the long run. But the offender was in torture. He could not sleep. Dan, Dan, he said, I am being burned alive on both sides of the mountains. Mark, said Dan, it will all blow over. This item of yours will be remembered and talked about when the rest of your enterprise work is forgotten. Both Goodman and De Quill were right. In a month papers and people had forgotten their humiliation and laughed. The Dutch Nick massacre gave to its perpetrator and to the enterprise an added vogue. For full text of the Dutch Nick hoax, see Appendix C at the end of last volume. Also, for an anecdote concerning a reporting excursion made by Alf Doten and Mark Twain. End of chapter 41. The Cream of Comstock Humor. Read by John Greenman. This is section 42 of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography. By Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 42 repertorial days. 
reference has already been made to the fashion among virginia city papers of permitting reporters to use the editorial columns for ridicule of one another this custom was especially in vogue during the period when dan de quille and mark twain and the unreliable were the shining journalistic lights of the comstock scarcely a week went by that some apparently venomous squib or fling or long burlesque assault did not appear either in the union or the enterprise with one of those jokers as its author and another as its target in one of his home letters of that year mark twain says i have just finished writing up my report for the morning paper and giving the unreliable a column of advice about how to conduct himself in church the advice was such as to call for a reprisal but it apparently made no difference in personal relations for a few weeks later he is with the unreliable in san francisco seeing life in the metropolis fairly swimming in its delights unable to resist reporting them to his mother we fag ourselves completely out every day and go to sleep without rocking every night when i go down montgomery street shaking hands with tom dick and harry it is just like being on main street in hannibal and meeting the old familiar faces i do hate to go back to washu we take trips across the bay to oakland and down to san leandro and alameda and we go out to the willows and hayes park and fort point and up to benicia and yesterday we were invited out on a yachting excursion and had a sail in the fastest yacht on the pacific coast rice says oh no we are not having any fun mark oh no i reckon it's somebody else it's probably the gentleman in the wagon popular slang phrase and when i invite rice to the lick house to dinner the proprietor sends us champagne and claret and then we do put on the most disgusting airs the unreliable says our caliber is too light we can't stand it to be noticed three days later he adds that he is going sorrowfully to the snows and the deserts of washu but that he has lived like a lord to make up for two years of privation twenty dollars is enclosed in each of these letters probably as a bribe to jane clemens to be lenient with his prodigalities which in his youthful love of display he could not bring himself to conceal but apparently the salve was futile for in another letter a month later he complains that his mother is slinging insinuations at him again such as where did you get that money and the company i kept in san francisco he explains why i sold wildcat mining ground that was given me and my credit was always good at the bank for two thousand or three thousand dollars and i never gamble in any shape or manner and never drink anything stronger than claret and lager beer which conduct is regarded as miraculously temperate in this place as for company i went in the very best company to be found in san francisco i always move in the best society in virginia and have a reputation to preserve he closes by assuring her that he will be more careful in future and that she need never fear but that he will keep her expenses paid then he cannot refrain from adding one more item of his lavish life put in my washing and it costs me one hundred dollars a month to live 
de quille had not missed the opportunity of his comrade's absence to pay off some old scores at the end of the editorial column of the enterprise on the day following his departure he denounced the absent one and his protege the unreliable after the intemperate fashion of the day it is to be regretted that such scrubs are ever permitted to visit the bay as the inevitable effect will be to destroy that exalted opinion of the manners and morality of our people which was inspired by the conduct of our senior editor which is to say dan himself the diatribe closed with a really graceful poem and the whole was no doubt highly regarded by the enterprise readers what revenge mark twain took on his return has not been recorded but it was probably prompt and adequate or he may have left it to the unreliable it was clearly a mistake however to leave his own local work in the hands of that properly named person a little later clemens was laid up with a cold and rice assured him on his sacred honor that he would attend faithfully to the enterprise locals along with his own union items he did this but he had been nursing old injuries too long what was mark twain's amazement on looking over the enterprise next morning to find under the heading apologetic a statement over his own nom de plume purporting to be an apology for all the sins of ridicule to the various injured ones to mayor arick hon william stewart marshall perry hon j b winters mr olin and samuel wetherill besides a host of others whom we have ridiculed from behind the shelter of our repertorial position we say to these gentlemen we acknowledge our faults and in all weakness and humility upon our bended marrow bones we ask their forgiveness promising that in future we will give them no cause for anything but the best of feeling toward us to young wilson and the unreliable as we have wickedly termed them we feel that no apology we can make begins to atone for the many insults we have given them toward these gentlemen we have been as mean as a man could be and we have always prided ourselves on this base quality we feel that we are the least of all humanity as it were we will now go in sackcloth and ashes for the next forty days this in his own paper over his own signature was a body blow but it had the effect of curing his cold he was back in the office forthwith and in the next morning's issue denounced his betrayer we are to blame for giving the unreliable an opportunity to misrepresent us and therefore refrain from repining to any great extent at the result we simply claim the right to deny the truth of every statement made by him in yesterday's paper to annul all apologies he coined as coming from us and to hold him up to public commiseration as a reptile endowed with no more intellect no more cultivation no more christian principle than animates and adorns the sportive jackass rabbit of the sierras we have done these were the things that enlivened comstock journalism once in a boxing bout mark twain got a blow on the nose which caused it to swell to an unusual size and shape he went out of town for a few days during which de quille published an extravagant account of his misfortune describing the nose and dwelling on the absurdity of mark twain's ever supposing himself to be a boxer de quille scored heavily with this item but his own doom was written soon afterward he was out riding and was thrown from his horse and bruised considerably that was mark's opportunity he gave an account of dan's disaster then commenting he said the idea of a plebeian like dan supposing he could ever ride a horse he why even the cats and the chickens laughed when they saw him go by 
of course he would be thrown off of course any well-bred horse wouldn't let a common underbred person like dan stay on his back when they gathered him up he was just a bag of scraps but they put him together and you'll find him at his old place in the enterprise office next week still laboring under the delusion that he's a newspaper man the author of roughing it tells of a literary periodical called the occidental started in virginia city by a mr f this was the silver-tongued tom fitch of the union an able speaker and writer vastly popular on the coast fitch came to clemens one day and said he was thinking of starting such a periodical and asked him what he thought of the venture clemens said you would succeed if anyone could but start a flower garden on the desert of sahara set up hoisting works on mount vesuvius for mining sulphur start a literary paper in virginia city <laughs> hell which was a correct estimate of the situation and the paper perished with the third issue it was of no consequence except that it contained what was probably the first attempt at that modern literary abortion the composite novel also it died too soon to publish mark twain's first verses of any pretension though still of modest merit the aged pilot man which were thereby saved for roughing it visiting virginia now it seems curious that any of these things could have happened there the comstock has become little more than a memory virginia and gold hill are so quiet so voiceless as to constitute scarcely an echo of the past the international hotel that once so splendid edifice through whose portholes the tide of opulent life then ebbed and flowed is all but deserted now one may wander at will through its dingy corridors and among its faded fripperies seeking in vain for attendance or hospitality the lavish welcome of a vanished day those things were not lacking once and the stream of wealth tossed up and down the stair and billowed up sea street an ebullient tide of metals and men from which millionaires would be struck out and individuals known in national affairs william m stewart who would one day become a united states senator was there an unnoticed unit and john mckay and james g fair one a senator by and by and both millionaires but poor enough then fair with a pick on his shoulder and mckay too at first though he presently became a mine superintendent once in those days mark twain banteringly offered to trade businesses with mckay no mckay said i can't trade my business is not worth as much as yours i have never swindled anybody and i don't intend to begin now neither of those men could dream that within ten years their names would be international property that in due course nevada would propose statues to their memory such things came out of the comstock such things spring out of every turbulent frontier End of chapter 42 Repertorial Days Read by John Greenman This is section 43 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866 Chapter 43 Artemus Ward madame caprell's warning concerning mark twain's health at twenty-eight would seem to have been justified high-strung and neurotic the strain of newspaper work and the tumult of the comstock had told on him as in later life he was subject to bronchial colds and more than once that year he found it necessary to drop all work and rest for a time at steamboat springs a place near virginia city where there were boiling springs and steaming fissures in the mountainside, and a comfortable hotel. He contributed from there sketches somewhat more literary in form than any of his previous work. 
curing a cold is a more or less exaggerated account of his ills included in the sketches new and old information for the million and advice to good little girls included in the jumping frog collection eighteen sixty seven but omitted from the sketches are also believed to belong to this period a portion of a playful letter to his mother written from the springs still exists you have given my vanity a deadly thrust behold i am prone to boast of having the widest reputation as a local editor of any man on the pacific coast and you gravely come forward and tell me if i work hard and attend closely to my business i may aspire to a place on a big san francisco daily some day there's a comment on human vanity for you why blast it i was under the impression that i could get such a situation as that any time i asked for it but i don't want it no paper in the united states can afford to pay me what my place on the enterprise is worth if i were not naturally a lazy idle good-for-nothing vagabond i could make it pay me twenty thousand dollars a year but i don't suppose i shall ever be any account i lead an easy life though and i don't care a cent whether school keeps or not everybody knows me and i fare like a prince wherever i go be it on this side of the mountain or the other and i am proud to say i am the most conceited ass in the territory you think that picture looks old well i can't help it in reality i'm not as old as i was when i was eighteen which was a true statement so far as his general attitude was concerned at eighteen in new york and philadelphia his letters had been grave reflective advisory now they were mostly banter and froth lightly indifferent to the serious side of things though perhaps only pretendedly so for the picture did look old from the shock and circumstance of his brother's death he had never recovered he was barely twenty-eight from the picture he might have been a man of forty it was that year that artemus ward charles f brown came to virginia city there was a fine opera house in virginia and any attraction that billed san francisco did not fail to play to the comstock ward intended staying only a few days to deliver his lectures but the whirl of the comstock caught him like a maelstrom and he remained three weeks he made the enterprise office his headquarters and fairly reveled in the company he found there he and mark twain became boon companions each recognized in the other a kindred spirit with goodman de quill and mccarthy also e e hingston ward's agent a companionable fellow they usually dined at chaumont's virginia's high-toned french restaurant those were three memorable weeks in mark twain's life artemus ward was in the height of his fame and he encouraged his new-found brother humorist and prophesied great things of him clemens on his side measured himself by this man who had achieved fame and perhaps with good reason concluded that ward's estimate was correct that he too could win fame and honor once he got a start if he had lacked ambition before ward's visit the latter's unqualified approval inspired him with that priceless article of equipment he put his soul into entertaining the visitor during those three weeks and it was apparent to their associates that he was at least ward's equal in mental stature and originality goodman and the others began to realize that for mark twain the rewards of the future were to be measured only by his resolution and ability to hold out on christmas eve 
artemus lectured in silver city and afterward came to the enterprise office to give the boys a farewell dinner the enterprise always published a christmas carol and goodman sat at his desk writing it he was just finishing as ward came in slave slave said artemus come out and let me banish care from you they got the boys and all went over to chamon's where ward commanded goodman to order the dinner when the cocktails came on artemus lifted his glass and said i give you upper canada the company rose drank the toast in serious silence then goodman said of course artemus it's all right uh, but uh, why did you give us upper canada because i don't want it myself said ward gravely then began a rising tide of humor that could hardly be matched in the world today. mark twain had awakened to a fuller power artemus ward was in his prime they were giants of a race that became extinct when mark twain died the youth the wine the whirl of lights and life the tumult of the shouting street it was as if an electric stream of inspiration poured into those two human dynamos and sent them into a dazzling scintillating whirl all gone as evanescent as forgotten as the lightnings of that vanished time out of that vast feasting and entertainment only a trifling morsel remains ward now and then asked goodman why he did not join in the banter goodman said i'm preparing a joke artemus but i'm keeping it for the present it was near daybreak when ward at last called for the bill it was two hundred and thirty seven dollars what exclaimed artemus that's my joke said goodman but i was only exclaiming because it was not twice as much returned ward he paid it amid laughter and they went out into the early morning air it was fresh and fine outside not yet light enough to see clearly artemus threw his face up to the sky and said i feel glorious i feel like walking on the roofs virginia was built on the steep hillside and the eaves of some of the houses almost touched the ground behind them there is your chance artemus goodman said pointing to a row of these houses all about of a height artemus grabbed mark twain and they stepped out upon the long string of roofs and walked their full length arm in arm presently the others noticed a lonely policeman cocking his revolver and getting ready to aim in their direction goodman called to him wait a minute what are you going to do i am going to shoot those burglars he said don't for your life those are not burglars that's mark twain and artemus ward the roof walkers returned and the party went down the street to a corner across from the international hotel a saloon was there with a barrel lying in front used perhaps for a sort of sign artemus climbed astride the barrel and somebody brought a beer glass and put it in his hand virginia city looks out over the eastward desert morning was just breaking upon the distant range the scene as beautiful as when the sunrise beams across the plain of memnon the city was not yet awake the only living creatures in sight were the group of belated diners with artemus ward as king gambrinus pouring a libation to the sunrise that was the beginning of a week of glory the farewell dinner became a series at the close of one convivial session artemus went to a concert hall the melodeon blacked his face and delivered a speech he got away from virginia about the close of the year a day or two later he wrote from austin nevada to his new-found comrade as my dearest love recalling the happiness of his stay i shall always remember virginia as a bright spot in my existence as all others must or rather cannot be as it were then reflectively he adds some of the finest intellects in the world have been blunted by liquor rare artemus ward and rare mark twain if there lies somewhere a place of meeting and remembrance they have not failed to recall there those closing days of sixty three End of chapter 43 Artemis Ward 
read by john greenman this is section forty four of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty four governor of the third house with artemus ward's encouragement clemens began to think of extending his audience eastward the new york sunday mercury published literary matter ward had urged him to try this market and promised to write a special letter to the editors introducing mark twain and his work clemens prepared a sketch of the comstock variety scarcely refined in character and full of personal allusion a humor not suited to the present-day reader its general subject was children it contained some absurd remedies supposedly sent to his old pilot friend zeb leavenworth and was written as much for a joke on that good-natured soul as for profit or reputation i wrote it especially for beck jolly's use the author declares in a letter to his mother so he could pester zeb with it we cannot know to-day whether zeb was pestered or not a faded clipping is all that remains of the incident as literature the article properly enough is lost to the world at large it is only worth remembering as his metropolitan beginning yet he must have thought rather highly of it his estimation of his own work was always unsafe for in the letter above quoted he adds i cannot write regularly for the mercury of course i shan't have time but sometimes i throw off a pearl there is no self-conceit about that i beg you to observe which ought for the eternal welfare of my race to have a more extensive circulation than is afforded by a local daily paper and if fitzhugh ludlow author of the hashish eater comes your way uh, treat him well he published a high encomium upon mark twain the same being eminently just and truthful i beseech you to believe in a san francisco paper artemus ward said that when my gorgeous talents were publicly acknowledged by such high authority i ought to appreciate them myself leave sagebrush obscurity and journey to new york with him as he wanted me to do but i preferred not to burst upon the new york public too suddenly and brilliantly so i concluded to remain here he was in carson city when this was written preparing for the opening of the next legislature he was beyond question now the most conspicuous figure of the capital also the most wholesomely respected for his influence had become very large it was said that he could control more votes than any legislative member and with his friends simmons and claggett could pass or defeat any bill offered the enterprise was a powerful organ to be courted and dreaded and mark twain had become its chief tribune that he was fearless merciless and incorruptible without doubt had a salutary influence on that legislative session he reveled in his power but it is not recorded that he ever abused it he got a bill passed largely increasing orion's official fees but this was a crying need and was so recognized he made no secret promises none at all that he did not intend to fulfill sam's word was as fixed as fate orion records and it may be added that he was morally as fearless the two houses of the last territorial legislature of nevada assembled january twelfth eighteen sixty four nevada became a state october thirty first eighteen sixty four a few days later a third house was organized an institution quite in keeping with the happy atmosphere of that day and locality for it was a burlesque organization and mark twain was selected as its governor 
the new house prepared to make a public occasion of this first session and its governor was required to furnish a message then it was decided to make it a church benefit the letters exchanged concerning this proposition still exist they explain themselves carson city january twenty third eighteen sixty four governor mark twain understanding from certain members of the third house of the territorial legislature that that body will have effected a permanent organization within a day or two and be ready for the reception of your third annual message there had been no former message this was regarded as a great joke we desire to ask your permission and that of the third house to turn the affair to the benefit of the church by charging toll roads franchises and other persons a dollar apiece for the privilege of listening to your communication s pixley g a sears trustees carson city january twenty third eighteen sixty four gentlemen certainly if the public can find anything in a grave state paper worth paying a dollar for i am willing they should pay that amount or any other and although i am not a very dusty christian myself i take an absorbing interest in religious affairs and would willingly inflict my annual message upon the church itself if it might derive benefit thereby you can charge what you please i promise the public no amusement but i do promise a reasonable amount of instruction i am responsible to the third house only and i hope to be permitted to make it exceedingly warm for that body without caring whether the sympathies of the public and the church be enlisted in their favor and against myself or not respectfully mark twain mark twain's reply is closely related to his later style in phrase and thought it might have been written by him at almost any subsequent period perhaps his association with artemus ward had awakened a new perception of the humorous idea a humor of repression of understatement he forgot this often enough then and afterward and gave his riotous fancy free rein but on the whole the simpler less florid form seemingly began to attract him more and more his address as governor of the third house has not been preserved but those who attended always afterward referred to it as the greatest effort of his life perhaps for that audience and that time this verdict was justified it was his first great public opportunity on the stage about him sat the membership of the third house the building itself was packed the aisles full he knew he could let himself go in burlesque and satire and he did he was unsparing in his ridicule of the governor the officials in general the legislative members and of individual citizens from the beginning to the end of his address the audience was in a storm of laughter and applause with the exception of the dinner speech made to the printers in keokuk it was his first public utterance the beginning of a lifelong series of triumphs only one thing marred his success little carrie pixley daughter of one of the trustees had promised to be present and sit in a box next the stage it was like him to be fond of the child and he had promised to send a carriage for her often during his address he glanced toward the box but it remained empty when the affair was ended he drove home with her father to inquire the reason they found the little girl in all her finery weeping on the bed then he remembered he had forgotten to send the carriage and that was like him too for his third house address judge a w sandy baldwin and theodore winters 
presented him with a gold watch inscribed to governor mark twain he was more in demand now than ever no social occasion was regarded as complete without him his doings were related daily and his sayings repeated on the streets most of these things have passed away now but a few are still recalled with smiles once when conundrums were being asked at a party he was urged to make one well he said why am i like the pacific ocean several guesses were made but none satisfied him finally all gave it up tell us mark why are you like the pacific ocean i don't know he drawled i was just asking for information at another time when a young man insisted on singing a song of eternal length the chorus of which was i'm going home i'm going home i'm going home to-morrow mark twain put his head in the window and said pleadingly for god's sake go to-night but he was also fond of quieter society sometimes after the turmoil of a legislative morning he would drop in to miss kasia clapp's school and listen to the exercises or would call on colonel curry old curry old abe curry and if the colonel happened to be away he would talk with mrs curry a motherly soul still alive at ninety-three in nineteen ten and tell her of his hannibal boyhood or his river and his mining adventures and keep her laughing until the tears ran he was a great pedestrian in those days sometimes he walked from virginia to carson stopping at colonel curry's as he came in for rest and refreshment mrs curry he said once i have seen tireder men than i am and lazier men but they were dead men he liked the home feeling there the peace and motherly interest deep down he was lonely and homesick he was always so away from his own kindred clemens returned now to virginia city and like all other men who ever met her became briefly fascinated by the charms of ada isaacs menken who was playing mazeppa at the virginia opera house all men kings poets priests prize-fighters fell under menken's spell dan de quill and mark twain entered into a daily contest as to who could lavish the most fervid praise on her in the enterprise the latter carried her his literary work to criticize he confesses this in one of his home letters perhaps with a sort of pride i took it over to show to miss menken the actress orpheus c ken's wife she is a literary cuss herself she has a beautiful white hand but her handwriting is infamous she writes fast and her chirography is of the door-plate order her letters are immense i gave her a conundrum thus my dear madam why ought your hand to retain its present grace and beauty always because you fool away devilish little of it on your manuscript but menken was gone presently and when he saw her again somewhat later in san francisco his madness would have seemed to have been allayed end of chapter forty four the governor of the third house read by john greenman this is section forty five of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty five a comstock duel the success such as it was of his occasional contributions to the new york sunday mercury stirred mark twain's ambition for a wider field of labor circumstance always ready to meet his wishes offered assistance though in an unexpected form goodman temporarily absent had left clemens in editorial charge 
as in that earlier day when orion had visited tennessee and returned to find his paper in a hot personal warfare with certain injured citizens so the enterprise under the same management had stirred up trouble it was just at the time of the flour sack sanitary fund the story of which is related at length in roughing it in the general hilarity of this occasion certain enterprise paragraphs of criticism or ridicule had incurred the displeasure of various individuals whose cause naturally enough had been espoused by a rival paper the chronicle very soon the original grievance whatever it was was lost sight of in the fireworks and vitriol throwing of personal recrimination between mark twain and the chronicle editor then a mr laird a point had been reached at length when only a call for bloodshed a challenge could satisfy either the staff or the readers of the two papers men were killed every week for milder things than the editors had spoken each of the other joe goodman himself not so long before had fought a duel with a union editor tom fitch and shot him in the leg so making of him a friend and a lame man for life in joe's absence the prestige of the paper must be maintained mark twain himself has told in burlesque the story of his duel keeping somewhat nearer to the fact than was his custom in such writing as may be seen by comparing it with the account of his a better and second of course steve gillis the account is from mr gillis's own hand when joe went away he left sam in editorial charge of the paper that was a dangerous thing to do nobody could ever tell what sam was going to write something he said stirred up mr laird of the chronicle who wrote a reply of a very severe kind he said some things that we told mark could only be wiped out with blood those were the days when almost every man in virginia city had fought with pistols either impromptu or premeditated duels i had been in several uh, but then mine didn't count most of them were of the impromptu kind mark hadn't had any yet and we thought it about time that his baptism took place he was not eager for it he was averse to violence but we finally prevailed upon him to send laird a challenge and when laird did not send a reply at once we insisted on mark sending him another challenge by which time he had made himself believe that he really wanted to fight as much as we wanted him to do laird concluded to fight at last i helped mark get up some of the letters and a man who would not fight after such letters did not belong in virginia city in those days laird's acceptance of mark's challenge came along about midnight i think after the papers had gone to press the meeting was to take place next morning at sunrise of course i was selected as mark's second and at daybreak i had him up and out for some lessons in pistol practice before meeting laird i didn't have to wake him he had not been asleep we had been talking since midnight over the duel that was coming i had been telling him of the different duels in which i had taken part either as principal or second and how many men i had helped to kill and bury and how it was a good plan to make a will even if one had not much to leave it always looked well i told him and seemed to be a proper thing to do before going into a duel so mark made a will with a sort of gloomy satisfaction and as soon as it was light enough to see we went out to a little ravine near the meeting place and i set up a board for him to shoot at he would step out raise that big pistol and when i would count three he would shut his eyes and pull the trigger of course he didn't hit anything he did not come anywhere near hitting anything just then we heard somebody shooting over in the next ravine sam said what's that steve why i said that's loud his seconds are practicing him over there it didn't make my principal any more cheerful to hear that pistol go off every few seconds over there just then i saw a little mud hen light on some sagebrush about thirty yards away mark i said let me have that pistol i'll show you how to shoot he handed it to me and i let go at the bird 
and shot its head off clean. About that time Laird and his second came over the ridge to meet us. I saw them coming and handed Mark back the pistol. We were looking at the bird when they came up. Who did that? asked Laird's second. Sam, I said. How far off was it? Oh, about thirty yards. Can you do it again? Of course, I said. Every time. He could do it twice that far. Loud's second turned to his principal. Laird, he said, you don't want to fight that man. It's just like suicide. You'd better settle this thing now. So there was a settlement. Laird took back all he had said. Mark said he really had nothing against Laird. The discussion had been purely journalistic and did not need to be settled in blood. He said that both he and Laird were probably the victims of their friends. I remember one of the things Laird said when his second told him he had better not fight. Fight? Oh, no! I'm not going to be murdered by that damned desperado. Sam had sent another challenge to a man named Cutler, who had been somehow mixed up with the muss and had written Sam an insulting letter. But Cutler was out of town at the time, and before he got back we had received word from Jerry Driscoll, foreman of the grand jury, that the law just passed, making a duel a penitentiary offense for both principal and second, was to be strictly enforced and unless we got out of town in a limited number of hours, we would be the first examples to test the new law. We concluded to go, and when the stage left next morning for San Francisco, we were on the outside seat. Joe Goodman had returned by this time and agreed to accompany us as far as Hennis Pass. We were all in good spirits and glad we were alive, so Joe did not stop when he got to Hennis Pass, but kept on. Now and then he would say, Well, I better be going back pretty soon. But he didn't go, and in the end he did not go back at all, but went with us clear to San Francisco, and we had a royal good time all the way. I never knew any series of duels to close so happily. So ended Mark Twain's career on the Comstock. He had come to it a weary pilgrim, discouraged and unknown. He was leaving it, with a new name and fame, elate, triumphant, even if a fugitive. End of chapter 45 A Comstock Duel Read by John Greenman This is section 46 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866 Chapter 46 getting settled in San Francisco. This was near the end of May, 1864. The intention of both Gillis and Clemens was to return to the States, but once in San Francisco, both presently accepted places, Clemens as reporter and Gillis as compositor on the morning call. From Roughing It, the reader gathers that Mark Twain now entered into a life of butterfly idleness on the strength of prospective riches to be derived from the half a trunkful of mining stocks, and that presently, when the mining bubble exploded, he was a pauper. But a good many liberties have been taken with the history of this period. Undoubtedly he expected opulent returns from his mining stocks, and was disappointed particularly in an investment in Hale and Norcross shares, held too long for the large profit which could have been made by selling at the proper time. The fact is, he spent not more than a few days, a fortnight at most, in butterfly idleness at the Lick House before he was hard at work on the call, living modestly with Steve Gillis in the quietest place they could find, never quiet enough, but as far as possible from dogs and cats and chickens and pianos, which seemed determined to make the mornings hideous, when a weary night reporter and compositor wanted to rest. They went out socially on occasion, arrayed in considerable elegance, but their recreations were more likely to consist of private midnight orgies, after the paper had gone to press, mild dissipations in whatever they could find to eat at that hour, with a few glasses of beer, and perhaps a game of billiards or pool in some all-night resort. 
a printer by the name of Ward, Little Ward they called him, L. P. Ward, well known as an athlete in San Francisco, he lost his mind and fatally shot himself in 1903, often went with them for these refreshments. Ward and Gillis were both bantam gamecocks, and sometimes would stir up trouble for the very joy of combat. Clemens never cared for that sort of thing and discouraged it, but Ward and Gillis were for war. They never assisted each other. If one had offered to assist the other against some overgrown person, it would have been an affront, and a battle would have followed between that pair of little friends. S.L.C. 1906 Steve Gillis, in particular, was fond of incidental encounters, a characteristic which would prove an important factor somewhat later in shaping Mark Twain's career. Of course, the more strenuous nights were not frequent. Their home-going was usually tame enough, and they were glad enough to get there. Clemens, however, was never quite ready for sleep. Then, as ever, he would prop himself up in bed, light his pipe, and lose himself in English or French history until sleep conquered. His roommate did not approve of this habit. It interfered with his own rest, and with his fiendish tendency to mischief he found reprisal in his own fashion. Knowing his companion's highly organized nervous system, he devised means of torture which would induce him to put out the light. Once he tied a nail to a string, an arrangement which he kept on the floor behind the bed. Pretending to be asleep, he would hold the end of the string and lift it gently up and down, making a slight ticking sound on the floor, maddening to a nervous man. Clemens would listen a moment and say, "'What in the nation is that noise?' Gillis pretended sleep, and the ticking would continue. Clemens would sit up in bed, fling aside his book, and swear violently. "'Steve, what is that damn noise?' he would say. Steve would pretend to rouse sleepily. What, what, "'What's the matter, Sam? What, what, what noise? Oh, oh I, I guess that is one of those death ticks. Uh, they, they don't like the light. Uh, maybe it will stop in a minute.' It usually did stop about that time, and the reading would be apt to continue. But no sooner was there stillness than it began again. Tick, tick, tick. With a wild explosion of blasphemy, the book would go across the floor and the light would disappear. Sometimes, when he couldn't sleep, he would dress and walk out in the street for an hour, while the cruel Steve slept like the criminal that he was. At last, one night, he overdid the thing and was caught. His tortured roommate at first reviled him, then threatened to kill him, finally put him to shame. It was curious, but they always loved each other, those two. There was never anything resembling an estrangement, and to his last days Mark Twain never could speak of Steve Gillis without tenderness. They moved a great many times in San Francisco. Their most satisfactory residence was on a bluff on California Street. Their windows looked down on a lot of Chinese houses, tin can houses, they were called, small wooden shanties covered with beaten-out cans. Steve and Mark would look down on these houses, waiting until all the Chinamen were inside. Then one of them would grab an empty beer bottle, throw it down on those tin can roofs, and dodge behind the blinds. The Chinamen would swarm out and look up at the row of houses on the edge of the bluff, shake their fists, and pour out Chinese vituperation. By and by, when they had retired and everything was quiet again, their tormentors would throw another bottle. This was their Sunday amusement. At a place on Minna Street, they lived with a private family. At first, Clemens was delighted. Just look at it steve he said what a nice quiet place not a thing to disturb us but next morning a dog began to howl gillis woke this time to find his roommate standing in the door that opened out into a back garden holding a big revolver his hand shaking with cold and excitement come here steve he said come here and 
kill him i'm so chilled through i can't get a bead on him sam said steve don't shoot him just swear at him you can easily kill him at that range with your profanity steve gillis declares that mark twain then let go such a scorching singeing blast that the brute's owner sold him next day for a mexican hairless dog we gather that they moved on an average about once a month a home letter of september twenty fifth eighteen sixty four says we have been here only four months yet we have changed our lodging five times we are very comfortably fixed where we are now and have no fault to find with the rooms or the people we are the only lodgers in a well-to-do private family but i need change and must move again this was the minna street place the place of the dog in the same letter he mentions having made a new arrangement with the call by which he is to receive twenty-five dollars a week with no more night work he says further that he has closed with the californian for weekly articles at twelve dollars each end of chapter forty six getting settled in san francisco read by john greenman this is section forty seven of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty seven bohemian days mark twain's position on the call was uncongenial from the start san francisco was a larger city than virginia the work there was necessarily more impersonal more a routine of news-gathering and drudgery he once set down his own memories of it at nine in the morning i had to be at the police court for an hour and make a brief history of the squabbles of the night before they were usually between irishmen and irishmen and chinamen and chinamen with now and then a squabble between the two races for a change during the rest of the day we raked the town from end to end gathering such material as we might wherewith to fill our required columns and if there were no fires to report we started some at night we visited the six theaters one after the other seven nights in the week we remained in each of those places five minutes got the merest passing glimpse of play and opera and with that for a text we wrote up those plays and operas as the phrase goes torturing our souls every night in the effort to find something to say about those performances which we had not said a couple of hundred times before it was fearful drudgery soulless drudgery and almost destitute of interest it was an awful slavery for a lazy man on the enterprise he had been free with a liberty that amounted to license he could write what he wished and was personally responsible to the readers on the call he was simply a part of a news machine restricted by a policy the whole a part of a still greater machine politics once he saw some butchers set their dogs on an unoffending chinaman a policeman looking on with amused interest he wrote an indignant article criticizing the city government and raking the police in virginia city this would have been a welcome delight in san francisco it did not appear at another time he found a policeman asleep on his beat going to a nearby vegetable stall he borrowed a large cabbage leaf came back and stood over the sleeper gently fanning him it would be wasted effort to make an item of this incident 
but he could publish it in his own fashion. He stood there fanning the sleeping official until a large crowd collected. When he thought it was large enough, he went away. The next day the joke was all over the city. Only one of the several severe articles he wrote criticizing officials and institutions seems to have appeared, an attack on an undertaker whose establishment formed a branch of the coroner's office. The management of this place one day refused information to a call reporter, and the next morning its proprietor was terrified by a scathing denunciation of his firm. It began, Those Body Snatchers, and continued through half a column of such scorching strictures as only Mark Twain could devise. The call's policy of suppression evidently did not include criticisms of deputy coroners. Such liberty, however, was too rare for Mark Twain, and he lost interest. He confessed afterward that he became indifferent and lazy, and that George E. Barnes, one of the publishers of the call, at last allowed him an assistant. He selected from the counting-room a big, hulking youth by the name of McGlural, with the acquired prefix of Smiggy. Clemens had taken a fancy to Smiggy McGlural, on account of his name and size, perhaps, and Smiggy, devoted to his patron, worked like a slave, gathering news, nights, daytimes, too, if necessary, all of which was demoralizing to a man who had small appetite for his place anyway. It was only a question of time when Smiggy alone would be sufficient for the job. There were other and pleasanter things in San Francisco. The personal and literary associations were worthwhile. At his right hand in the call office sat Frank Soule, a gentle spirit, a graceful versifier who believed himself a poet. Mark Twain deferred to Frank Soule in those days. He thought his verses exquisite in their workmanship. A word of praise from Soule gave him happiness. In a luxurious office upstairs was another congenial spirit, a gifted, handsome fellow of twenty-four, who was secretary of the Mint, and who presently became editor of a new literary weekly, The Californian, which Charles Henry Webb had founded. This young man's name was Francis Brett Hart, originally from Albany, later a miner and schoolteacher on the Stanislaus, still later a compositor finally a contributor on the golden era. His fame scarcely reached beyond San Francisco as yet, but among the little coterie of writing folk that clustered about the era office his rank was high. Mark Twain fraternized with Bret Hart and the era group generally. He felt that he had reached the land, or at least the borderland, of Bohemia, that ultima thule of every young literary dream. San Francisco did, in fact, have a very definite literary atmosphere and a literature of its own. Its coterie of writers had drifted from here and there, but they had merged themselves into a California body poetic, quite as individual as that of Cambridge, even if less famous, less fortunate in emoluments than the Boston group. Joseph E. Lawrence, familiarly known as Joe Lawrence, was editor of the Golden Era. The Golden Era, California's first literary publication was founded by Roland M. Daggett and J. McDonough Foward in 1852, and his kindness and hospitality were accounted sufficient rewards even when his pecuniary acknowledgments were modest enough. He had a handsome office, and the literati, local and visiting, used to gather there. Names that would be well known later were included in that little band. Joaquin Miller recalls from an old diary, kept by him, then, having seen Ada Isaacs Mencken, Prentice Mulford, Bret Hart, Charles Warren Stoddard, Fitzhugh Ludlow, Mark Twain, Orpheus C. Kerr, Artemis Ward, Gilbert Densmore, W. S. Kendall, and Mrs. Hitchcock assembled there at one time. The era office would seem to have been a sort of Mount Olympus, or Parnassus, perhaps, for these were mainly poets who had scarcely yet attained to the dignity of gods. Miller was hardly more than a youth then, and this grand assemblage impressed him. 
as did the imposing appointments of the place. The era rooms were elegant, he says, the most grandly carpeted and most gorgeously furnished that I have ever seen. Even now, in my memory, they seem to have been simply palatial. I have seen the world well since then, all of its splendors worth seeing, yet those carpeted parlors, with Joe Lawrence and his brilliant satellites, outshine all these things as I turn to look back. More than any other city west of the Alleghenies, San Francisco has always been a literary center and certainly that was a remarkable group to be out there under the sunset dropped down there behind the sierras which the transcontinental railway would not climb yet for several years they were a happy-hearted aspiring lot and they got as much as five dollars sometimes for an era article and were as proud of it as if it had been a great deal more they felt that they were creating literature as they were in fact a new school of American letters mustered there. Mark Twain and Bret Hart were distinctive features of this group. They were already recognized by their associates as belonging in a class by themselves, though as yet neither had done any of the work for which he would be remembered later. They were a good deal together, and it was when Hart was made editor of the Californian that Mark Twain was put on the weekly staff at the then unexampled twelve-dollar rate. The Californian made larger pretensions than the era, and perhaps had a heavier financial backing. With Mark Twain on the staff, and Bret Hart in the chair, himself a frequent contributor, it easily ranked as first of San Francisco periodicals. A number of the sketches collected by Webb later, in Mark Twain's first little volume, The Celebrated Jumping Frog, etc., appeared in the era or californian in 1864 and 1865 they were smart bright direct not always refined but probably the best humor of the day some of them are still preserved in this volume of sketches they are interesting in what they promise rather than in what they present though some of them are still delightful enough the killing of julius caesar localized is an excellent forerunner of his burlesque report of a gladiatorial combat in the innocents abroad the answers to correspondence with his vigorous admonition of the statistical moralist could hardly have been better done at any later period the jumping frog itself was not originally of this harvest it has a history of its own as we shall see a little further along the repertorial arrangement was of brief duration even the great San Francisco earthquake of that day did not awaken in Mark Twain any permanent enthusiasm for the drudgery of the call. He had lost interest, and when Mark Twain lost interest in a subject or an undertaking, that subject or that undertaking were better dead, so far as he was concerned. His conclusion of service with the call was certain, and he wondered daily why it was delayed so long. The connection had become equally unsatisfactory to proprietor and employee. They had a heart-to-heart -heart talk presently, with the result that Mark Twain was free. He used to claim in after years, with his usual tendency to confess the worst of himself, that he was discharged, and the incident has been variously told. George Barnes himself has declared that Clemens resigned with great willingness. It is very likely that the paragraph at the end of chapter 58 in Roughing It presents the situation with fair accuracy, though, as always, the author makes it as unpleasant for himself as possible. At last, one of the proprietors took me aside with a charity I still remember with considerable respect and gave me an opportunity to resign my birth, and so save myself the disgrace of a dismissal. As an extreme contrast with the supposititious butterfly idleness of his beginning in San Francisco, and for no other discoverable reason, he doubtless thought it necessary, in the next chapter of that book, to depict himself as having reached the depths of hard luck, debt, and poverty. I became an adept 
at slinking, he says. I slunk from back street to back street. I slunk to my bed. I had pawned everything but the clothes I had on. This is pure fiction. That he occasionally found himself short of funds is likely enough. A literary life invites that sort of thing. But that he ever clung to a single silver ten-cent piece, as he tells us, and became the familiar of mendicancy, was a condition supplied altogether by his later imagination to satisfy what he must have regarded as an artistic need. Almost immediately following his separation from the call, he arranged with Goodman to write a daily letter for the Enterprise, reporting San Francisco matters after his own notion with a free hand. His payment for this work was thirty dollars a week, and he had an additional return from his literary sketches. The arrangement was an improvement both as to labor and income. Real affluence appeared on the horizon just then, in the form of a liberal offer for the Tennessee land. But, alas, it was from a wine-grower who wished to turn the tract into great vineyards, and Orion had a prohibition seizure at the moment, so the trade was not made. Orion further argued that the prospective purchaser would necessarily be obliged to import horticultural labor from Europe, and that those people might be homesick badly treated and consequently unhappy in those far eastern tennessee mountains such was orion's way end of chapter forty seven bohemian days read by john greenman this is section forty eight of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne Volume One, Part One, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 48. The Refuge of the Hills. Those who remember Mark Twain's Enterprise letters, they are no longer obtainable. Note, many of these are indeed now obtainable by simple web search. David Widger, Project Gutenberg. Declare them to have been the greatest series of daily philippics ever written. However this may be, it is certain that they made a stir. Goodman permitted him to say absolutely what he pleased upon any subject. San Francisco was fairly weltering in corruption, official and private. He assailed whatever came first to hand with all the fierceness of a flaming indignation long restrained. Quite naturally he attacked the police, and with such ferocity and penetration that as soon as copies of the Enterprise came from Virginia, the city hall began to boil and smoke and threaten trouble. Martin G. Burke, then chief of police, entered libel suit against the Enterprise, prodigiously advertising that paper, copies of which were snatched as soon as the stage brought them. Mark Twain really let himself go then. He wrote a letter that on the outside was marked, Be sure and let Joe see this before it goes in. He even doubted himself whether Goodman would dare to print it after reading. It was a letter describing the city's corrupt morals under the existing police government. It began, The air is full of lechery, and rumors of lechery, and continued in a strain which made even the Enterprise printers aghast. You can never afford to publish that, the foreman said to Goodman. Let it all go in, every word, Goodman answered. If Mark can stand it, I can. It seemed unfortunate at the time that Steve Gillis should select this particular moment to stir up trouble that would involve both himself and Clemens with the very officials which the latter had undertaken to punish. Passing a saloon one night alone, Gillis heard an altercation going on inside and very naturally stepped in to enjoy it including the barkeeper there were three against two steve ranged himself on the weaker side and selected the barkeeper a big bruiser who when the fight was over was ready for the hospital it turned out that he was one of chief burke's minions and gillis was presently indicted on a charge of assault with intent to kill he knew some of the officials in a friendly way and was advised to give a straw bond and go into temporary retirement clemens of course went his bail, 
and Steve set out for Virginia City until the storm blew over. This was Burke's opportunity. When the case was called and Gillis did not appear, Burke promptly instituted an action against his bondsman, with an execution against his loose property. The watch that had been given him as governor of the third house came near being thus sacrificed in the cause of friendship, and was only saved by skillful manipulation. Now it was down in the chain of circumstances that Steve Gillis's brother, James N. Gillis, a gentle-hearted hermit, a pocket-miner of the Halcyon Tuolumne district, the truthful James of Bret Hart, happened to be in San Francisco at this time, and invited Clemens to return with him to the far seclusion of his cabin on Jackass Hill. In that peaceful retreat were always rest and refreshment for the wayfarer, and more than one weary writer besides Bret Hart had found shelter there. James Gillis himself had fine literary instincts, but he remained a pocket-miner because he loved that quiet pursuit of gold, the Arcadian life, the companionship of his books, the occasional bohemian pilgrim who found refuge in his retreat. It is said that the sick were made well, and the well made better, in Jim Gillis's cabin on the hilltop, where the air was nectar and the stillness like enchantment. One could mine there if he wished to do so. Jim would always furnish him a promising claim, and teach him the art of following the little fan-like drift of gold specks to the nested deposit of nuggets somewhere up the hillside. He regularly shared his cabin with one Dick Stoker, Dick Baker of Roughing It, another genial soul who long ago had retired from the world to this forgotten land, also with Dick's cat, Tom Quartz, but there was always room for guests. In Roughing It, and in a later story, The Californian's Tale, Mark Twain has made us acquainted with the verdant solitude of the Tuolumne Hills, that dreamy, delicious paradise where once a vast population had gathered when placer mining had been in its bloom a dozen years before. The human swarm had scattered when the washings failed to pay, leaving only a quiet emptiness and the few pocket miners along the Stanislaus and among the hills. Vast areas of that section present a strange appearance today. Long stretches there are, crowded and jammed, and drifted with ghostly white stones that stand up like fossils of a prehistoric life. The earth deposit which once covered them entirely washed away, every particle of it removed by the greedy hordes, leaving only this vast bleaching drift, literally the picked bones of the land. At one place stands Columbia, regarded once as a rival to Sacramento, a possible state capital, a few tumbling shanties now, and a ruined church. It was the 4th of December, 1864, when Mark Twain arrived at Jim Gillis's cabin. He found it a humble habitation made of logs and slabs, partly sheltered by a great live oak tree surrounded by a stretch of grass. It had not much in the way of pretentious furniture but there was a large fireplace, and a library which included the standard authors. A younger Gillis boy, William, was there at this time, so that the family numbered five in all, including Tom Quartz, the cat. On rainy days they would gather about the big open fire, and Jim Gillis, with his back to the warmth, would relate diverting yarns, creation of his own, turned out hot from the anvil, forged as he went along. He had a startling imagination and he had fostered in it that secluded place. His stories usually consisted of wonderful adventures of his companion, Dick Stoker, portrayed with humor, and that serene and vagrant fancy which builds as it goes, careless as to whither it is proceeding, and whether the story shall end well or ill, soon or late, if ever. He always pretended that these extravagant tales of Stoker were strictly true, and Stoker, forty-six and gray as a rat, earnest, thoughtful, and tranquilly serene, would smoke and look into the fire and listen to those astonishing things of himself, smiling a little now and then, but saying never a word. What did it matter to him? He had no world outside of the cabin and the hills, no affairs. He would live and die there. His affairs all had ended long ago. 
a number of the stories used in mark twain's books were first told by jim gillis standing with his hands crossed behind him back to the fire in the cabin on jackass hill the story of dick baker's cat was one of these the jaybird and acorn story of a tramp abroad was another also the story of the burning shame and there are others mark twain had little to add to these stories in fact he never could get them to sound as well he said as when jim gillis had told them james gillis's imagination sometimes led him into difficulties once a feeble old squaw came along selling some fruit that looked like green plums stoker who knew the fruit well enough carelessly ventured the remark that it might be all right but he had never heard of anybody eating it which set gillis off into eloquent praises of its delights all of which he knew to be purely imaginary whereupon stoker told him if he liked the fruit so well to buy some of it there was no escape after that jim had to buy some of those plums whose acid was of the hair-lifting aquafortis variety and all the rest of the day he stewed them adding sugar trying to make them palatable tasting them now and then boasting meanwhile of their nectar-like deliciousness he gave the others a taste by and by a withering corroding sup and they derided him and rode him down but jim never weakened he ate that fearful brew and though for days his mouth was like fire he still referred to the luscious health-giving joys of the californian plums jackass hill was not altogether a solitude here and there were neighbors another pocket miner named carrington had a cabin not far away and a mile or two distant lived an old couple with a pair of pretty daughters so plump and trim and innocent that they were called the chaparral quails young men from far and near paid court to them and on sunday afternoons so many horses would be tied to their front fence as to suggest an afternoon service there young billy gillis knew them and one sunday morning took his brother's friend sam clemens over for a call they went early with forethought and promptly took the girls for a walk they took a long walk and went wandering over the hills toward sandy bar and the stanislaus through that reposeful land which bret hart would one day light with idyllic romance and toward evening found themselves a long way from home they must return by the nearest way to arrive before dark one of the young ladies suggested a short cut through the chemise and they started but they were lost presently and it was late very late when at last they reached the ranch the mother of the quails was sitting up for them and she had something to say she let go a perfect storm of general denunciation then narrowed the attack to samuel clemens as the oldest of the party he remained mildly serene it wasn't my fault he ventured at last it was billy gillis's fault no such thing you know better mr gillis has been here often it was you but do you realize ma'am how tired and hungry we are H haven't you got a bite for us to eat no sir not a bite for such as you the offender's eyes wandering about the room spied something in a corner isn't that a guitar over there he asked yes sir it is what of it the culprit walked over and taking it up tuned the strings a little and struck the chords then he began to sing he began very softly and sang fly away pretty moth then araby's daughter he could sing very well in those days following with the simpler chords perhaps the mother quail had known those songs herself back in the states for her manner grew kindlier almost with the first notes when he had finished she was the first to ask him to go on i suppose you are just like all young folks she said i was young myself once while you sing i'll get some supper she left the door to the kitchen open so that she could hear and cooked whatever she could find for the belated party end of chapter forty eight the refuge of the hills read by john greenman 
This is section 49 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835-1866. Chapter 49. The Jumping Frog. It was the rainy season, the winter of 1864 and 1865, but there were many pleasant days when they could go pocket-hunting, and Samuel Clemens soon added a knowledge of this fascinating science to his other acquirements. Sometimes he worked with Dick Stoker, sometimes with one of the Gillis boys. He did not make his fortune at pocket-mining. He only laid its cornerstone. In the old notebook he kept of that sojourn we find that, with Jim Gillis, he made a trip over into Calaveras County soon after Christmas, and remained there until after New Year's, probably prospecting, and he records that on New Year's night, at Vallecita, he saw a magnificent lunar rainbow in a very light, drizzling rain. A lunax rainbow is one of the things people seldom see. He thought it an omen of good fortune. They returned to the cabin on the hill, but later in the month, on the 23rd, they crossed over into Calaveras again, and began pocket-hunting not far from Angel's Camp. The notebook records that the bill of fare at the camp hotel consisted wholly of beans and something which bore the name of coffee, also that the rains were frequent and heavy. January 27th. Same old diet, same old weather. Went out to the pocket claim, had to rush back. They had what they believed to be a good claim. Jim Gillis declared the indications promising, and if they could only have good weather to work it, they were sure of rich returns. For himself he would have been willing to work rain or shine. Clemens, however, had different views on the subject. His part was carrying water for washing out the pans of dirt, and carrying pails of water through the cold rain and mud was not very fascinating work. Dick Stoker came over before long to help. Things went a little better then, but most of their days were spent in the barroom of the dilapidated tavern at Angel's Camp, enjoying the company of a former Illinois River pilot, Ben Coon. This name has been variously given as Ross Coon, Coon Drayton, etc. It is given here as set down in Mark Twain's notes, made on the spot. Coon was not, as has been stated, the proprietor of the hotel which was kept by a Frenchman, but a frequenter of it, a solemn, fat-witted person, who dozed by the stove or told slow, endless stories, without point or application. Listeners were a boon to him, for few came, and not many would stay. To Mark Twain and Jim Gillis, however, Ben Coon was a delight. It was soothing and comfortable to listen to his endless narratives, told in that solemn way, with no suspicion of humor. Even when his yarns had point, he did not recognize it. One dreary afternoon, in his slow, monotonous fashion, he told them about a frog, a frog that had belonged to a man named Coleman, who trained it to jump, but that failed to win a wager because the owner of a rival frog had surreptitiously loaded the trained jumper with shot. The story had circulated among the camps, and a well-known journalist named Samuel Sebo had already made a squib of it, but neither Clemens nor Gillis had ever happened to hear it before. They thought the tale in itself amusing, and the spectacle of a man drifting serenely along through such a queer yarn without ever smiling was exquisitely absurd. When Coon had talked himself out, his hearers played billiards on the frowsy table, and now and then one would remark to the other, "'I don't see no pints about that frog that's any better than any other frog.' And perhaps the other would answer, "'I ain't got no frog, but if I had a frog I'd bet you.' Out on the claim between pails of water, Clemens, as he watched Jim Gillis or Dick Stoker washing, would be apt to say, "'I don't see no points about that pan of dirt. It's any better than any other pan of dirt.' And so they kept it up. Then the rain would come again and interfere with their work. 
One afternoon, when Clemens and Gillis were following certain tiny sprayed specks of gold that were leading them to pocket, somewhere up the long slope, the chill downpour set in. Gillis, as usual, was washing, and Clemens carrying water. The color was getting better with every pan, and Jim Gillis believed that now, after their long waiting, they were to be rewarded. Possessed with the miner's passion, he would have gone on washing and climbing toward the precious pocket, regardless of everything. Clemens, however, shivering and disgusted, swore that each pail of water was his last. His teeth were chattering, and he was wet through. Finally, he said, in his deliberate way, "'Jim, I won't carry any more water. This work is too disagreeable.' Gillis had just taken out a panful of dirt. "'Bring one more pail, Sam,' he pleaded. "'Oh, hell, Jim, I won't do it. I'm freezing.' "'Just one more pail, Sam,' he pleaded. "'No, sir, not a drop. Not if I knew there were a million dollars in that pan.' Gillis tore a page out of his notebook and hastily posted a thirty-day claim notice by the pan of dirt and they set out for Angel's camp. It kept on raining and storming, and they did not go back. A few days later, a letter from Steve Gillis made Clemens decide to return to San Francisco. With Jim Gillis and Dick Stoker, he left Angel's and walked across the mountains to Jackass Hill in the snowstorm. The first I ever saw in California, he says in his notes. In the meantime the rain had washed away the top of the pan of earth they had left standing on the hillside, and exposed a handful of nuggets, pure gold. Two strangers, Austrians, had come along, and, observing it, had sat down to wait until the thirty-day claim notice posted by Jim Killis should expire. They did not mind the rain, not with all that gold in sight, and the minute the thirty days were up, they followed the lead a few pans farther and took out some say ten some say twenty thousand dollars in either case it was a good pocket mark twain missed it by one pail of water still it is just as well perhaps when one remembers that vaster nugget of angel's camp the jumping frog jim gillis always declared if sam had got that pocket he would have remained a pocket miner to the end of his days, like me. In Mark Twain's old notebook occurs a memorandum of the frog story, a mere casual entry of its main features. Coleman with his jumping frog bet Stranger fifty dollars. Stranger had no frog, and C got him one. In the meantime, Stranger filled C's frog full of shot, and he couldn't jump. The stranger's frog won. It seemed unimportant enough, no doubt, at the time, but it was the nucleus around which was built a surpassing fame. The hills along the Stanislaus have turned out some wonderful nuggets in their time, but no other of such size as that. End of chapter 49, The Jumping Frog, read by John Greenman. Section 50 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 50. Back to the Tumult. From the Notebook. February 25th. Arrived in Stockton, 5 p.m. Home again home again at the Occidental Hotel, San Francisco. Find letters from Artemis Ward asking me to write a sketch for his new book of Nevada Territory Travels, which is soon to come out. Too late. Ought to have got the letters three months ago. They are dated early in November. He was sorry not to oblige Ward, sorry also not to have representation in his book. He wrote explaining the circumstance and telling the story of his absence. 
Steve Gillis, meantime, had returned to San Francisco and settled his difficulties there. The friends again took up residence together. Mark Twain resumed his daily letters to the Enterprise without further annoyance from official sources. Perhaps there was a temporary truce in that direction, though he continued to attack various abuses, civic, private, and artistic, becoming a sort of general censor, establishing for himself the title of the moralist of the main. The letters were reprinted in San Francisco and widely read. Now and then someone had the temerity to answer them, but most of his victims maintained a discreet silence. In one of these letters he told of the Mexican oyster, a rather tough, unsatisfactory article of diet, which could not stand criticism, and presently disappeared from the market. It was a mistake, however, for him to attack an Alta journalist by the name of Evans. Evans was a poet, and once composed an elegy with a refrain which ended, Gone, 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 gone to his endeavor, gone, 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 forever and forever. In the Enterprise letter following its publication, Mark Twain referred to this poem. He parodied the refrain and added, If there is any criticism to make on it, I should say there is a little too much gone and not enough forever. It was a more or less pointless witticism, but it had a humorous, quotable flavor, and it made Evans mad. In a squib in the Alta, he retaliated. Mark Twain has killed the Mexican oyster. We only regret that the act was not inspired by a worthier motive. Mark Twain's sole reason for attacking the Mexican oyster was because the restaurant that sold them refused him credit. A deadly thrust like that could not be parried in print. To deny or recriminate would be to appear ridiculous. One could only sweat and breathe vengeance. Joe, he said to Goodman, who had come over for a visit, my one object in life now is to make enough money to stand trial and then go and murder Evans. He wrote verses himself sometimes and lightened his enterprise letters with jingles. One of these concerned Tom McGuire, the autocrat manager of San Francisco theaters. It details McGuire's assault on one of his actors. Tom McGuire, roused to ire, lighted on McDougal, tore his coat, clutched his throat, and split him in the bugle. For shame, oh fie! McGuire, why will you thus skyugle? Why curse and swear and rip and tear the innocent McDougal? Of bones bereft, almost, you've left Vestvali, gentle Jew gal, and now you've smashed and almost hashed the form of poor MacDougall. Goodman remembers that Clemens and Gillis were together again on California Street at this time, and of hearing them sing the doleful ballad of the rejected lover, another of Mark Twain's compositions. It was a wild, blasphemous outburst, and the furious fervor with which Mark and Steve delivered it, standing side by side and waving their fists, did not render it less objectionable. Such memories as these are set down here, for they exhibit a phase of that robust personality built of the same primeval material from which the world was created, built of every variety of material, in fact, ever incorporated in a human being, equally capable of writing unprintable coarseness, and that rarest and most tender of all characterizations, the recollections of Joan of Arc. End of chapter 50. Back to the Tumult. Read by John Greenman. This is section 51 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 51, The Cornerstone. Along with his enterprise work, Clemens continued to write occasionally for the Californian, 
but for some reason he did not offer the story of the jumping frog for one thing he did not regard it highly as literary material he knew that he had enjoyed it himself but the humor and fashion of its telling seemed to him of too simple and mild a variety in that day of boisterous incident and exaggerated form by and by artemus ward turned up in san francisco and one night mark twain told him his experiences with jim gillis and in angel's camp also of ben coon and his tale of the calaveras frog ward was delighted write it he said there is still time to get it into my volume of sketches send it to carleton my publisher in new york this is in accordance with mr clemens recollection of the matter the author can find no positive evidence that ward was on the pacific coast again in eighteen sixty five it seems likely therefore that the telling of the frog story and his approval of it were accomplished by exchange of letters clemens promised to do this but delayed fulfillment somewhat and by the time the sketch reached carleton ward's book was about ready for the press it did not seem worth while to carleton to make any change of plans that would include the frog story the publisher handed it over to henry clapp editor of the saturday press a perishing sheet saying here clapp here's something you can use in your paper clapp took it thankfully enough we may believe jim smiley and his jumping frog this was the original title appeared in the saturday press of november eighteenth eighteen sixty five and was immediately copied and quoted far and near it brought the name of mark twain across the mountains bore it up and down the atlantic coast and out over the prairies of the middle west away from the pacific slope only a reader here and there had known the name before now every one who took a newspaper was treated to the tale of the wonderful calaveras frog and received a mental impress of the author's signature the name mark twain became hardly an institution as yet but it made a strong bid for national acceptance as for its owner he had no suspicion of these momentous happenings for a considerable time the telegraph did not carry such news in those days and it took a good while for the echo of his victory to travel to the coast when at last a lagging word of it did arrive it would seem to have brought disappointment rather than exultation to the author even artemus ward's opinion of the story had not increased mark twain's regard of it as literature that it had struck the popular note meant as he believed failure for his more highly regarded work in a letter written january twentieth eighteen sixty six he says these things for himself i do not know what to write my life is so uneventful i wish i was back there piloting up and down the river again verily all is vanity and little worth save piloting to think that after writing many an article a man might be excused for thinking tolerably good those new york people should single out a villainous backwoods sketch to compliment me on jim smiley and his jumping frog a squib which would never have been written but to please artemus ward and then it reached new york too late to appear in his book but no matter his book was a wretchedly poor one generally speaking and it could be no credit to either of us to appear between its covers this paragraph is from the new york correspondence of the san francisco alta mark twain's story in the saturday press of november eighteenth called jim smiley and his jumping frog has set all new york in a roar and he may be said to have made his mark i have been asked fifty times about it and its author and the papers are copying it far and near it is voted the best thing of the day cannot the californian afford to keep mark all to itself it should not let him scintillate so widely without first being filtered through the california press 
the new york publishing house of carleton and company gave the sketch to the saturday press when they found it was too late for the book it is difficult to judge the jumping frog story today it has the intrinsic fundamental value of one of aesop's fables the resemblance of the frog story to the early greek tales must have been noted by professor henry sidgwick who synopsized it in greek form and phrase for his book greek prose composition through this originated the impression that the story was of athenian root mark twain himself was deceived until in eighteen ninety nine when he met professor sidgwick who explained that the greek version was the translation and mark twain's the original that he had thought it unnecessary to give credit for a story so well known see the jumping frog harper and brothers nineteen o three page sixty four it contains a basic idea which is essentially ludicrous and the quaint simplicity of its telling is convincing and full of charm it appeared in print at a time when american humor was chaotic the public taste unformed we had a vast appreciation for what was comic with no great number of opportunities for showing it we were so ready to laugh that when a real opportunity came along we improved it and kept on laughing and repeating the cause of our merriment directing the attention of our friends to it whether the story of jim smiley's frog offered for the first time today would capture the public and become the initial block of a towering fame is another matter that the author himself underrated it it is certain that the public receiving it at what we now term the psychological moment may have overrated it is by no means impossible in any case it does not matter now the stone rejected by the builder was made the cornerstone of his literary edifice as such it is immortal in the letter already quoted clemens speaks of both bret harte and himself as having quit the californian and mentions that in future they expected to write for eastern papers he adds though i am generally placed at the head of my breed of scribblers in this part of the country the place properly belongs to bret harte i think though he denies it along with the rest he wants me to club a lot of old sketches together with a lot of his and publish a book i wouldn't do it only he agrees to take all the trouble but i want to know whether we are going to make anything out of it first however he has written to a new york publisher and if we are offered a bargain that will pay for a month's labor we will go to work and prepare the volume for the press nothing came of the proposed volume or of other joint literary schemes these two had then in mind neither of them would seem to have been optimistic as to their future place in american literature certainly in their most exalted moments they could hardly have dreamed that within half a dozen years they would be the head and front of a new school of letters the two most talked of men in america end of chapter fifty one the cornerstone read by john greenman this is section fifty two of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter fifty two a commission to the sandwich islands whatever his first emotions concerning the success of jim smiley's frog may have been the sudden astonishing leap of that batrachian into american literature gave the author an added prestige at home as well as in distant parts those about him were inclined to regard him in some degree at least as a national literary figure and to pay tribute accordingly special honors began to be shown to him a fine new steamer the ajax built for the sandwich island trade carried on its initial trip a select party of guests of which he was invited to make one he did not go and reproached himself sorrowfully afterward 
if the ajax were back i would go quick and throw up my correspondence she had fifty-two invited guests aboard the cream of the town gentlemen and ladies and a splendid brass band i could not accept because there would be no one to write my correspondence while i was gone in fact the daily letter had grown monotonous he was restless and the ajax excursion which he had been obliged to forego made him still more dissatisfied an idea occurred to him the sugar industry of the islands was a matter of great commercial interest to california while the life and scenery there picturesquely treated would appeal to the general reader he was on excellent terms with james anthony and paul morrill of the sacramento union he proposed to them that they send him as their special correspondent to report to their readers in a series of letters life trade agriculture and general aspect of the islands to his vast delight they gave him the commission he wrote home joyously now i am to remain there a month and ransack the islands the cataracts and volcanoes completely and write twenty or thirty letters for which they pay as much money as i would get if i stayed at home he adds that on his return he expects to start straight across the continent by way of the columbia river the pendore lakes through montana and down the missouri river only two hundred miles of land travel from san francisco to new orleans so it is man proposes while fate undisturbed spins serenely on he sailed by the ajax on her next trip march seventh eighteen sixty six beginning his first sea voyage a brand new experience during which he acquired the names of the sails and parts of the ship with considerable knowledge of navigation and of the islands he was to visit whatever information passengers and sailors could furnish it was a happy stormy voyage altogether in roughing it he has given us some account of it it was the eighteenth of march when he arrived at honolulu and his first impression of that tranquil harbor remained with him always in fact his whole visit there became one of those memory pictures full of golden sunlight and peace to be found somewhere in every human past the letters of introduction he had brought and the reputation which had preceded him guaranteed him welcome and hospitality officials and private citizens were alike ready to show him their pleasant land and he fairly reveled in its delicious air its summer warmth its soft repose oh islands there are on the face of the deep where the leaves never fade and the skies never weep he quotes in his notebook and adds went with mr damon to his cool vine-shaded home no careworn or eager anxious faces in this land of happy contentment god what a contrast with california and the washoe and in another place they live in the s i no rush no worry merchant goes down to his store like a gentleman at nine goes home at four and thinks no more of business till next day damned san f style of wearing out life he fitted in with the languorous island existence but he had come for business and he lost not much time he found there a number of friends from washoe including the rev mr rising whose health had failed from overwork by their direction and under official guidance he set out on oahu one of the several curious horses he has immortalized in print and accompanied by a pleasant party of ladies and gentlemen encircled the island of that name crossed it and recrossed it visited its various battlefields returning to honolulu 
lame, sore, sunburnt, but triumphant. His letters home, better even than his Union correspondence, reveal his personal interest and enthusiasms. I have got a lot of human bones which I took from one of these battlefields. I guess I will bring you some of them. I went with the American minister and took dinner this evening with the King's Grand Chamberlain, who is related to the royal family, and though darker than a mulatto, he has an excellent English education, and in manners is an accomplished gentleman. He is to call for me in the morning. We will visit the king in the palace. After dinner they called in the singing girls, and we had some beautiful music, sung in the native tongue. It was his first association with royalty, and it was human that he should air it a little. In the same letter he states, I will sail in a day or two on a tour of the other islands to be gone two months. In Roughing It he has given us a picture of his visits to the islands, their plantations, their volcanoes, their natural and historic wonders. He was an insatiable sightseer then, and a persevering one. The very name of a new point of interest filled him with an eager enthusiasm to be off. No discomfort or risk or distance discouraged him. With a single daring companion, a man who said he could find the way, he crossed the burning floor of the mighty crater of Kilauea, then in almost constant eruption, racing across the burning lava floor, jumping wide and bottomless crevices when a misstep would have meant death. By and by, Marlette shouted, Stop! I never stopped quicker in my life. I asked what the matter was. He said we were out of the path. He said we must not try to go on until we found it again, for we were surrounded with beds of rotten lava through which we could easily break and plunge down one thousand feet. I thought eight hundred would answer for me, and was about to say so, when Marlette partly proved his statement, crushing through and disappearing to his armpits. They made their way across at last and stood the rest of the night gazing down upon a spectacle of a crater in quivering action, a veritable lake of fire. They had risked their lives for that scene, but it seemed worth while. His open-air life on the river and the mining camps had prepared Samuel Clemens for adventurous hardships. He was thirty years old, with his full account of mental and physical capital. His growth had been slow, but he was entering now upon his golden age. He was fitted for conquest of whatever sort, and he was beginning to realize his power. End of chapter 52 A Commission to the Sandwich Islands Read by John Greenman This is section 53 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835-1866 Chapter 53 Anson Burlingame and the Hornet Disaster It was near the end of June when he returned to Honolulu from a tour of all the islands, fairly worn out and prostrated with saddle boils. He expected only to rest and be quiet for a season, but all unknown to him, startling and historic things were taking place in which he was to have a part, events that would mark another forward stride in his career. The Ajax had just come in, bringing His Excellency Anson Burlingame, then returning to his post as Minister to China. Also General Van Valkenburg, Minister to Japan. Colonel Rumsey and Minister Burlingame's son, Edward. Edward L. Burlingame, now for many years editor of Scribner's Magazine. Then a lively boy of eighteen. Young Burlingame had read The Jumping Frog, 
and was enthusiastic about Mark Twain and his work. Learning that he was in Honolulu, laid up at his hotel, the party sent word that they would call on him next morning. Clemens felt that he must not accept this honor, sick or well. He crawled out of bed, dressed, and shaved himself as quickly as possible, and drove to the American minister's, where the party was staying. They had a hilariously good time. When he returned to his hotel he sent them, by request, whatever he had on hand of his work. General Van Falkenberg had said to him, "'California is proud of Mark Twain, and some day the American people will be too, no doubt.' There has seldom been a more accurate prophecy. But a still greater event was imminent. On that very day, June 21, 1866, there came word of the arrival at San Pajo, on the island of Hawaii, of an open boat containing fifteen starving wretches, who on short ten-day rations had been buffeting a stormy sea for forty-three days. A vessel, the Hornet, from New York, had taken fire and burned on the line, and since early May, on that meager sustenance, they had been battling with hundreds of leagues of adverse billows seeking for land. A few days following the first report, eleven of the rescued men were brought to Honolulu and placed in the hospital. Mark Twain recognized the great news importance of the event. It would be a splendid beat if he could interview the castaways and be the first to get their story to his paper. There was no cable in those days. A vessel for San Francisco would sail next morning. It was the opportunity of a lifetime, and he must not miss it. Bedridden as he was, the undertaking seemed beyond his strength. But just at this time the Burlingame party descended on him, and almost before he knew it he was on the way to the hospital on a cot, escorted by the heads of the joint legations of China and Japan. Once there, Anson Burlingame, with his splendid human sympathy and handsome courtly presence, drew from those enfeebled castaways all the story of their long privation and struggle that had stretched across forty-three distempered days and four thousand miles of sea. All that Mark Twain had to do was to listen and make the notes. He put in the night-writing against time. Next morning, just as the vessel for the States was drifting away from her dock, a strong hand flung his bulky envelope of manuscript aboard, and if the vessel arrived, his great beat sure. It did arrive, and the three-column story on the front page of the Sacramento Union, in its issue of July 19th, gave the public the first detailed history of the terrible Hornet disaster and the rescue of those starving men. Such a story occupied a wider place in the public interest than it would in these crowded days. The telegraph carried it everywhere, and it was featured as a sensation. Mark Twain always adored the name and memory of Anson Burlingame. In his letter home he tells of Burlingame's magnanimity in throwing away an invitation to dine with princes and foreign dignitaries to help him. "'You know, I appreciate that kind of thing,' he says, which was a true statement, and in future years he never missed an opportunity of paying an installment on his debt of gratitude. It was proper that he should do so, for the obligation was a far greater one than that contracted in obtaining the tale of the Hornet disaster. It was the debt which one owes to a man who, from the deep measure of his understanding, gives encouragement and exactly needed and convincing advice. Anson Burlingame said to Samuel Clemens, "'You have great ability. I believe you have genius. What you need now is the refinement of association.' Seek companionship among men of superior intellect and character. Refine yourself and your work. Never affiliate with inferiors. Always climb. Clemens never forgot that advice. He did not always observe it, but he rarely failed to realize its gospel. Burlingame urged him to travel. Come to Pekin next winter, he said, and visit me. Make my house your home. I will give you letters and introduce you. You will have facilities for acquiring information about China." It is not surprising, then, that Mark Twain never felt his debt to Anson Burlingame entirely paid. Burlingame came more than once to the hotel, for Clemens was really ill now, and they discussed plans for his future betterment. 
he promised of course to visit china and when he was alone put in a good deal of time planning a trip around the world which would include the great capitals when not otherwise employed he read though there was only one book in the hotel a blue and gold edition of dr holmes songs in many keys and this he soon knew almost by heart from title page to fini he was soon up and about no one could remain ill long in those happy islands young burlingame came and suggested walks once when clemens hesitated the young man said but there is a scriptural command for you to go if you can quote one i'll obey it said clemens very well the bible says if any man require thee to walk a mile go with him twain the command was regarded as sufficient clemens quoted the witticism later in his first lecture and it was often repeated in after years ascribed to warner ward and a dozen others its origin was as here set down under date of july fourth eighteen sixty six mark twain's sandwich island notebook says went to a ball eight thirty p m danced till twelve thirty stopped at general van valkenburg's room and talked with him and mr burlingame and ed burlingame until three a m from which we may conclude that he had altogether recovered a few days later the legation party had sailed for china and japan and on the nineteenth clemens himself set out by a slow sailing vessel to san francisco they were becalmed and were twenty-five days making the voyage captain mitchell and others of the wrecked hornet were aboard and he put in a good deal of time copying their diaries and preparing a magazine article which he believed would prove his real entrance to the literary world the vessel lay almost perfectly still day after day and became a regular playground at sea sundays they had services and mark twain led the choir i hope they will have a better opinion of our music in heaven than i have down here he says in his notes if they don't a thunderbolt will knock this vessel endways it is perhaps worthy of mention that on the night of the twenty seventh of july he records having seen another splendidly colored lunar rainbow that he regarded this as an indication of future good fortune is not surprising considering the events of the previous year it was august thirteenth when he reached san francisco and the notebook entry of that day says home again no not home again in prison again and all the wild sense of freedom gone the city seems so cramped and so dreary with toil and care and business anxiety god help me i wish i were at sea again there were compensations however he went over to sacramento and was abundantly welcomed it was agreed that in addition to the twenty dollars allowed for each letter a special bill should be made for the hornet report how much do you think it ought to be mark james anthony asked oh i'm a modest man i don't want the whole union office call it one hundred dollars a column there was a general laugh the bill was made out at that figure and he took it to the business office for payment the cashier didn't faint he wrote many years later but he came rather near it he sent for the proprietors and they only laughed in their jolly fashion and said it was a robbery but no matter pay it it's all right the best men that ever owned a newspaper my debut as a literary person collected works though inferior to the descriptive writing which a year later would give him a world-wide fame the sandwich island letters added greatly to his prestige on the pacific coast they were convincing informing tersely even eloquently descriptive 
with a vein of humor adapted to their audience. Yet to read them now, in the fine nonpareil type in which they were set, is such a wearying task that one can only marvel at their popularity. They were not brilliant literature, by our standards today. Their humor is usually of a muscular kind, varied with grotesque exaggerations. The literary quality is pretty attenuated. Here and there are attempts at verse. He had a fashion in those days of combining two or more poems with distracting, sometimes amusing, effect. Examples of these dislocations occur in the Union letters. A single stanza will present the general idea. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold. The turf, with their bayonets turning, and his cohorts were gleaming with purple and gold, and our lanterns dimly burning. Only a trifling portion of the letters found their way into his Sandwich Island chapters of Roughing It five years later. They do, however, reveal a sort of transition stage between the riotous fluorescence of the Comstock and the mellowness of his later style. He was learning to see things with better eyes, from a better point of view. It is not difficult to believe that this literary change of heart was in no small measure due to the influence of Anson Burlingame. End of chapter 53, Anson Burlingame and the Hornet Disaster Read by John Greenman This is section 54 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875 Chapter 54, The Lecturer It was not easy to take up the daily struggle again, but it was necessary. Clemens once declared he had been so blue at this period that one morning he put a loaded pistol to his head, but found he lacked courage to pull the trigger. Out of the ruck of possibilities, his brain always thronged with plans, he constructed three or four resolves. The chief of these was the trip around the world, but that lay months ahead, and in the meantime ways and means must be provided. Another intention was to finish the Hornet article and forward it to Harper's Magazine, a purpose carried immediately into effect. To his delight the article found acceptance, and he looked forward to a day of its publication as the beginning of a real career. He intended to follow it up with a series on the islands, which in due time might result in a book and an income. He had gone so far as to experiment with a dedication for the book, an inscription to his mother, modified later for use in The Innocents Abroad. A third plan of action was to take advantage of the popularity of the Hawaiian letters and deliver a lecture on the same subject. But this was a fearsome prospect. He trembled when he thought of it. As governor of the third house he had been extravagantly received and applauded, but in that case the position of public entertainer had been thrust upon him. To come forward now, offering himself in the same capacity, was a different matter. He believed he could entertain, but he lacked the courage to declare himself. Besides, it meant a risk of his slender capital. He confided his situation to Colonel John McComb of the Alta California, and was startled by McComb's vigorous endorsement. "'Do it, by all means,' urged McComb. "'It will be a grand success, I know it. Take the largest house in town, and charge a dollar a ticket.' Frightened, but resolute, he went to the leading theater manager, the same Tom McGuire of his verses, and was offered the new opera house at half rates. The next day this advertisement appeared. McGuire's Academy of Music, Pine Street, near Montgomery. The Sandwich Islands, Mark Twain. Honolulu correspondent of the Sacramento Union will deliver a lecture on the Sandwich Islands at the Academy of Music on Tuesday evening, October 2nd, 1866, in which passing mention will be made of Harris, Bishop Staley, the American missionaries, etc., and the absurd customs and characteristics of the natives duly discussed and described. The great volcano of Kilauea will also receive proper attention. A splendid orchestra is in town, 
but has not been engaged. Also, a den of ferocious wild beasts will be on exhibition in the next block. Magnificent fireworks were in contemplation for this occasion, but the idea has been abandoned. A grand torchlight procession may be expected. In fact, the public are privileged to expect whatever they please. Dress circle, one dollar. Family circle, fifty cents. Doors open at seven o'clock. The trouble to begin at eight o'clock. The story of that first lecture, as told in Roughing It, is a faithful one, and need only be summarized here. Expecting to find the house empty, he found it packed from the floodlights to the walls. Sidling out from the wings, wobbly kneed and dry of tongue, he was greeted by a murmur, a roar, a very crash of applause that frightened away his remaining vestiges of courage. Then came reaction. These were his friends, and he began to talk to them. Fear melted away, and as tide after tide of applause rose and billowed and came breaking at his feet, he knew something of the exaltation of Monte Cristo when he declared, The world is mine. It was a vast satisfaction to have succeeded. It was particularly gratifying at this time, for he dreaded going back into newspaper harness. Also, it softened later the disappointment resulting from another venture, for when the December Harper appeared with his article, the printer and proofreader had somehow converted Mark Twain into Mark Swain, and his literary dream perished. As to the literary value of his lecture, it was much higher than had been any portion of his letters, if we may judge from its few remaining fragments. One of these, a part of the description of the great volcano Haleakala on the island of Maui, is a fair example of his eloquence. It is somewhat more florid than his later description of the same scene in Roughing It, which it otherwise resembles, and we may imagine that its poetry, with the added charm of its delivery, held breathless his hearers, many of whom believed that no purer eloquence had ever been uttered or written. It is worth remembering, too, that in this lecture, delivered so long ago, he advocated the idea of American ownership of these islands, dwelling at considerable length on his reasons for this ideal. For fragmentary extracts from this first lecture of Mark Twain and news comment, see Appendix D, end of last volume. There was a gross return from his venture of more than $1,200, but with his usual business insight, which was never foresight, he had made an arrangement by which, after paying bills and dividing with his manager, he had only about one-third of this sum left. Still, even this was prosperity and triumph. He had acquired a new and lucrative profession at a bound. The papers lauded him as the most piquant and humorous writer and lecturer on the coast since the days of the lamented john phoenix he felt that he was on the high road at last dennis mccarthy late of the enterprise was in san francisco and was willing to become his manager dennis was capable and honest and clemens was fond of him they planned a tour of the nearby towns beginning with sacramento extending it later even to the mining camps such as red dog and grass valley also across into nevada with engagements at carson city virginia and gold hill it was an exultant and hilarious excursion that first lecture tour made by dennis mccarthy and mark twain success traveled with them everywhere whether the lecturer looked across the floodlights of some pretentious opera house or between the two tallow candles of some camp academy, whatever the building it was packed, and the returns were maximum. Those who remember him as a lecturer in that long-ago time say that his delivery was more quaint, his drawl more exaggerated even than in later life, that his appearance and movements on the stage were natural rather than graceful, that his manuscript, which he carried under his arm, looked like a ruffled hen. It was, in fact, originally written on sheets of manila paper in large characters, 
so that it could be read easily by dim light, and it was doubtless often disordered. There was plenty of amusing experience on this tour. At one place, when the lecture was over, an old man came to him and said, "'Be them your natural tones of eloquence?' At Grass Valley there was a rival show, consisting of a lady tightrope walker and her husband. It was a small place, and the tightrope attraction seemed likely to fail. The lady's husband had formerly been a compositor on the Enterprise, so that he felt there was a bond of brotherhood between him and Mark Twain. "'Look here,' he said. "'Let's combine our shows. I'll let my wife do the tightrope walk outside and draw a crowd, and you go inside and lecture." The arrangement was not made. Following custom, the lecturer at first thought it necessary to be introduced, and at each place McCarthy had to skirmish around and find the proper person. At Red Dog, on the Stanislaus, the man selected failed to appear, and Dennis had to provide another on short notice. He went down into the audience and captured an old fellow, who ducked and dodged, but could not escape. Dennis led him to the stage, a good deal frightened. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said, "'this is the celebrated Mark Twain from the celebrated city of San Francisco, uh, with his celebrated lecture about the uh, celebrated uh, Sandwich Islands.' That was as far as he could go. But it was far enough. Mark Twain never had a better introduction. The audience was in a shouting humor from the start. Clemens himself used to tell of an introduction at another camp, where his sponsor said, "'Ladies and gentlemen, I know only two things about this man. The first is that he's never been in jail, and the second is I don't know why.' But this is probably apocryphal. There is too much Mark Twain in it. When he reached Virginia, Goodman said to him, "'Sam, you do not need anybody to introduce you. There's a piano on the stage in the theater. Have it brought out in sight, and when the curtain rises, you be seated at the piano, playing and singing that song of yours. I had an old horse whose name was Methuselah, and don't seem to notice that the curtain is up at first. Then be surprised when you suddenly find out that it is up, and uh, begin talking uh, without any further preliminaries. This proved good advice, and the lecture, thus opened, started off with general hilarity and applause. End of chapter 54 The Lecturer Read by John Greenman This is section 55 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography Volume One, Part Two, eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five. Chapter fifty five. Highway Robbery. His Nevada lectures were bound to be immensely successful. The people regarded him as their property over there, and at Carson and Virginia the houses overflowed. At Virginia, especially, his friends urged and begged him to repeat the entertainment, but he resolutely declined. I have only one lecture yet he said i cannot bring myself to give it twice in the same town but that irresponsible imp steve gillis who was again in virginia conceived a plan which would make it not only necessary for him to lecture again but would supply him with a subject steve's plan was very simple it was to relieve the lecturer of his funds by a friendly highway robbery, and let an account of the adventure furnish the new lecture. In Roughing It, Mark Twain has given a version of this mock robbery which is correct enough as far as it goes, but important details are lacking. Only a few years ago, it was April 1907, in his cabin on Jackass Hill, with Joseph Goodman and the writer of this history present, Steve Gillis made his deathbed confession, as is here set down. Mark's lecture was given in Piper's Opera House, October 30th, 1866. The Virginia City people had heard many famous lectures before, 
but they were mere side-shows compared with Mark's. It could have been run to crowded houses for a week. We begged him to give the common people a chance, but he refused to repeat himself. He was going down to Carson and was coming back to talk in Gold Hill about a week later, and his agent, Dennis McCarthy, and I laid a plan to have him robbed on the divide between Gold Hill and Virginia, after the Gold Hill lecture was over, and he and Dennis would be coming home with the money. The divide was a good lonely place, and was famous for its hold-ups. We got City Marshal George Birdsall into it with us, and took in Leslie Blackburn, Pat Holland, Jimmy Eddington, and one or two more of Sam's old friends. We all loved him and would have fought for him in a moment. That's the kind of friends Mark had in Nevada. If he had any enemies, I never heard of them. We didn't take in Dan DeQuill or Joe here, because Sam was Joe's guest, and we were afraid he would tell him. We didn't take in Dan because we wanted him to write it up as a genuine robbery and make a big sensation. That would pack the opera house at two dollars a seat to hear Mark tell the story. Well, everything went off pretty well. About the time Mark was finishing his lecture in Gold Hill, the robbers all went up on the divide to wait, but Mark's audience gave him a kind of reception after his lecture, and we nearly froze to death up there before he came along. By and by I went back to see what was the matter. Sam and Dennis were coming, and carrying a carpet sack about half full of silver between them. I shadowed them and blew a policeman's whistle as a signal to the boys when the lecturers were within about a hundred yards of the place. I heard Sam say to Dennis, I'm glad they've got a policeman on the divide. They never had one in my day. Just about that time the boys, all with black masks on and silver dollars at the sides of their tongues to disguise their voices, stepped out and stuck six-shooters at Sam and Dennis and told them to put up their hands. The robbers called each other Beauregard and Stonewall Jackson. Of course, Dennis's hands went up and Mark's too, though Mark wasn't a bit scared or excited. He talked to the robbers in his regular fashion. He said, Don't flourish those pistols so promiscuously. They might go off by accident. They told him to hand over his watch and money, but when he started to take his hands down, they made him put them up again. Then he asked how they expected him to give them his valuables with his hands up in the sky. He said his treasures didn't lie in heaven. He told them not to take his watch, which was the one Sandy Baldwin and Theodore Winters had given him as governor of the third house, but we took it all the same. Whenever he started to put his hands down, we made him put them up again. Once he said, Don't you fellows be so rough. I was tenderly reared. Then we told him and Dennis to keep their hands up for fifteen minutes after we were gone. This was to give us time to get back to Virginia and be settled when they came along. As we were going away, Mark called, Say, you forgot something. What is it? Why, the carpet bag. He was cool all the time. Senator Bill Stewart, in his autobiography, tells a great story of how scared Mark was and how he ran. But Stewart was 3,000 miles from Virginia by that time and later got mad at Mark because he made a joke about him in roughing it. Dennis wanted to take his hands down pretty soon after we were gone, but Mark said, No, Dennis. I'm used to obeying orders when they are given in that convincing way. We'll just keep our hands up another fifteen minutes or so for good measure. We were waiting in a big saloon on C Street when Mark and Dennis came along. We knew they would come in, and we expected Mark would be excited, but he was as unruffled as a mountain lake. He told us, they had been robbed and asked me if I had any money. I gave him a hundred dollars of his own money, and he ordered refreshments for everybody. 
then we adjourned to the enterprise office where he offered a reward and dan de quill wrote up the story and telegraphed it to the other newspapers then somebody suggested that mark would have to give another lecture now and that the robbery would make a great subject he entered right into the thing and next day we engaged piper's opera house and people were offering five dollars apiece for front seats it would have been the biggest thing that ever came to virginia if it had come off but we made a mistake then by taking sandy baldwin into the joke we took in joe here too and gave him the watch and money to keep which made it hard for joe afterward but it was sandy baldwin that ruined us he had mark out to dinner the night before the show was to come off and after he got well warmed up with champagne he thought it would be a smart thing to let mark into what was really going on mark didn't see it our way he was mad clear through at this point joseph goodman took up the story he said those devils put sam's money watch keys pencils and all his things into my hands i felt particularly mean at being made accessory to the crime especially as sam was my guest and i had grave doubts as to how he would take it when he found out the robbery was not genuine i felt terribly guilty when he said joe those damned thieves took my keys and i can't get into my trunk do you suppose you could get me a key that would fit my trunk i said i thought i could during the day and after sam had gone i took his own key put it in the fire and burnt it to make it look black then i took a file and scratched it here and there to make it look as if i had been fitting it to the lock feeling guilty all the time like a man who is trying to hide a murderer sam did not ask for his key that day and that evening he was invited to judge baldwin's to dinner i thought he looked pretty silent and solemn when he came home but he only said joe let's play cards i don't feel sleepy steve here and two or three of the other boys who had been active in the robbery were present and they did not like sam's manner so they excused themselves and left him alone with me we played a good while then he said joe these cards are greasy i have got some new ones in my trunk did you get that key today i fished out that burnt scratched up key with fear and trembling but he didn't seem to notice at all and presently returned with the cards and we played and played and played till one o'clock two o'clock sam hardly saying a word and i was wondering what was going to happen and by and by he laid down his cards and looked at me and said joe sandy baldwin told me all about that robbery tonight now joe i have found out that the law doesn't recognize a joke and i am going to send every one of those fellows to the penitentiary he said it with such solemn gravity and such vindictiveness that i believed he was in dead earnest i know that i put in two hours of the hardest work i ever did trying to talk him out of that resolution i used all the arguments about the boys being his oldest friends how they all loved him how the joke had been entirely for his own good i pleaded with him begged him to reconsider i went and got his money and his watch and laid them on the table but for a time it seemed hopeless and i could imagine those fellows going behind the bars and the sensation it would make in california and just as i was about to give it up he said well joe i'll let it pass this time i'll forgive them again i've had to do it so many times but if i should see dennis mccarthy and steve gillis mounting the scaffold tomorrow, and i could save them by turning over my hand i wouldn't do it he cancelled the lecture engagement however next morning and the day after left on the pioneer stage by the way of donner lake for california the boys came rather sheepishly to see him off but he would make no show of relenting when they introduced themselves as beauregard 
Stonewall Jackson, etc., he merely said, Yes, and you'll all be behind the bars some day. There's been a good deal of robbery around here lately, and it's pretty clear now who did it. They handed him a package containing the masks which the robbers had worn. He received it in gloomy silence, but as the stage drove away he put his head out of the window and, after some pretty vigorous admonition, resumed his old smile and called out, "'Good-bye, friends! Good-bye, thieves! I bear you no malice!' So the heaviest joke was on his tormentors after all. This is the story of the famous Mark Twain robbery, direct from headquarters. It has been garbled in so many ways that it seems worth settling down in full. Dennis McCarthy, who joined him presently in San Francisco, received a little more punishment there. "'What kind of a trip did you boys have?' a friend asked of them. Clemens, just recovering from a cold which the exposure on the divide had given him, smiled grimly. "'Oh, pretty good. Only Dennis here mistook it for a spree.' He lectured again in San Francisco, this time telling the story of his overland trip in 1861, and he did the daring thing of repeating three times the worn-out story of Horace Greeley's ride with Hank Monk, as given later in Roughing It. People were deadly tired of that story out there, and when he told it the first time with great seriousness, they thought he must be failing mentally. They did not laugh, they only felt sorry. He waited a little, as if expecting a laugh, and presently led around to it and told it again. The audience was astonished still more, and pitied him thoroughly. He seemed to be waiting pathetically in the dead silence for their applause, then went on with his lecture, but presently, with labored effort, struggled around to the old story again and told it for the third time. The audience suddenly saw the joke then and became vociferous and hysterical in their applause. But it was a narrow escape. He would have been hysterical himself if the relief had not come when it did. A sidelight on the Horace Greeley story and on Mr. Greeley's eccentricities is furnished by Mr. Goodman. When I was going east in 1869, I happened to see Hank Monk just before I started. Mr. Goodman, he said, you tell Horace Greeley that I want to come east, and ask him to send me a pass. All right, Hank, I said, I will. It happened that when I got to New York City, one of the first men I met was Greeley. Mr. Greeley, I said, I have a message for you from Hank Monk. Greeley bristled and glared at me. That rascal, he said, he has done me more injury than any other man in America. End of chapter 55, Highway Robbery, read by John Greenman. This is section 56 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 56, Back to the States. In the meantime, Clemens had completed his plan for sailing, and had arranged with General McComb of the Alta, California, for letters during his proposed trip around the world. However, he meant to visit his people first, and his old home. He could go back with means now, and with the prestige of success. "'I sail to-morrow, per opposition. Telegraph you to-day,' he wrote on December 14th and a day later his notebook entry says, Sailed from San Francisco in opposition line steamer America, Captain Wakeman, at noon, 15th December, 1866. Pleasant sunny day, hills brightly clad with green grass and shrubbery. So he was really going home at last. He had been gone five and a half years, eventful, adventurous years, that had made him over completely, at least so far as ambitions and equipment were concerned. He had come away, in his early manhood, a printer and a pilot, unknown outside of his class. He was returning a man of thirty-one, 
with a fund of hard experience, three added professions, mining, journalism, and lecturing, also with a new name, already famous on the sunset slopes of his adoption, and beginning to be heard over the hills and far away. In some degree, at least, he resembled the prince of a fairy tale who, starting out humble and unnoticed, wins his way through a hundred adventures and returns with gifts and honors. The homeward voyage was a notable one. It began with a tempest a little way out of San Francisco, a storm terrible but brief, that brought the passengers from their berths to the deck and for a time set them praying. Then there was Captain Ned Wakeman, a big, burly, fearless sailor who had visited the edges of all continents and archipelagos, who had been born at sea and never had a day's schooling in his life, but he knew the Bible by heart, who was full of human nature and profanity, and believed he was the only man on the globe who knew the secret of the Bible miracles. He became a distinct personality in Mark Twain's work. The memory of him was an unfailing delight. Captain Ned Blakely in Roughing It, who with his own hands hanged Bill Noakes after reading him promiscuous chapters from the Bible, was Captain Wakeman. Captain Stormfield, who had the marvelous visit to heaven, was likewise Captain Wakeman, and he appears in the Idle Excursion and elsewhere. Another event of the voyage was crossing the Nicaragua Isthmus, the trip across the lake and down the San Juan River, a brand new experience, between shores of splendid tropic tangle gleaming with vivid life. The luxuriance got into his notebook dark grottoes, fairy festoons, tunnels, temples, columns, pillars, towers, pilasters, terraces, pyramids, mounds, domes, walls, in endless confusion of vine-work, no shape known to architecture, unimitated, and all so webbed together that short distances within are only gained by glimpses monkeys here and there, birds warbling, gorgeous plumaged birds on the wing, paradise itself, the imperial realm of beauty, nothing to wish for to make it perfect. But it was beyond the isthmus that the voyage loomed into proportions somber and terrible. The vessel they took there, the San Francisco, sailed from Greytown January 1, 1867, the beginning of a memorable year in Mark Twain's life. Next day, two cases of Asiatic cholera were reported in the steerage. There had been a rumor of it in Nicaragua, but no one expected it on the ship. The nature of the disease was not hinted at until evening, when one of the men died. Soon after midnight, the other followed. A minister making the voyage home, Rev. J. G. Fackler, read the burial service. The gaiety of the passengers, who had become well acquainted during the Pacific voyage, was subdued. When the word cholera went among them, faces grew grave and frightened. On the morning of January 4th, Rev. Fackler's services were again required. The dead man was put overboard within half an hour after he had ceased to breathe. Gloom settled upon the ship. All steam was made to put into Key West. Then some of the machinery gave way, and the ship lay rolling, helplessly becalmed in the fierce heat of the gulf, while repairs were being made. The work was done at a disadvantage, and the parts did not hold. Time and again they were obliged to lie to, in the deadly tropic heat, listening to the hopeless hammering, wondering who would be the next to be sewed up hastily in a blanket and slipped over the ship's side. On the fifth, seven new cases of illness were reported. One of the crew, a man called Shape, was said to be dying. A few hours later he was dead. By this time the Reverend Fackler himself had been taken. So they are burying poor shape without benefit of clergy, says the notebook. General consternation now began to prevail. Then it was learned that the ship's doctor had run out of medicines. The passengers became demoralized. They believed their vessel was to become a charnel ship. Strict sanitary orders were issued, and a hospital was improvised. Verily, the ship is becoming a floating hospital herself. Not an hour passes, but brings its fresh sensation, 
its new disaster, its melancholy tidings. When I think of poor shape and the preacher, both so well, when I saw them yesterday evening, I realize that I myself may be dead tomorrow. Since the last two hours all laughter, all levity has ceased on the ship. A settled gloom is upon the faces of the passengers. By noon it was evident that the minister could not survive. He died at two o'clock next morning, the fifth victim in less than five days. The machinery continued to break and the vessel to drag. The ship's doctor confessed to Clemens that he was helpless. There were eight patients in the hospital. But on January 6th they managed to make Key West, and for some reason were not quarantined. Twenty-one passengers immediately deserted the ship and were heard of no more. "'I am glad they are gone. Damn them!' says the notebook. Apparently he had never considered leaving, and a number of others remained. The doctor restocked his medicine locker, and the next day they put to sea again. Certainly they were a daring lot of passengers. On the eighth another of the patients died. Then the cooler weather seemed to check the contagion, and it was not until the night of the eleventh, when the New York harbor lights were in view, that the final death occurred. There were no new cases by this time, and the other patients were convalescent. A certificate was made out that the last man had died of dropsy. There would seem to have been no serious difficulty in docking the vessel and landing the passengers. The matter would probably be handled differently today. End of chapter 56. Back to the States. Read by John Greenman. This is section 57 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography. Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 57 Old Friends and New Plans. It had been more than thirteen years since his first arrival in New York. Then he had been a youth, green, untraveled, eager to get away from home. Now, a veteran, he was as eager to return. He stopped only long enough in New York to see Charles Henry Webb, late of California, who had put together a number of the Mark Twain sketches, including The Jumping Frog, for book publication. Clemens himself decided to take the book to Carleton, thinking that, having missed the fame of the frog once, he might welcome a chance to stand sponsor for it now. But Carleton was wary. The frog had one favor, and even fame, in its fugitive, vagrant way, but a book was another matter. Books were undertaken very seriously and with plenty of consideration in those days. Twenty-one years later, in Switzerland, Carleton said to Mark Twain, "'My chief claim to immortality is the uh, distinction of having declined your first book.' Clemens was ready enough to give up the book when Carleton declined it, but Webb said he would publish it himself, and he set about it forthwith. The author waited no longer now, but started for St. Louis, and was soon with his mother and sister, whom he had not seen since that eventful first year of the war. They thought he looked old, which was true enough, but they found him unchanged in his manner, buoyant, full of banter and gravely quaint remarks. He was always the same. Jane Clemens had grown older, too. She was nearly sixty-four, but as keen and vigorous as ever, proud, even if somewhat critical, of this handsome, brilliant man of new name and fame who had been her mischievous, wayward boy. She petted him, joked with him, scolded him, and inquired searchingly into his morals and habits. In turn he petted, comforted, and teased her. She decided that he was the same Sam, and always would be a true prophecy. He went up to Hannibal to see old friends. Many were married, some had moved away, some were dead. The old story. He delivered his lecture there, and was the center of interest and admiration. His welcome might have satisfied even Tom Sawyer. From Hannibal he journeyed to Keokuk, where he lectured again to a crowd of old friends and new, then returned to St. Louis for a more extended visit. 
It was while he was in St. Louis that he first saw the announcement of the Quaker City Holy Land excursion, and was promptly fascinated by what was then a brand new idea in ocean travel, a splendid picnic, a choice and refined party that would sail away for a long summer's journeying to the most romantic of all lands and seas, the shores of the Mediterranean. No such argosy had ever set out before in pursuit of the golden fleece of happiness. His projected trip around the world lost its charm in the light of this idyllic dream. Henry Ward Beecher was advertised as one of the party, General Sherman as another, also ministers, high-class journalists, the best minds of the nation. Anson Burlingame had told him to associate with persons of refinement and intellect. He lost no time in writing to the Alta, proposing that they send him in this select company. Noah Brooks, who was then on the Alta, states, in an article published in the Century magazine, that the management was staggered by the proposition, but that Colonel John McComb insisted that the investment in Mark Twain would be sound. A letter was accordingly sent, stating that a check for his passage would be forwarded in due season, and that meantime he could contribute letters from New York City. The rate for all letters was to be twenty dollars each. The arrangement was a godsend, in the fullest sense of the word, to Mark Twain. It was now April, and he was eager to get back to New York to arrange his passage. The Quaker City would not sail for two months yet, two eventful months, but the advertisement said that passages must be secured by the fifth, and he was there on that day. Almost the first man he met was the chief of the New York Alta Bureau with a check for $1,250 the amount of his ticket, and a telegram saying, Ship Mark Twain in the Holy Land excursion and pay his passage. The following letter, which bears no date, was probably handed to him later in the New York Alta office as a sort of credential. Alta, California, office, 42 John Street, New York. Samuel Clemens, Esquire, New York. Dear Sir, I have the honor to inform you that Frederick McCrellish and Company, proprietors of Alta California, San Francisco, California, desire to engage your services as special correspondent on the pleasure excursion now about to proceed from this city to the Holy Land. In obedience to their instructions, I have secured a passage for you on the vessel about to convey the excursion party referred to and made such arrangements as I hope will secure your comfort and convenience. Your only instructions are that you will continue to write at such times and from such places as you deem proper, and in the same style that heretofore secured you the favor of the readers of the Alta California. I have the honor to remain with high respect and esteem your obedient servant, John J. Murphy. The Alta, it appears, had already applied for his berth, but, not having been vouched for by Mr. Beecher or some other eminent divine, Clemens was fearful he might not be accepted. Quite casually he was enlightened on this point. While waiting for attention in the shipping office with the Alta agent, he heard a newspaper man inquire what notables were going. A clerk, with evident pride, rattled off the names. Lieutenant General Sherman henry ward beecher and mark twain also probably general banks so he was billed as an attraction it was his first surreptitious taste of fame on the atlantic coast and not without its delight the story often told of his being introduced by ned house of the tribune as a minister though often repeated by mark himself was in the nature of a joke and mainly apocryphal Clemens was a good deal in House's company at the time, for he had made an arrangement to contribute occasional letters to the Tribune, and House no doubt introduced him jokingly as one of the Quaker City ministers. End of chapter 57 Old Friends and New Plans Read by John Greenman This is section 58 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography Volume One, Part Two, eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five. Chapter fifty eight. A new book and a lecture. 
Webb, meantime, had pushed the frog book along. The proofs had been read, and the volume was about ready for issue. Clemens wrote to his mother April 15th, my book will probably be in the bookseller's hands in about two weeks. After that I shall lecture. Since I have been gone, the boys have gotten up a call on me and signed by two hundred Californians. The lecture plan was the idea of Frank Fuller, who, as acting governor of Utah, had known Mark Twain on the Comstock, and prophesied favorably of his future career. Clemens had hunted up Fuller on landing in New York in January, and Fuller had encouraged the lecture then. But Clemens was doubtful. "'I have no reputation with the general public here,' he said. We couldn't get a baker's dozen to hear me. But Fuller was a sanguine person, with an energy and enthusiasm that were infectious. He insisted that the idea was sound. It would solidify Mark Twain's reputation on the Atlantic coast, he declared, insisting that the largest house in New York, Cooper Union, should be taken. Clemens had partially consented, and Fuller had arranged with all the Pacific Slope people who had come east headed by ex-governor james w nye by this time senator at washington to sign a call for the inimitable mark twain to appear before a new york audience fuller made nye agree to be there and introduce the lecturer and he was burningly busy and happy in the prospect but mark twain was not happy he looked at that spacious hall and imagined the little crowd of faithful californian stragglers that might gather in to hear him, and the ridicule of the papers next day. He begged Fuller to take a smaller hall, the smallest he could get, but only the biggest hall in New York would satisfy Fuller. He would have taken a larger one if he could have found it. The lecture was announced for May 6th. Its subject was Kanakadom, or the Sandwich Islands. Tickets, fifty cents. Fuller timed it to follow a few days after Webb's book should appear, so that one event might help the other. Mark Twain's first book, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, and other sketches, was scheduled for May 1st, and did in fact appear on that date. But to the author it was no longer an important event. Jim Smiley's frog, a standard-bearer of his literary procession, was not an interesting object, so far as he was concerned, not with that vast, empty hall in the background and the insane undertaking of trying to fill it. The San Francisco venture had been as nothing compared with this. Fuller was working night and day with abounding joy, while the subject of his labor felt as if he were on the brink of a fearful precipice, preparing to try a pair of wings without first learning to fly. At one instant he was cold with fright, the next glowing with an infection of Fuller's faith. He devised a hundred schemes for the sale of seats. Once he came rushing to Fuller, saying, "'Send a lot of tickets down to the Chickering Piano Company. I have promised to put on my program. The piano used at this entertainment is manufactured by Chickering.' "'But you don't want a piano, Mark,' said Fuller. "'Do you?' "'No, of course not.' but they will distribute the tickets for the sake of the advertisement, whether we have the piano or not. Fuller got out a lot of handbills and hung bunches of them in the stages, omnibuses, and horse cars. Clemens at first haunted these vehicles to see if anybody noticed the bills. The little dangling bunches seemed untouched. Finally two men came in. One of them pulled off a bill and glanced at it. His friend asked, "'Who's Mark Twain?' "'God knows I don't.' The lecturer could not ride any more. He was desperate. "'Fuller,' he groaned, "'there isn't a sign, a ripple of interest.' Fuller assured him that everything was working all right, working underneath, Fuller said. But the lecturer was hopeless." He reported his impressions to the folks at home. "'Everything looks shady,' 
at least if not dark i have a good agent but now after we have hired the cooper institute and gone to an expense in one way or another of five hundred dollars it comes out that i have got to play against speaker colfax at irving hall restory and also the double troop of japanese jugglers the latter opening at the great academy of music and with all this against me i have taken the largest house in new york and cannot back water he might have added that there were other rival entertainments the flying scud was at wallach's the black crook was at niblo's john brougham at the olympic and there were at least a dozen lesser attractions new york was not the inexhaustible city in those days these things could gather in the public to the last man when the day drew near and only a few tickets had been sold clemens was desperate for he said there'll be nobody in the cooper union that night but you and me i am on the verge of suicide i would commit suicide if i had the pluck and the outfit you must paper the house fuller you must send out a flood of complimentaries very well said fuller what we want this time is reputation anyway money is secondary i'll put you before the choicest most intelligent audience that ever was gathered in new york city i will bring in the school instructors the finest body of men and women in the world fuller immediately sent out a deluge of complimentary tickets inviting the school teachers of new york and brooklyn and all the adjacent country to come free and hear mark twain's great lecture on kanakadum this was within forty-eight hours of the time he was to appear senator nye was to have joined clemens and fuller at the westminster where clemens was stopping and they waited for him there with a carriage fuming and swearing until it was evident that he was not coming at last clemens said fuller you've got to introduce me no suggested fuller i've got a better scheme than that you get up and begin by bemeaning nye for not being there that will be better anyway clemens said well fuller i can do that i feel that way i'll try to think up something fresh and happy to say about that horse thief they drove to cooper union with trepidation suppose after all the school teachers had declined to come they went half an hour before the lecture was to begin forty years later mark twain said i couldn't keep away i wanted to see that vast mammoth cave and die but when we got near the building i saw that all the streets were blocked with people and that traffic had stopped i couldn't believe that these people were trying to get into cooper institute but they were and when i got to the stage at last the house was jammed full packed there wasn't room enough left for a child i was happy and i was excited beyond expression i poured the sandwich islands out on those people and they laughed and shouted to my entire content for an hour and fifteen minutes i was in paradise and fuller today alive and young when so many others of that ancient time and event have vanished has added when mark appeared the californians gave a regular yell of welcome when that was over he walked to the edge of the platform looked carefully down in the pit round the edges as if he were hunting for something then he said there was to have been a piano here and a senator to introduce me i don't seem to discover them anywhere 
the piano was a good one but we will have to get along with such music as i can make with your help as for the senator then mark let himself go and did as he promised about senator nye he said things that made men from the pacific coast who had known nye scream with delight after that came his lecture the first sentence captured the audience from that moment to the end it was either in a roar of laughter or half breathless by his beautiful descriptive passages people were positively ill for days laughing at that lecture so it was a success everybody was glad to have been there the papers were kind congratulations numerous kind but not extravagant those were burning political times and the doings of mere literary people did not excite the press to the extent of headlines a jam around cooper union today followed by such an artistic triumph would be a news event on the other hand schuyler colfax then speaker of the house was reported to the extent of a column non pare his lecture was of no literary importance and no echo of it now remains but those were political not artistic days of mark twain's lecture the times notice said nearly every one present came prepared for considerable provocation for enjoyable laughter and from the appearance of their mirthful faces leaving the hall at the conclusion of the lecture but few were disappointed and it is not too much to say that seldom has so large an audience been so uniformly pleased as the one that listened to mark twain's quaint remarks last evening the large hall of the union was filled to its utmost capacity by fully two thousand persons which fact spoke well for the reputation of the lecturer and his future success mark twain's style is a quaint one both in manner and method and through his discourse he managed to keep on the right side of the audience and frequently convulsed it with hearty laughter during a description of the topography of the sandwich islands the lecturer surprised his hearers by a graphic and eloquent description of the eruption of the great volcano which occurred in eighteen forty and his language was loudly applauded judging from the success achieved by the lecturer last evening he should repeat his experiment at an early date cooper institute by invitation of a large number of prominent californians and citizens of new york mark twain will deliver a serio humorous lecture concerning connectome or the sandwich islands cooper institute on monday evening may sixth eighteen sixty seven tickets fifty cents for sale at chickering and sons eight fifty two broadway and at the principal hotel doors open at seven o'clock the wisdom will begin to flow at eight mark twain always felt grateful to the school teachers for that night many years later when they wanted him to read to them in steinway hall he gladly gave his services without charge nor was the lecture a complete financial failure in spite of the flood of complimentaries there was a cash return of some three hundred dollars from the sale of tickets a substantial aid in defraying the expenses which fuller assumed and insisted on making good on his own account that was fuller's regal way his return lay in the joy of the game and in the winning of the larger stake for a friend mark he said it is all right the fortune didn't come but it will the fame has arrived with this lecture and your book just out you are going to be the most talked of man in the country your letters for the alta and the tribune will get the widest reception of any letters of travel ever written End of chapter 58, A New Book and a Lecture, read by John Greenman. This is section 59 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 59, The First Book. With the shadow of the Cooper Institute so happily dispelled, the celebrated jumping frog of calaveras county and his following of other sketches became a matter of more interest the book was a neat blue-and-gold volume printed by john a gray and green 
the old firm for which the boy, Sam Clemens, had set type thirteen years before. The title page bore Webb's name as publisher, with the American News Company as selling agents. It further stated that the book was edited by John Paul, that is to say, by Webb himself. The dedication was in keeping with the general irresponsible character of the venture. It was as follows. To John Smith, whom I have known in divers and sundry places about the world, and whose many and manifold virtues did always command my esteem, I dedicate this book. It is said that the man to whom a volume is dedicated always buys a copy. If this prove true, in the present instance, a princely affluence is about to burst upon the author. The advertisement stated that the author had scaled the heights of popularity at a single jump, and won for himself the sobriquet of the wild humorist of the Pacific Slope. Furthermore, that he was known to fame as the moralist of the main, and that as such he would be likely to go down to posterity, adding that it was in his secondary character as humorist, rather than in his primal one of moralist, that the volume aimed to present him. The advertisement complete, with extracts from the book, may be found under Appendix E at the end of last volume. Every little while, during the forty years or more that have elapsed since then, someone has come forward announcing Mark Twain to be as much a philosopher as a humorist, as if this were a new discovery. But it was a discovery chiefly to the person making the announcement. Everyone who ever knew Mark Twain at any period of his life made the same discovery. Everyone who ever took the trouble to familiarize himself with his work made it. Those who did not make it have known his work only by hearsay and quotation, or they have read it very casually, or have been very dull. It would be much more of a discovery to find a book in which he has not been serious, a philosopher, a moralist, and a poet. Even in the Jumping Frog sketches, selected particularly for their inconsequence, the undervein of reflection and purpose is not lacking. The answer to moral statistician, in Answers to Correspondence, included now in Sketches New and Old, an extract from it, and from A Strange Dream, will be found in Appendix E, is fairly alive with human wisdom and righteous wrath. The Strange Dream, though ending in a joke, is aglow with poetry. Webb's advertisement was playfully written, but it was earnestly intended, and he writes Mark Twain down a moralist. Not as a discovery, but as a matter of course. The discoveries came along later, when the author's name as a humorist had dazzled the nations. It is as well to say it here as anywhere, perhaps, that one reason why Mark Twain found it difficult to be accepted seriously was the fact that his personality was in itself so essentially humorous. His physiognomy, his manner of speech, his movement, his mental attitude toward events, all these were distinctly diverting. When we add to this that his medium of expression was nearly always full of the quaint phrasing and those surprising appositions which we recognize as amusing, it is not so astonishing that his deeper, wiser, more serious purpose should be overlooked. On the whole these unabated discoverers serve a purpose, if only to make the rest of their species look somewhat deeper than the comic phrase. The little blue and gold volume which presented the frog story and twenty-six other sketches in covers is chiefly important today as being Mark Twain's first book. The selections in it were made for a public that had been too busy with a great war to learn discrimination, and most of them have properly found oblivion. Fewer than a dozen of them were included in his collected sketches issued eight years later, and some even of those might have been spared also some that were added for that matter but detailed literary criticism is not the province of this work the reader may investigate and judge for himself clemens was pleased with the appearance of his book to bret hart he wrote the book is out and it is handsome it is full of damnable errors of grammar and 
deadly inconsistencies of spelling in the frog sketch because i was away and did not read proofs but be a friend and say nothing about these things when my hurry is over i will send you a copy to pison the children with that he had no exaggerated opinion of the book's contents or prospects we may gather from his letter home as for the frog book i don't believe it will ever pay anything worth a cent i published it simply to advertise myself and not with the hope of making anything out of it he had grown more lenient in his opinion of the merits of the frog story itself since it had made friends in high places especially since james russell lowell had pronounced it the finest piece of humorous writing yet produced in america but compared with his lecture triumph and his prospective journey to foreign seas his book venture at best claimed no more than a casual regard a sandwich island book he had collected his union letters with the idea of a volume he gave up altogether after one unsuccessful offer of it to dick and fitzgerald frank fuller's statement that the fame had arrived had in it some measure of truth lecture propositions came from various directions thomas nast then in the early day of his great popularity proposed a joint tour in which clemens would lecture while he nast illustrated the remarks with lightning caricatures but the time was too short the quaker city would sail on the eighth of june and in the meantime the alta correspondent was far behind with his new york letters on may twenty ninth he wrote i am eighteen alta letters behind and i must catch up or bust i have refused all invitations to lecture don't know how my book is coming on he worked like a slave for a week or so almost night and day to clean up matters before his departure then came days of idleness and reaction days of waiting during which his natural restlessness and the old-time regret for things done and undone beset him my passage is paid and if the ship sails i sail on her but i make no calculations have bought no cigars no sea-going clothing have made no preparations whatever shall not pack my trunk till the morning we sail all i do know or feel is that i am wild with impatience to move 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 curse the endless delays they always kill me they make me neglect every duty and then i have a conscience that tears me like a wild beast i wish i never had to stop anywhere a month i do more mean things the moment i get a chance to fold my hands and sit down than ever i get forgiveness for yes we are to meet at mr beach's next thursday night and i suppose we shall have to be gotten up regardless of expense in swallowtails white kids and everything en regle i am resigned to reverend mr hutchinson's or anybody else's supervision i don't mind it i am fixed i have got a splendid immoral tobacco-smoking wine-drinking godless roommate who is as good and true and right-minded a man as ever lived a man whose blameless conduct and example will always be an eloquent sermon to all who shall come within their influence but send on the professional preachers there are none i like better to converse with if they're not narrow-minded and bigoted they make good companions the splendid immoral roommate was dan sloat dan of the innocents a lovable character all is set down 
Samuel Clemens wrote one more letter to his mother and sister, a conscience-stricken, pessimistic letter of good-bye, written the night before sailing. Referring to the Alta letters, he says, I think they are the stupidest letters ever written from New York. Corresponding has been a perfect drag ever since I got to the States. If it continues abroad, I don't know what the Tribune and Alta folk will think. He remembers Orion, who had been officially eliminated when Nevada had received statehood. I often wonder if his law business is going satisfactorily. I wish I had gone to Washington in the winter instead of going west. I could have gouged an office out of Bill Stewart for him, and that would have atoned for the loss of my home visit. But I am so worthless that it seems to me I never do anything or accomplish anything that lingers in my mind as a pleasant memory. My mind is stored full of unworthy conduct toward Orion and toward you all, and an accusing conscience gives me peace only in excitement and restless moving from place to place. If I could only say I had done one thing for any of you that entitled me to your good opinions, I say nothing of your love, for I am sure of that, no matter how unworthy of it I may make myself. From Orion down you have always given me that, all the days of my life, when God Almighty knows I have seldom deserved it. I believe I could go home and stay there, and I know I would care little for the world's praise or blame. There is no satisfaction in the world's praise anyhow, and it has no worth to me save in the way of business. I tried to gather up its compliments to send you, but the work was distasteful, and I dropped it. You observe that under a cheerful exterior I have got a spirit that is angry with me and gives me freely its contempt. I can get away from that at sea, and be tranquil and satisfied. And so, with my parting love and benediction for Orion and all of you, I say good-bye and God bless you all, and welcome the wind that wafts a weary soul to the sunny lands of the Mediterranean. Yours forever, Sam. End of chapter 59, the first book, read by John Greenman. This is section 60 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 60, The Innocence at Sea. Holy Land, Pleasure Excursion, Steamer, Quaker City. Captain C. C. Duncan, left New York at 2 p.m., June 8, 1867. Rough weather, anchored within the harbor to lay all night. That first note recorded an event momentous in Mark Twain's career, an event of supreme importance, if we concede that any link in a chain regardless of size is of more importance than any other link. Undoubtedly it remains the most conspicuous event, as the world views it now, in retrospect, the note further heads a new chapter of history in sea voyaging. No such thing as the sailing of an ocean steamship with a pleasure party on a long transatlantic cruise had ever occurred before. A similar project had been undertaken the previous year, but owing to a cholera scare in the East it had been abandoned. Now the dream had become a fact. A stupendous fact, when we consider it. Such an important beginning as that now would in all likelihood furnish the chief news story of the day. But they had different ideas of news in those days. 
there were no headlines announcing the departure of the quaker city only the barest mention of the ship's sailing though a prominent position was given to an account of a senatorial excursion party which set out that same morning over the union pacific railway then under construction every name in that political party was set down and not one of them except general hancock will ever be heard of again the new york times however had some one on its editorial staff who thought it worth while to comment a little on the history-making quaker city excursion the writer was pleasantly complimentary to officers and passengers he referred to moses s beach of the sun who was taking with him type and press whereby he would skillfully utilize the brains of the company for their mutual edification mr beecher and general sherman would find talent enough aboard to make the hours go pleasantly evidently the writer had not interested himself sufficiently to know that these gentlemen were not along and the paragraph closed by prophesying other such excursions and wishing the travelers good speed a happy voyage and a safe return that was handsome especially for those days only now some fine day when an airship shall start with a band of happy argonauts to land beyond the sunrise for the first time in history we shall feature it and emblazon it with pictures in the sunday papers and weeklies and in the magazines the quaker city idea was so unheard of that in some of the foreign ports visited the officials could not believe that the vessel was simply a pleasure craft and were suspicious of some dark ulterior purpose that henry ward beecher and general sherman had concluded not to go was a heavy disappointment at first but it proved only a temporary disaster the inevitable amalgamation of all ship companies took place the sixty-seven travelers fell into congenial groups or they mingled and devised amusements and gossiped and became a big family as happy and as free from contention as families of that size are likely to be the quaker city was a good enough ship and sizable for her time she was registered eighteen hundred tons about one-tenth the size of mediterranean excursion steamers to-day and when conditions were favorable she could make ten knots an hour under steam or at least she could do it with the help of her auxiliary sails altogether she was a cozy satisfactory ship and they were a fortunate company who had her all to themselves and went out on her on that long ago ocean gypsying she has grown since then even to the proportions of the mayflower it was necessary for her to grow to hold all of those who in later times claimed to have sailed in her on that voyage with mark twain the quaker city passenger list will be found under appendix f at the end of last volume they were not all ministers and deacons aboard the quaker city clemens found other congenial spirits besides his roommate dan sloat among them the ship's surgeon dr a reeve jackson the guide destroying doctor of the innocents jack van nostrand of new jersey jack julius moulton of st louis moult and other carefree fellows the smoking-room crowd which is likely to make comradeship its chief watchword there were companionable people in the cabin crowd also fine intelligent men and women especially one of the latter a middle-aged intellectual motherly soul mrs a w fairbanks of cleveland ohio mrs fairbanks herself a newspaper correspondent for her husband's paper the cleveland herald had a large influence on the character and general tone of those quaker city letters which established mark twain's larger fame she was an able writer herself her judgment was thoughtful refined unbiased altogether of a superior sort she understood samuel clemens counseled him encouraged him to read his letters aloud to her became in reality mother fairbanks as they termed her to him and to others of that ship who needed her kindly offices in one of his home letters later he said of her she was the most refined intelligent cultivated lady in the ship and altogether the kindest and best she sewed my buttons on kept my clothing 
in presentable trim, fed me on Egyptian jam when I behaved, lectured me awfully on the quarter deck on moonlit promenading evenings, and cured me of several bad habits. I am under lasting obligations to her. She looks young because she is so good, but she has a grown son and daughter at home. In one of the early letters which Mrs. Fairbanks wrote to her paper, she is scarcely less complimentary to him, even if in a different way. We have DDs and MDs, we have men of wisdom and men of wit. There is one table from which is sure to come a peal of laughter, and all eyes are turned toward Mark Twain, whose face is perfectly mirth-provoking. Sitting lazily at the table, scarcely genteel in his appearance, there is something, I know not what, that interests and attracts. I saw today at dinner venerable divines and sage-looking men convulsed with laughter at his drolleries and quaint odd manners it requires only a few days on shipboard for acquaintances to form and presently a little afternoon group was gathering to hear mark twain read his letters mrs fairbanks was there of course also mr and mrs s l severance likewise of cleveland and moses s beach of the sun with his daughter emma a girl of seventeen. Dan Sloat was likely to be there, too, and Jack, and the doctor, and Charles J. Langdon, of Elmira, New York, a boy of eighteen, who had conceived a deep admiration for the brilliant writer. They were fortunate ones who first gathered to hear those daring, wonderful letters. But the benefit was a mutual one. He furnished a priceless entertainment, and he derived something equally priceless in return, the test of immediate audience and the boon of criticism. Mrs. Fairbanks especially was frankly sincere. Mr. Severance wrote afterward, One afternoon I saw him tearing up a bunch of the soft white paper, uh, copy paper, I guess the newspapers call it, on which he had written something, and throwing the fragments into the Mediterranean. I inquired of him, why he cast away the fruits of his labors in that manner. Well, he drawled, Mrs. Fairbanks thinks it oughtn't to be printed, and, like as not, she is right. And Emma Beach, Mrs. Abbott Thayer, remembers hearing him say, Well, Mrs. Fairbanks has just destroyed another four hours' work for me. Sometimes he played chess with Emma Beach, who thought him a great hero, because once when a crowd of men were tormenting a young lad, a passenger, Mark Twain took the boy's part and made them desist. I am sure I was right, too, she declares. Heroism came natural to him. Mr. Severance recalls another incident which, as he says, was trivial enough, but not easy to forget. We were having a little celebration over the birthday anniversary of uh, Mrs. Duncan, wife of our captain. Mark Twain got up and made a little speech, in which he said Mrs. Duncan was really older than Methuselah, because she knew a lot of things that Methuselah never heard of. Then he mentioned a number of more or less modern inventions, and wound up by saying, What? Did Methuselah know about a barbed wire fence? Except following the equator, The Innocents Abroad comes nearer to being history than any other of Mark Twain's travel books. The notes for it were made on the spot, and there was plenty of fact, plenty of fresh new experience, plenty of incident to set down. His idea of descriptive travel in those days was to tell the story as it happened. Also, perhaps, he had not then acquired the courage of his inventions. We may believe that the adventures with Jack, Dan, and the Doctor are elaborated here and there, but even those happened substantially as recorded. There is little to add, then, to the story of that halcyon trip, and not much to elucidate. The old notebooks give a light here and there that is interesting. 
It is curious to be looking through them now, trying to realize that these penciled memoranda were the fresh first impressions that would presently grow into the world's most delightful book of travel, that they were set down in the very midst of that carefree little company that frolicked through Italy, climbed wearily the arid Syrian hills. They are all dead now, but to us they are as alive and young today as when they followed the footprints of the Son of Man through Palestine, and stood at last before the Sphinx, impressed and awed by its five thousand slow revolving years some of the items consist of no more than a few terse suggestive words serious humorous sometimes profane others are statistical descriptive elaborated also there are drawings not copied he marks them with a pride not always justified by the result the earlier notes are mainly comments on the pilgrims, the freak pilgrims, the Frenchy-looking woman who owns a dog and keeps up an interminable biography of him uh, to the passengers, the long-legged, simple, wide-mouthed, horse-laughing young fellow who once made a sea voyage to fortress monroe and quotes eternally from his experiences also there is reference to another young man good accommodating pleasant but fearfully green this young person would become the interrogation point in due time and have his picture on page seventy one old edition while opposite him on page seventy would appear the oracle identified as one dr andrews who the notebook says had the habit of smelling in guide-books for knowledge and then trying to play it for old information that has been festering in his brain sometimes there are abstract notes such as how lucky adam was he knew when he said a good thing that no one had ever said it before of the character notes the most important and elaborated is that which presents the poet lariat this is the entry somewhat epitomized bloodgood h cutter he is fifty years old and small of his age he dresses in homespun and is a simple-minded honest old-fashioned farmer with a strange proclivity for writing rhymes he writes them on all possible subjects and gets them printed on slips of paper with his portrait at the head these he will give to any man who comes along whether he has anything against him or not dan said it must be a great happiness to you to sit down at the close of day and put its events all down in rhymes and poetry like byron and shakespeare and those fellows oh yes it is it is why many's the time i've had to get up in the night when it comes on me whether we're on the sea or the land we've all got to go at the word of command hey how is that a curious character was cutter a long island farmer with the obsession of rhyme in his old age in an interview he said mark was generally writing and he was glum he would write what we were doing and i would write poetry and mark would say for heaven's sake cutter keep your poems to yourself yes mark was pretty glum and he was generally writing poor old poet lariat dead now with so many others of that happy crew we may believe that mark learned to be glum when he saw the lariat approaching with his sheaf of rhymes we may believe too that he was generally writing he contributed fifty-three letters to the Alta during that five months, and six to the Tribune. They would average about two columns non pareil each, 
which is to say four thousand words or something like two hundred and fifty thousand words in all to turn out an average of fifteen hundred words a day with continuous sight-seeing besides one must be generally writing during any odd intervals those who are wont to regard mark twain as lazy may consider these statistics that he detested manual labor is true enough but at the work for which he was fitted and intended it may be set down here upon authority and despite his own frequent assertions to the contrary that to his last year he was the most industrious of men End of chapter sixty the innocents at sea read by john greenman this is section sixty one of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter sixty one the innocents abroad it was dan jack and the doctor who with mark twain wandered down through italy and left moral footprints that remain to this day the italian guides are wary about showing pieces of the true cross fragments of the crown of thorns and the bones of saints since then they show them it is true but with a smile the name of mark twain is a touchstone to test their statements not a guide in italy but has heard the tale of that iconoclastic crew and of the book which turned their marvels into myths their relics into bywords it was dr jackson colonel denny dr birch and samuel clemens who evaded the quarantine and made the perilous night trip to athens and looked upon the parthenon and the sleeping city by moonlight it is all set down in the notes and the account varies little from that given in the book only he does not tell us that captain duncan and the quartermaster pratt connived at the escapade or how the latter watched the shore in anxious suspense until he heard the whistle which was their signal to be taken aboard it would have meant six months imprisonment if they had been captured for there was no discretion in the greek law it was t d crocker a n sanford colonel peter kinney and william gibson who were delegated to draft the address to the emperor of russia at yalta with samuel l clemens as chairman of that committee the chairman wrote the address the opening sentence of which he grew so weary of hearing we are a handful of private citizens of america traveling simply for recreation and unostentatiously as becomes our unofficial state the address is all set down in the notes and there also exists the first rough draft with the emendations in his own hand he deplores the time it required that job is over writing addresses to emperors is not my strong suit however if it is not as good as it might be it doesn't signify the other committee men ought to have helped me write it they had nothing to do and i had my hands full but for bothering with this i would have caught up entirely with my new york tribune correspondence and nearly up with the san francisco they wanted him also to read the address to the emperor but he pointed out that the american consul was the proper person for that office he tells how the address was presented august twenty sixth the imperial carriages were in waiting at eleven and at twelve we were at the palace the consul for edessa read the address and the czar said frequently good very good indeed and at the close i am very very grateful it was not improper for him to set down all this and much more in his own notebook not then for publication it was in fact a very proper record for today one incident of the imperial audience mark twain omitted from his book perhaps because the humor of it 
had not yet become sufficiently evident the humorous perception of a thing is a pretty slow growth sometimes he once remarked it was about seventeen years before he could laugh enjoyably at a slight mistake he made at the emperor's reception he set down a memorandum of it then for fear it might be lost there were a number of great dignitaries of the empire there and although as a general thing they were dressed in citizens clothing i observed that the most of them wore a very small piece of ribbon in the lapels of their coats that little touch of color struck my fancy and it seemed to me a good idea to add it to my own attractions not imagining that it had any special significance so i stepped aside hunted up a bit of red ribbon and ornamented my lapel with it presently count festetics the grand master of ceremonies and the only man there who was gorgeously arrayed in full official costume began to show me a great many attentions he was particularly polite and pleasant and anxious to be of service to me presently he asked me what order of nobility i belonged to i said i didn't belong to any then he asked me what order of knighthood i belonged to i said none then he asked me what the red ribbon in my buttonhole stood for i saw at once what an ass i had been making of myself and was accordingly confused and embarrassed i said the first thing that came into my mind and that was that the ribbon was merely the symbol of a club of journalists to which i belonged and i was not pursued with any more of count festetic's attentions later i got on very familiar terms with an old gentleman whom i took to be the head gardener and walked him all about the gardens slipping my arm into his without invitation yet without demur on his part and by and by was confused again when i found that he was not a gardener at all but the lord high admiral of russia i almost made up my mind that i would never call on an emperor again like all mediterranean excursionists those first pilgrims were insatiable collectors of curios costumes and all manner of outlandish things dan sloat had the stateroom hung and piled with such gleanings at constantinople his roommate writes i thought dan had got the stateroom pretty full of rubbish at last but a while ago his dragoman arrived with a brand new ghastly tombstone of the oriental pattern with his name handsomely carved and gilted on it in turkish characters that fellow will buy a circassian slave next it was church denny jack davis dan moult and mark twain who made the long trip through syria from beirut to jerusalem with their elaborate camping outfit and decrepit nags jericho balbec and the rest it was better camping than that humboldt journey of six years before 
though the horses were not so dissimilar, and altogether it was a hard, nerve-wracking experience, climbing the arid hills of Palestine in that torrid summer heat. Nobody makes that trip in summertime now. Tourists hurry out of Syria before the first of April, and they do not go back before November. One brief quotation from Mark Twain's book gives us an idea of what that early party of pilgrims had to undergo. We left Damascus at noon, and rode across the plain a couple of hours, and then the party stopped a while in the shade of some fig trees to give me a chance to rest. It was the hottest day we had seen yet. The sun flames shot down like the shafts of fire that stream out before a blow-pipe. The rays seemed to fall in a deluge on the head and pass downward like rain from a roof. I imagined I could distinguish between the floods of rays. I thought I could tell when each flood struck my head, when it reached my shoulders, and when the next one came. It was terrible. He had been ill with cholera at Damascus, a light attack, but any attack of that dread disease is serious enough. He tells of this in the book, but he does not mention, either in the book or in his notes, the attack which Dan Sloat had some days later. It remained for William F. Church of the party to relate that incident, for it was the kind of thing that Mark Twain was not likely to record or even to remember. Dr. Church was a deacon with orthodox views and did not approve of Mark Twain. He thought him sinful, irreverent, profane. "'He was the worst man I ever knew,' Church said. Then he added, "'And the best.' What happened was this. At the end of a terrible day of heat, when the party had camped on the edge of a squalid Syrian village, Dan was taken suddenly ill. It was cholera, beyond doubt. Dan could not go on. He might never go on. The chances were that way. It was a serious matter all around. To wait with Dan meant to upset their travel schedule. It might mean to miss the ship. Consultation was held and a resolution passed. The pilgrims were always passing resolutions. To provide for Dan as well as possible and leave him behind. Clemens, who had remained with Dan, suddenly appeared and said, "'Gentlemen, I understand that you are going to leave Dan Sloat here alone. I'll be damned if I do. And he didn't. He stayed there and brought Dan into Jerusalem a few days late, but convalescent. Perhaps most of them were not always reverent during that Holy Land trip. It was a trying journey, and after fierce days of desert hills the reaction might not always spare even the holiest memories. Jack was particularly sinful. When they learned the price for a boat on Galilee, and the deacons who had traveled nearly half round the world to sail on that sacred water were confounded by the charge, Jack said, "'Well, Denny, do you wonder now that Christ walked?' It was the irreverent Jack who one morning, they had camped the night before by the ruins of Jericho, refused to get up to see the sun rise across the Jordan. Deacon Church went to his tent. "'Jack, my boy, get up. Here is the place where the Israelites crossed over into the Promised Land, and beyond are the mountains of Moab, where Moses lies buried.' "'Moses who?' said Jack. "'Oh, Jack, my boy, Moses, the great lawgiver, who led the Israelites out of Egypt.' forty years through the wilderness, to the promised land. Forty years,' said Jack. "'How far was it?' "'But it was three hundred miles, Jack, a great wilderness, and he brought them through in safety.' Jack regarded him with scorn. "'Ha! Huh, Moses, three hundred miles, forty years! Why, Ben Holliday would have brought them through in thirty-six hours!' Ben Holliday, owner of the Overland Stages, and a man of great executive ability. 
This incident, a true one, is more elaborately told in Roughing It, but it seems pertinent here. Jack probably learned more about the Bible during that trip, its history and its heroes, than during all his former years. Nor was Jack the only one of that group thus benefited. The sacred landmarks of Palestine inspire a burning interest in the scriptures, and Mark Twain probably did not now regret those early Sunday school lessons. Certainly he did not fail to review them exhaustively on that journey. His notebooks fairly overflow with Bible references. The Syrian chapters in The Innocents Abroad are permeated with the poetry and legendary beauty of the Bible story. The little Bible he carried on that trip, bought in Constantinople, was well worn by the time they reached the ship again at Jaffa. He must have read it with a large and persistent interest, also with a double benefit, for besides the knowledge acquired he was harvesting a profit, probably unsuspected at the time, viz. the influence of the most direct and beautiful English, the English of the King James Version, which could not fail to affect his own literary method at that impressionable age. We have already noted his earlier admiration for that noble and simple poem, The Burial of Moses, which in the Palestine Notebook is copied in full. All the tendency of his expression lay that way, and the intense consideration of stately Bible phrase and imagery could hardly fail to influence his mental processes. The very distinct difference of style, as shown in The Innocents Abroad, and in his earlier writings, we may believe was in no small measure due to his study of the King James Version during those weeks in Palestine. He bought another Bible at Jerusalem, but it was not for himself. It was a little souvenir volume bound in olive and balsam wood, and on the fly-leaf is inscribed, Mrs. Jane Clemens from her son, Jerusalem, September 24, 1867. There is one more circumstance of that long cruise, recorded neither in the book nor the notes, an incident brief, but of more importance in the life of Samuel Clemens than any heretofore set down. It occurred in the beautiful Bay of Smyrna, on the 5th or 6th of September, while the vessel lay there for the Ephesus trip. Reference has been made to young Charles Langdon of Elmira, the Charlie once mentioned in The Innocents, as an admirer of Mark Twain. There was a good deal of difference in their ages, and they were seldom of the same party, but sometimes the boy invited the journalist to his cabin, and, boy-like, exhibited his treasures. He had two sisters at home, and of Olivia, the youngest, he had brought a dainty miniature done on ivory in delicate tints, a sweet pictured countenance fine and spiritual. On that fateful day in the day of Smyrna, Samuel Clemens, visiting in young Langdon's cabin, was shown this portrait. He looked at it with long admiration, and spoke of it reverently for the delicate face seemed to him to be something more than a mere human likeness. Each time he came, after that, he asked to see the picture, and once even begged to be allowed to take it away with him. The boy would not agree to this, and the elder man looked long and steadily at the miniature, resolving in his mind that some day he would meet the owner of that lovely face, a purpose for once in accord with that which the fates had arranged for him in the day when all things were arranged the day of the first beginning end of chapter sixty one the innocents abroad read by john greenman this is section sixty two of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter sixty two the return of the pilgrims the last notebook entry bears date of october eleventh at sea somewhere in the neighborhood of malta very stormy terrible death to be talked to death the storm has blown two small land birds and a hawk to sea, and they came on board. 
sea full of flying fish that is all there is no record of the week's travel in spain which a little group of four made under the picturesque gibraltar guide menunas still living and quite as picturesque at last accounts this side trip is covered in a single brief paragraph in the innocents and the only account we have of it is in a home letter from cadiz of october twenty fourth we left gibraltar at noon and rode to algeciras four hours thus dodging the quarantine took dinner and then rode horseback all night in a swinging trot and at daylight took a caleche a wheeled vehicle and rode five hours then took cars and traveled till twelve at night that landed us at seville and we were over the hard part of our trip and somewhat tired since then we have taken things comparatively easy drifting around from one town to another and attracting a good deal of attention for i guess strangers do not wander through andalusia and the other southern provinces of spain often the country is precisely what it was when don quixote and sancho panza were possible characters but i see now what the glory of spain must have been when it was under moorish domination no i will not say that but then when one is carried away infatuated entranced with the wonders of the alhambra and the supernatural beauty of the alcazar he is apt to overflow with admiration for the splendid intellects that created them we may wish that he had left us a chapter of that idyllic journey but it will never be written now a night or two before the vessel reached new york there was the usual good-bye assembly and for this occasion at mrs severance's request mark twain wrote some verses they were not especially notable for meter and rhyme did not come easy to him but one prophetic stanza is worth remembering in the opening lines the passengers are referred to as a fleet of vessels then follows lo other ships of that parted fleet shall suffer this fate or that one shall be wrecked another shall sink or ground on treacherous flat some shall be famed in many lands as good ships fast and fair and some shall strangely disappear men know not when or where the quaker city returned to america on november nineteenth eighteen sixty seven and mark twain found himself if not famous at least in very wide repute the fifty-three letters to the alta and the half dozen to the new york tribune had carried his celebrity into every corner of the states and territories vivid fearless full of fresh color humor poetry they came as a revelation to a public weary of the driveling tiresome travel letters of that period they preached a new gospel in travel literature the gospel of seeing with an overflowing honesty a gospel of sincerity in according praises to whatever seemed genuine and ridicule to the things considered sham it was the gospel that mark twain would continue to preach during his whole career it became his chief literary message to the world a world waiting for that message moreover the letters were literature he had received from whatever source a large and very positive literary impulse a loftier conception and expression it was at tangier that he first struck the grander chord the throbbing cadence of human story here is a crumbling wall that was old when columbus discovered america old when peter the hermit roused 
the knightly men of the Middle Ages to arm for the First Crusade, old when Charlemagne and his paladins beleaguered enchanted castles and battled with giants and genii in the fabled days of the olden time old when christ and his disciples walked the earth stood where it stands today when the lips of memnon were vocal and men bought and sold in the streets of ancient thebes this is pure poetry he had never touched so high a strain before but he reached it often after that and always with an ever-increasing mastery and confidence in venice in rome in athens through the holy land his retrospection becomes a stately epic symphony a processional crescendo that swings ever higher until it reaches that sublime strain the ageless contemplation of the sphinx we cannot forego a paragraph or two of that word picture after years of waiting it was before me at last the great face was so sad so earnest so longing so patient there was a dignity not of earth in its mien and in its countenance a benignity such as never anything human wore it was stone but it seemed sentient if ever image of stone thought it was thinking it was looking toward the verge of the landscape yet looking at nothing nothing but distance and vacancy it was looking over and beyond everything of the present and far into the past it was thinking of the wars of the departed ages of the empires it had seen created and destroyed of the nations whose birth it had witnessed whose progress it had watched whose annihilation it had noted of the joy and sorrow the life and death the grandeur and decay of five thousand slow revolving years the sphinx is grand in its loneliness it is imposing in its magnitude it is impressive in the mystery that hangs over its story and there is that in the overshadowing majesty of this eternal figure of stone with its accusing memory of the deeds of all ages which reveals to one something of what we shall feel when we shall stand at last in the awful presence of god then that closing word of egypt he elaborated it for the book and did not improve it let us preserve here its original form we are glad to have seen egypt we are glad to have seen that old land which taught greece her letters and through greece rome and through rome the world that venerable cradle of culture and refinement which could have humanized and civilized the children of israel but allowed them to depart out of her borders savages those children whom we still revere still love and whose sad shortcomings we still excuse not because they were savages but because they were the 
chosen savages of God. The Holy Land letters alone would have brought him fame. They presented the most graphic and sympathetic picture of Syrian travel ever written, one that will never become antiquated or obsolete, so long as human nature remains unchanged. From beginning to end, the tale is rarely reverently told. Its closing paragraph has not been surpassed in the voluminous literature of that solemn land. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Where Sodom and Gomorrah reared their domes and towers, that solemn sea now floods the plain, in whose bitter waters no living thing exists, over whose waveless surface the blistering air hangs motionless and dead, about whose borders nothing grows but weeds and scattering tufts of cane, and that treacherous fruit that promises refreshment to parching lips, but turns to ashes at the touch. Nazareth is forlorn. About that ford of Jordan, where the hosts of Israel entered the promised land with songs of rejoicing, one finds only a squalid camp of fantastic Bedouins of the desert. Jericho, the accursed, lies a moldering ruin today, even as Joshua's miracle left it more than three thousand years ago. Bethlehem and Bethany, in their poverty and their humiliation, have nothing about them now to remind one that they once knew the high honor of the Savior's presence. The hallowed spot where the shepherds watched their flocks by night, and where the angels sang peace on earth, good will to men, is untenanted by any living creature, and unblessed by any feature that is pleasant to the eye. Renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur, and is become a pauper village. The riches of Solomon are no longer there to compel the admiration of visiting Oriental queens. The wonderful temple which was the pride and the glory of Israel is gone, and the Ottoman crescent is lifted above the spot where, on that most memorable day in the annals of the world, they reared the Holy Cross. The noted Sea of Galilee, where Roman fleets once rode at anchor, and the disciples of the Savior sailed in their ships, was long ago deserted by the devotees of war and commerce, and its borders are a silent wilderness. Capernaum is a shapeless ruin. Magdala is the home of beggared Arabs. Bethsaida and Chorazin have vanished from the earth, and the desert places round about them where thousands of men once listened to the Savior's voice and ate the miraculous bread, sleep in the hush of a, a solitude that is inhabited only by birds of prey and skulking foxes. Palestine is desolate and unlovely, and why should it be otherwise? Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? 
it would be easy to quote pages here a pictorial sequence from gibraltar to athens from athens to egypt a radiant panoramic march in time he would write technically better he would avoid solecism he would become a greater master of vocabulary and phrase but in all the years ahead he would never match the lambent bloom and spontaneity of those fresh first impressions of mediterranean lands and seas no need to mention the humor the burlesque the fearless unrestrained ridicule of old masters and of sacred relics so called these we have kept familiar with much repetition only the humor had grown more subtle more restrained the burlesque had become impersonal and harmless the ridicule so frank and good-natured that even the old masters themselves might have enjoyed it while the most devoted churchman unless blinded by bigotry would find in it satisfaction rather than sacrilege the final letter was written for the new york herald after the arrival and was altogether unlike those that preceded it daily satirical and personal inclusively so it might better have been left unwritten for it would seem to have given needless offense to a number of goodly people whose chief sin was the sedateness of years however it is all past now and those who were old then and perhaps queer and pious and stingy do not mind any more and those who were young and frivolous have all grown old too and most of them have set out on the still farther voyage somewhere it may be they gather now and then and lightly tenderly recall their old time journeying end of chapter sixty two the return of the pilgrims read by john greenman this is section sixty three of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter sixty three in washington a publishing proposition clemens remained but one day in new york senator stewart had written about the time of the departure of the quaker city offering him the position of private secretary a position which was to give him leisure for literary work with a supporting salary as well stewart no doubt thought it would be considerably to his advantage to have the brilliant writer and lecturer attached to his political establishment and clemens likewise saw possibilities in the arrangement from naples in august he had written accepting stewart's offer he lost no time now in discussing the matter in person in a letter home august ninth he referred to the arrangement i wrote to bill stewart today accepting his private secretaryship in washington next winter there seems to have been little difficulty in concluding the arrangement when clemens had been in washington a week we find him writing dear folks tired and sleepy been in congress all day and making newspaper acquaintances stewart is to look up a clerkship in the patent office for orion things necessarily move slowly where there is so much business and such armies of office seekers to be attended to i guess it will be all right i intend it shall be all right i have eighteen invitations to lecture at one hundred dollars each in various parts of the union have declined them all i am for business now belong on the tribune staff and shall write occasionally am offered the same berth today on the herald by letter shall write mr bennett and accept as soon as i hear from tribune that it will not interfere am pretty well known now intend to be better known am hobnobbing with these old generals and senators and 
other humbugs for no good purpose don't have any more trouble making friends than i did in california all serene good-bye shall continue on the alta yours affectionately sam p s i room with bill stewart and board at willard's hotel but the secretary arrangement was a brief matter it is impossible to conceive of mark twain as anybody's secretary especially as the secretary of senator stewart in senator stewart's memoirs he refers unpleasantly to mark twain and after relating several incidents that bear only strained relations to the truth states that when the writer returned from the holy land he stewart offered him a secretaryship as a sort of charity he adds that mark twain's behavior on his premises was such that a threat of a thrashing was necessary the reason for such statements becomes apparent however when he adds that in roughing it the author accuses him of cheating prints a picture of him with a hatch over his eye and claims to have given him a sound thrashing none of which statements save only the one concerning the picture an apparently unforgivable offense to his dignity is true as the reader may easily ascertain for himself within a few weeks he was writing humorous accounts of my late senatorial secretaryship facts concerning the recent resignation etc all good-natured burlesque but inspired we may believe by the change these articles appeared in the new york tribune the new york citizen and the galaxy magazine there appears to have been no ill feeling at this time between clemens and stuart if so it is not discoverable in any of the former's personal or newspaper correspondence in fact in his article relating to his late senatorial secretaryship he puts the joke so far as it is a joke on senator james w nye probably as an additional punishment for nye's failure to appear on the night of his lecture he established headquarters with a brilliant newspaper correspondent named riley one of the best men in washington or elsewhere he tells us in a brief sketch of that person c riley newspaper correspondent sketches new and old he had known riley in san francisco the two were congenial and settled down to their several undertakings clemens was chiefly concerned over two things he wished to make money and he wished to secure a government appointment for orion he had used up the most of his lecture accumulations and was moderately in debt his work was in demand at good rates for those days and with working opportunity he could presently dispose of his financial problem the tribune was anxious for letters the enterprise and alta were waiting for them the herald the chicago tribune the magazines all had solicited contributions the lecture bureaus pursued him personally his outlook was bright the appointment for orion was a different matter the powers were not especially interested in a brother there were too many brothers and assorted relatives on the official waiting list already clemens was offered appointments for himself a consulship a postmastership even that of san francisco from the cabinet down the washington political contingent had read his travel letters and was ready to recognize officially the author of them in his own person and personality also socially mark twain found himself all at once in the midst of receptions dinners and speech-making all very exciting for a time at least but not profitable not conducive to work at a dinner of the washington correspondence club his response to the toast women was pronounced by schuyler colfax to be the best after-dinner speech ever made certainly it was a refreshing departure from the prosy or clumsy witted efforts common to that period he was coming altogether into his own this is the first of mark twain's after-dinner speeches to be preserved the reader will find it complete as reported next day in appendix g at the end of last volume he was not immediately interested in the matter of book publication 
the jumping frog book was popular and in england had been issued by routledge but the royalty returns were modest enough and slow in arrival his desire was for prompter results his interest in book publication had never been an eager one and related mainly to the advertising it would furnish which he did not now need or to the money return in which he had no great faith yet at this very moment a letter for him was lying in the tribune office in new york which would bring the book idea into first prominence and spell the beginning of his fortune among those who had read and found delight in the tribune letters was elisha bliss jr of the american publishing company of hartford bliss was a shrewd and energetic man with a keen appreciation for humor and the american fondness for that literary quality he had recently undertaken the management of a hartford concern and had somewhat alarmed its conservative directorate by publishing books that furnished entertainment to the reader as well as moral instruction only his success in paying dividends justified this heresy and averted his downfall two days after the arrival of the quaker city bliss wrote the letter above mentioned it ran as follows office of the american publishing company hartford connecticut november twenty first eighteen sixty seven samuel l clemens esq tribune office new york dear sir we take the liberty to address you this in place of a letter which we had recently written and were about to forward to you not knowing your arrival home was expected so soon we are desirous of obtaining from you a work of some kind perhaps compiled from your letters from the past etc with such interesting additions as may be proper we are the publishers of a d richardson's works and flatter ourselves that we can give an author a favorable term and do as full justice to his productions as any other house in the country we are perhaps the oldest subscription house in the country and have never failed to give a book an immense circulation we sold about one hundred thousand copies of richardson's f d and e field dungeon and escape and are now printing forty one thousand of beyond the mississippi and large orders ahead if you have any thought of writing a book or could be induced to do so we should be pleased to see you and will do so will you do us the favor of reply at once at your earliest convenience very truly etc e bliss jr secretary after ten days delay this letter was forwarded to the tribune bureau in washington where clemens received it he replied promptly washington december second eighteen sixty seven e bliss jr esq secretary american publishing company dear sir i only received your favor of november twenty first last night at the rooms of the tribune bureau here it was forwarded from the tribune office new york where it had lain eight or ten days this will be a sufficient apology for the seeming discourtesy of my silence i wrote fifty-two letters for the san francisco alta california during the quaker city excursion about half of which number have been printed thus far the alta has few exchanges in the east and i suppose scarcely any of these letters have been copied on this side of the rocky mountains i could weed them of their chief faults of construction and inelegancies of expression and make a volume that would be more acceptable in many respects than any i could now write when those letters were written my impressions were fresh but now they have lost that freshness they were warm then they are cold now i could strike out certain letters and write new ones wherewith to supply their places if you think such a book would suit your purpose please drop me a line specifying 
the size and general style of the volume when the matter ought to be ready whether it should have pictures in it or not and particularly what your terms with me would be and what amount of money i might possibly make out of it the latter clause has a degree of importance for me which is almost beyond my own comprehension but you understand that of course i have other propositions for a book but have doubted the propriety of interfering with good newspaper engagements except my way as an author could be demonstrated to be plain before me but i know richardson and learned from him some months ago something of an idea of the subscription plan of publishing if that is your plan invariably it looks safe i am on the new york tribune staff here as an occasional among other things and a note from you addressed to very truly etc sam l clemens new york tribune bureau washington will find me without fail the exchange of those two letters marked the beginning of one of the most notable publishing connections in american literary history consummation however was somewhat delayed bliss was ill when the reply came and could not write again in detail until nearly a month later in this letter he recited the profits made by richardson and others through subscription publication and named the royalties paid richardson had received four per cent of the sale price a small enough rate for these later days but the cost of manufacture was larger then and the sale and delivery of books through agents has ever been an expensive process even horace greeley had received but a fraction more on his great american conflict bliss especially suggested and emphasized a humorous work that is to say a work humorously inclined he added that they had two arrangements for paying authors outright purchase and royalty he invited a meeting in new york to arrange terms end of chapter sixty three in washington a publishing proposition read by john greenman this is section sixty four of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter sixty four olivia langdon Clemens did in fact go to New York that same evening to spend Christmas with Dan Sloat, and missed Bliss's second letter. It was no matter. Fate had his affairs properly in hand, and had prepared an event of still larger moment than the publication even of Innocents Abroad. There was a pleasant reunion at Dan Sloat's. He wrote home about it. Charlie Langdon, Jack Van Nostrum, Dan and I, all Quaker City Nighthawks, had a blowout at Dan's house and a lively talk over old times. I just laughed till my sides ached at some of our reminiscences. It was the unholiest gang that ever cavorted through Palestine, but those are the best boys in the world this however was not the event it was only preliminary to it we are coming to that now at the old st nicholas hotel which stood on the west of broadway between spring and broom streets there were stopping at this time jervis langdon a wealthy coal dealer and mine owner of elmira his son charles and his daughter olivia whose pictured face Samuel Clemens had first seen in the Bay of Smyrna one September day. Young Langdon had been especially anxious to bring his distinguished Quaker City friend and his own people together, and two days before Christmas Samuel Clemens was invited to dine at the hotel. He went very willingly. The lovely face of that miniature had been often a part of his waking dreams. 
for the first time now he looked upon its reality. Long afterward he said, It is forty years ago. From that day to this she has never been out of my mind. Charles Dickens was in New York then, and gave a reading that night in Steinway Hall. The Langdons went, and Samuel Clemens accompanied them. He remembered afterward that Dickens wore a black velvet coat with a fiery red flower in his buttonhole, and that he read the storm scene from Copperfield, the death of James Steerforth. But he remembered still more clearly the face and dress of that slender girlish figure at his side. Olivia Langdon was twenty-two years old at this time, delicate as the miniature he had seen, fragile to look upon, though no longer with the shattered health of her girlhood. At sixteen, through a fall upon the ice, she had become a complete invalid, confined to her bed for two years, unable to sit, even when supported, unable to lie in any position except upon her back. Great physicians and surgeons, one after another, had done their best for her, but she had failed steadily until every hope had died. Then, when nothing else was left to try, a certain Dr. Newton, of spectacular celebrity, who cured by laying on of hands, was brought to Almira to see her. Dr. Newton came into the darkened room and said, "'Open the windows. We must have light.' They protested that she could not bear the light, but the windows were opened. Dr. Newton came to the bedside of the helpless girl, delivered a short, fervent prayer, put his arm under her shoulders, and bade her sit up. She had not moved for two years, and the family were alarmed, but she obeyed, and he assisted her into a chair. Sensation came back to her limbs. With his assistance she even made a feeble attempt to walk. He left then, saying that she would gradually improve, and in time be well, though probably never very strong. On the same day he healed a boy, crippled and drawn with fever. It turned out as he had said. Olivia Langdon improved steadily, and now at twenty-two, though not robust, she was never that, she was comparatively well. Gentle, winning, lovable, she was the family idol and Samuel Clemens joined in their worship from the moment of that first meeting. Olivia Langdon, on her part, was at first dazed and fascinated, rather than attracted, by this astonishing creature, so unlike any one she had ever known. Her life had been circumscribed, her experiences of a simple sort. She had never seen anything resembling him before. Indeed, nobody had somewhat carelessly, even if correctly, attired, eagerly, rather than observantly, attentive, brilliant and startling, rather than cultured, of speech, a blazing human solitaire, unfashioned, unset, tossed by the drift of fortune at her feet. He disturbed rather than gratified her. She sensed his heresy toward the conventions and forms which had been her gospel, his bantering, indifferent attitude toward life, to her always so serious and sacred. She suspected that he even might have unorthodox views on matters of religion. When he had gone, she somehow had the feeling that a great fiery meteor of unknown portent had swept across her sky. To her brother, who was eager for her approval of his celebrity, Miss Langdon conceded admiration. As for her father, he did not qualify his opinion. With hearty sense of humor and a keen perception of verity and capability in men, Jervis Langdon accepted Samuel Clemens from the start and remained his staunch admirer and friend. Clemens left that night with an invitation to visit Elmira by and by, and with the full intention of going soon. Fate, however, had another plan. He did not see Elmira for the better part of a year. He saw Miss Langdon again within the week. On New Year's Day he set forth to pay calls, after the fashion of the time, more lavish then than now. Miss Langdon was receiving with Miss Alice Hooker, a niece of Henry Ward Beecher, at the home of Mrs. Berry. He decided to go there first. 
with young langdon he arrived at eleven o'clock in the morning and they did not leave until midnight if his first impression upon olivia langdon had been meteoric it would seem that he must now have become to her as a streaming comet that swept from zenith to horizon one thing is certain she had become to him the single unvarying beacon of his future years he visited henry ward beecher on that trip and dined with him by invitation harriet beecher stowe was present and others of that eminent family likewise his old quaker city comrades moses s and emma beach it was a brilliant gathering a conclave of intellectual gods a triumph to be there for one who had been a printer boy on the banks of the mississippi and only a little while before a miner with pick and shovel it was gratifying to be so honored it would be pleasant to write home but the occasion lacked something too everything in fact for when he ran his eye around the board the face of the miniature was not there still there were compensations inadequate of course but pleasant enough to remember it was sunday evening and the party adjourned to plymouth church after services mr beecher invited him to return home with him for a quiet talk evidently they had a good time for in the letter telling of these things samuel clemens said henry ward beecher is a brick end of chapter sixty four olivia langdon read by john greenman this is section sixty five of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter sixty five a contract with elisha bliss jr he returned to washington without seeing miss langdon again though he would seem to have had permission to write friendly letters a little later it was on the evening of january ninth he lectured in washington on very brief notice indeed the arrangement for his appearance had been made by a friend during his absence a friend clemens declared afterward not entirely sober at the time to his mother he wrote i scared up a doorkeeper and was ready at the proper time and by pure good luck a tolerably good house assembled and i was saved i hardly knew what i was going to talk about but it went off in splendid style the title of the lecture delivered was the frozen truth more truth in the title than in the lecture according to his own statement what it dealt with is not remembered now it had to do with the quaker city trip perhaps and it seems to have brought a financial return which was welcome enough subsequently he delivered it elsewhere though just how far the tour extended cannot be learned from the letters and he had but little memory of it in later years there was some further correspondence with bliss then about the twenty first of january eighteen sixty eight clemens made a trip to hartford to settle the matter bliss had been particularly anxious to meet him personally and was a trifle disappointed with his appearance mark twain's traveling costume was neither new nor neat and he was smoking steadily a pipe of power his general make-up was hardly impressive bliss's disturbance was momentary once he began to talk the rest did not matter he was the author of those letters and bliss decided that personally he was even greater than they the publisher confined to his home with illness offered him the hospitality of his household also he made him two propositions he would pay him ten thousand dollars cash for his copyright or he would pay five per cent royalty which was a fourth more than richardson had received he advised the latter arrangement clemens had already taken advice and had discussed the project a good deal with richardson the ten thousand dollars was a heavy temptation but he withstood it and closed on the royalty basis the best business judgment i ever displayed he was wont to declare a letter written to his mother and sister near the end of this hartford stay is worth quoting pretty fully here 
for the information and character it contains. It bears date of January 24th. This is a good week for me. I stopped in the Herald office as I came through New York to see the boys on the staff, and young James Gordon Bennett asked me to write twice a week impersonally for the Herald, and said if I would I might have full swing and about anybody and everything I wanted to. I said I must have the very fullest possible swing, and he said, all right. I said, it's a contract, and that settled that matter. I'll make it a point to write one letter a week anyhow, but the best thing that has happened is here. This great American publishing company kept on trying to bargain with me for a book till I thought I would cut the matter short by coming up for a talk. I met Henry Ward Beecher in Brooklyn, and with his usual whole-souled way of dropping his own work to give other people a lift when he gets a chance, he said, Now, here, you are one of the talented men of the age. Nobody is going to deny that. But in matters of business, I don't suppose you know more than enough to come in when it rains. I'll tell you what to do and how to do it. And he did. And I listened well, and then came up here and made a splendid contract for a Quaker City book of five or six hundred large pages with illustrations, the manuscript to be placed in the publisher's hands by the middle of July. The contract was not a formal one. There was an exchange of letters agreeing to the terms, but no joint document was drawn until October 16, 1868. My percentage is to be a fourth more than that they have ever paid any author except Greeley. Beecher will be surprised, I guess, when he hears this. These publishers get off the most tremendous editions of their books you can imagine. I shall write to the Enterprise and Alta every week, as usual, I guess, and to the Herald twice a week, occasionally to the Tribune and the magazines. I have a stupid article in The Galaxy just issued, but I am not going to write to this and that and the other paper any more. I have had a tip-top time here for a few days, guest of Mr. John Hooker's family, Beecher's relatives, in a general way of Mr. Bliss also, who is head of the publishing firm. Puritans are mighty straight-laced, and they won't let me smoke in the parlor, but the Almighty don't make any better people. I have to make a speech at the annual Herald Dinner on the 6th of May. So the book, which would establish his claim to a peerage in the literary land, was arranged for, and it remained only to prepare the manuscript, a task which he regarded as not difficult. He had only to collate the Alta and Tribune letters, edit them, and write such new matter as would be required for completeness. Returning to Washington, he plunged into work with his usual terrific energy, preparing the copy. In the meantime, writing newspaper correspondence and sketches that would bring immediate return. In addition to his regular contributions, he entered into a syndicate arrangement with John Swinton, brother of William Swinton, the historian, to supply letters to a list of newspapers. I have written seven long newspaper letters and a short magazine article in less than two days, he wrote home, 
and by the end of January he had also prepared several chapters of his book. The San Francisco postmastership was suggested to him again, but he put the temptation behind him. He refers to this more than once in his home letters, and it is clear that he wavered. Judge Field said if I wanted the place he could pledge me the President's appointment, and Senator Corners said he would guarantee me the Senate's confirmation. It was a great temptation, but it would render it impossible to fill my book contract, and I had to drop the idea, and besides, I did not want the office. He made this final decision when he heard that the chief editor of the Alta wanted the place, and he now threw his influence in that quarter. I would not take ten thousand dollars out of a friend's pocket, he said. But then suddenly came the news from Goodman that the Alta publishers had copyrighted his Quaker City letters and proposed getting them out in a book to reimburse themselves still further on their investment. This was sharper than a serpent's tooth. Clemens got confirmation of the report by telegraph. By the same medium he protested, but to no purpose. Then he wrote a letter and sat down to wait. He reported his troubles to Orion. I have made a superb contract for a book, and have prepared the first ten chapters of the sixty or eighty, but I will bet it never sees the light. Don't you let the folks at home hear that. That thieving Alta copyrighted the letters, and now shows no disposition to let me use them. I have done all I can by telegraph, and now await the final result by mail. I only charge them for fifty letters, what even in greenbacks would amount to less than two thousand dollars, intending to write a good deal for high-priced eastern papers, and now they want to publish my letters in book form themselves to get back that pitiful sum. Orion was by this time back from Nevada, setting type in St. Louis. He was full of schemes, as usual, and his brother counsels him freely. Then he says, we chase phantoms half the days of our lives. It is well if we learn wisdom even then and save the other half. I am in for it. I must go on chasing them until I marry. Then I am done with literature and all other bosh, that is, literature wherewith to please the general public. I shall write to please myself, then. He closes by saying that he rather expects to go with Anson Burlingame on the Chinese embassy. Clearly he was pretty hopeless as to his book prospects. His first meeting with General Grant occurred just at this time. In one of his home letters he mentions, rather airily, that he will drop in some day on the general for an interview and at last, through Mrs. Grant, an appointment was made for a Sunday evening when the general would be at home. He was elated with the prospect of an interview, but when he looked into the imperturbable, square, smileless face of the soldier, he found himself, for the first time in his life, without anything particular to say. Grant nodded slightly and waited. His caller wished something would happen. It did his inspiration returned. General, he said, I seem to be a little embarrassed, are you? That broke the ice. There were no further difficulties. Mark Twain has variously related this incident. It is given here in accordance with the letters of the period. End of chapter 65. A contract with Elisha Bliss, Jr., Read by John Greenman. This is section sixty six of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography. Volume one, part two, eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five. Chapter sixty six. 
Back to San Francisco. Reply came from the Alta, but it was not promising. It spoke rather vaguely of prior arrangements and future possibilities. Clemens gathered that under certain conditions he might share in the profits of the venture. There was but one thing to do. He knew those people, some of them, Colonel McComb and Mr. McCrellish intimately. He must confer with them in person. He was weary of Washington, anyway. The whole pitiful machinery of politics disgusted him. In his notebook he wrote, Whiskey is taken into the committee rooms, in demijohns, and carried out in demagogues. And in a letter, This is a place to get a poor opinion of everybody in. There are some pitiful intellects in this Congress. There isn't one man in Washington in civil office who has the brains of Anson Burlingame, and I suppose if China had not seized and saved his great talents to the world, this government would have discarded him when his time was up. Anson Burlingame had by this time become China's special ambassador to the nations. Furthermore, he was down on the climate of Washington. He decided to go to San Francisco and see those Alta thieves face to face. Then, if a book resulted, he could prepare it there among friends. Also, he could lecture. He had been anxious to visit his people before sailing, but matters were too urgent to permit delay. He obtained from Bliss an advance of royalty and took passage, by way of Aspinwall, on the side-wheel steamer Henry Chauncey, a fine vessel for those days. The name of Mark Twain was already known on the Isthmus, and when it was learned he had arrived on the Chauncey, a delegation welcomed him on the wharf, and provided him with refreshments and entertainment. Mr. Tracy Robinson, a poet, long a resident of that southern land, was one of the group. Beyond the Isthmus, Clemens fell in again with his old captain, Ned Wakeman, who during the trip told him the amazing dream that in due time would become Captain Stormfield's visit to heaven. He made the first draft of this story soon after his arrival in San Francisco, as a sort of travesty of Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Gates ajar, then very popular. Clemens then and later had a high opinion of Captain Ned Wakeman's dream, but his story of it would pass through several stages before finally reaching the light of publication. Mr. John P. Vollmer, now of Lewiston, Idaho, a companion of that voyage, writes of a card game which took place beyond the isthmus. The notorious crippled gambler Smithy figured in it, and it would seem to have furnished the inspiration for the exciting story in Chapter 36 of the Mississippi book. In San Francisco matters turned out as he had hoped. Colonel McComb was his staunch friend. McCrellish and Woodward, the proprietors, presently conceded that they had already received good value for the money paid. The author agreed to make proper acknowledgments to the Alta in his preface, and the matter was settled with friendliness all around. The way was now clear, the book assured. First, however, he must provide himself with funds, he delivered a lecture with the Quaker City excursion as his subject. On the 5th of May he wrote to Bliss, I lectured here on the trip the other night, over one thousand six hundred in gold in the house, every seat taken and paid for before night. He reports that he is steadily at work and expects to start east with the completed manuscript about the middle of June but this was a miscalculation. Clemens found that the letters needed more preparation than he had thought. His literary vision and equipment had vastly altered since the beginning of that correspondence. Some of the chapters he rewrote, others he eliminated entirely. It required two months of fairly steady work to put the big manuscript together. Some of the new chapters he gave to Bret Hart for the Overland Monthly, then recently established. Hart himself was becoming a celebrity about this time. His Luck of Roaring Camp and The Outcasts of Poker Flat, published in early numbers of the Overland, 
were making a great stir in the east arousing there a good deal more enthusiasm than in the magazine office or the city of their publication that these two friends each supreme in his own field should have entered into their heritage so nearly at the same moment is one of the many seemingly curious coincidences of literary history clemens now concluded to cover his lecture circuit of two years before he was assured that it would be throwing away a precious opportunity not to give his new lecture to his old friends the result justified that opinion at virginia at carson and elsewhere he was received like a returned conqueror he might have been accorded a roman triumph had there been time and paraphernalia even the robbers had reformed and entire safety was guaranteed him on the divide between virginia and gold hill at carson he called on mrs curry as in old days and among other things told her how snow from the lebanon mountains is brought to damascus on the backs of camels sam she said that's just one of your yarns and if you tell it in your lecture to-night i'll get right up and say so but he did tell it for it was a fact and though mrs curry did not rise to deny it she shook her finger at him in a way he knew he returned to san francisco and gave one more lecture the last he would ever give in california his preparatory advertising for that occasion was wholly unique characteristic of him to the last degree it assumed the form of a handbill of protest supposed to have been issued by the foremost citizens of san francisco urging him to return to the states without inflicting himself further upon them as signatures he made free with the names of prominent individuals followed by those of organizations institutions various benevolent societies citizens on foot and horseback and fifteen hundred in the steerage following this on the same bill was his reply to the fifteen hundred and others in which he insisted on another hearing i will torment the people if i want to it only costs the people one dollar apiece and if they can't stand it what do they stay here for my last lecture was not as fine as i thought it was but i have submitted this discourse to several able critics and they have pronounced it good now therefore why should i withhold it he promised positively to sail on the sixth of july if they would let him talk just this once continuing the handbill presented a second protest signed by the various clubs and business firms also others bearing variously the signatures of the newspapers and the clergy ending with the brief word you had better go yours chief of police all of which drollery concluded with his announcement of a place and date of his lecture with still further gaiety at the end nothing short of a seismic cataclysm an earthquake in fact could deter a san francisco audience after that mark twain's farewell address given at the mercantile library july second eighteen sixty eight doubtless remains to-day the leading literary event in san francisco's history copy of the lecture announcement complete will be found in appendix h at the end of last volume he sailed july sixth by the pacific mail steamer montana to acapulco caught the henry chauncey at aspinwall reached new york on the twenty eighth and a day or two later had delivered his manuscript at hartford but a further difficulty had arisen bliss was having troubles himself this time with his directors many reports of mark twain's new book had been traveling the rounds of the press some of which declared it was to be irreverent even blasphemous in tone the title selected the new pilgrim's progress was in itself a sacrilege hartford was a conservative place the american publishing company directors were of orthodox persuasion they urged bliss to relieve the company of this impending disaster of heresy when the author arrived one or more of them labored with him in person without avail as for bliss he was staunch he believed in the book thoroughly from every standpoint he declared if the company refused to print it 
he would resign the management and publish the book himself. This was an alarming suggestion to the stockholders. Bliss had returned dividends, a boon altogether too rare in the company's former history. The objectors retired and were heard of no more. The manuscript was placed in the hands of Fay and Cox, illustrators, with an order for about two hundred and fifty pictures. Fay and Cox turned it over to True Williams, one of the well-known illustrators of that day. Williams was a man of great talent, of fine imagination and sweetness of spirit, but it was necessary to lock him in a room when industry was required, with nothing more exciting than cold water as a beverage. Clemens himself aided in the illustrating by obtaining of Moses S. Beach photographs from the large collection he had brought home. End of chapter 66 Back to San Francisco Read by John Greenman This is section 67 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875 chapter sixty seven a visit to elmira meantime he had skillfully obtained a renewal of the invitation to spend a week in the langdon home he meant to go by a fast train but with his natural gift for misunderstanding timetables of course took a slow one telegraphing his approach from different stations along the road young langdon concluded to go down the line as far as waverley to meet him when the New York train reached there, the young man found his guest in the smoking car, travel-stained and distressingly clad. Mark Twain was always scrupulously neat and correct of dress in later years, but in that earlier day neatness and style had not become habitual and did not give him comfort. Langdon greeted him warmly, but with doubt. Finally he summoned courage to say hesitatingly, "'You've—' uh, uh, got uh, some other clothes, haven't you? The arriving guest was not in the least disturbed. Oh, yes, he said with enthusiasm. I've got a fine brand new outfit in this bag, all but a hat. It will be late when we get in, and I won't see anyone tonight. You won't know me in the morning. We'll go out early and get a hat. This was a large relief to the younger man, and the rest of the journey was happy enough. True to promise, the guest appeared at daylight correctly, even elegantly clad, and an early trip to the shops secured the hat. A gay and happy week followed, a week during which Samuel Clemens realized more fully than ever that in his heart there was room for only one woman in all the world, Olivia Langdon, Livy as they all called her and as the day of departure drew near, it may be that the gentle girl had made some discoveries, too. No word had passed between them. Samuel Clemens had the old-fashioned southern respect for courtship conventions, and for what, in that day at least, was regarded as honor. On the morning of the final day he said to young Langdon, "'Charlie, my week is up, and I must go home.' The young man expressed a regret which was genuine enough, though not wholly unqualified. His older sister, Mrs. Crane, leaving just then for a trip to the White Mountains, had said, "'Charlie, I am sure Mr. Clemens is after our Livy. You mustn't let him carry her off before our return.' The idea was a disturbing one. The young man did not urge his guest to prolong his visit. He said, "'We'll have to stand it, I guess.' but you mustn't leave before tonight. I ought to go by the first train, Clemens said gloomily. I am in love. In what? In love with your sister, and I ought to get away from here. The young man was now very genuinely alarmed. To him Mark Twain was a highly gifted, fearless, robust man, a man's man, and as such altogether admirable, lovable. But Olivia, Livy, she was to him little short of a saint. No man was good enough for her, certainly not this adventurous soldier of letters from the West. Delightful he was beyond doubt, adorable as a companion, but not a companion for Livy. 
look here clemens he said when he could get his voice there's a train in half an hour i'll help you catch it don't wait till tonight go now clemens shook his head no charlie he said in his gentle drawl i want to enjoy your hospitality a little longer i promise to be circumspect and i'll go tonight that night after dinner when it was time to take the new york train a light two-seated wagon was at the gate the coachman was in front and young langdon and his guest took the back seat for some reason the seat had not been locked in its place and when after the good-byes the coachman touched the horse it made a quick spring forward and the back seat with both passengers described a half-circle and came down with force on the cobbled street neither passenger was seriously hurt clemens not at all only dazed a little for a moment then came an inspiration here was a chance to prolong his visit evidently it was not intended that he should take that train when the langdon household gathered around with restoratives he did not recover too quickly he allowed them to support or carry him into the house and place him in an armchair and apply remedies the young daughter of the house especially showed anxiety and attention this was pure happiness he was perjuring himself of course but they say jove laughs at such things he recovered in a day or two but the wide hospitality of the handsome langdon home was not only offered now it was enforced he was still there two weeks later after which he made a trip to cleveland to confide in mrs fairbanks how he intended to win livy langdon for his wife end of chapter sixty seven a visit to elmira read by john greenman this is section sixty eight of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter sixty eight the reverend joe twichell he returned to hartford to look after the progress of his book some of it was being put into type and with his mechanical knowledge of such things he was naturally interested in the process he made his headquarters with the blisses then living at eight twenty one asylum avenue and read proof in a little upper room where the lamp was likely to be burning most of the time where the atmosphere was nearly always blue with smoke and the window-sill full of cigar-butts mrs bliss took him into the quiet social life of the neighborhood to small church receptions society gatherings and the like all of which he seemed to enjoy most of the dwellers in that neighborhood were members of the asylum hill congregational church then recently completed all but the spire it was a cultured circle well off in the world's goods its male members for the most part concerned in various commercial ventures the church stood almost across the way from the bliss home and mark twain with his picturesque phrasing referred to it as the stub-tailed church on account of its abbreviated spire also later with a knowledge of its prosperous membership as the church of the holy speculators he was at an evening reception in the home of one of its members when he noticed a photograph of the unfinished building framed and hanging on the wall why yes he commented in his slow fashion this is the church of the holy speculators Shh, cautioned mrs bliss its pastor is just behind you he knows your work and wants to meet you turning she said mr twichell this is mr clemens most people know him as mark twain and so in this casual fashion he met the man who was presently to become his closest personal friend and counselor and would remain so for more than forty years joseph hopkins twichell was a man about his own age athletic and handsome a student and a devout christian yet a man familiar with the world fond of sports with an exuberant sense of humor and a wide understanding of the frailties of humankind he had been port waste ore at yale 
and had left college to serve with general dan sickles as a chaplain who had followed his duties not only in the camp but on the field mention has already been made of mark twain's natural leaning toward ministers of the gospel and the explanation of it is easier to realize than to convey he was hopelessly unorthodox rankly rebellious as to creeds anything resembling cant or the curtailment of mental liberty roused only his resentment and irony yet something in his heart always warmed toward any laborer in the vineyard and if we could put the explanation into a single sentence perhaps we might say it was because he could meet them on that wide common ground sympathy with mankind mark twain's creed then and always may be put into three words liberty justice humanity it may be put into one word humanity ministers always loved mark twain they did not always approve of him but they adored him the rev mr rising of the comstock was an early example of his ministerial friendships and we have seen that henry ward beecher cultivated his company in a san francisco letter of two years before mark twain wrote his mother thinking it would please her i am as thick as thieves with the rev strebens i am laying for the rev scudder and the rev dr stone i am running on preachers now all together and i find them gay so it may be that his first impulse toward joseph twichell was due to the fact that he was a young member of that army whose mission is to comfort and uplift mankind but it was only a little time till the impulse had grown into a friendship that went beyond any profession or doctrine a friendship that ripened into a permanent admiration and love for joe twichell himself as one of the noblest specimens of his race he was invited to the twichell home where he met the young wife and got a glimpse of the happiness of that sweet and peaceful household he had a neglected lonely look and he loved to gather with them at their fireside he expressed his envy of their happiness and mrs twichell asked him why since his affairs were growing prosperous he did not establish a household of his own long afterward mr twichell wrote mark made no answer for a little but with his eyes bent on the floor appeared to be deeply pondering then he looked up and said slowly in a voice tremulous with earnestness with what sympathy he was heard may be imagined i am taking thought of it i am in love beyond all telling with the dearest and best girl in the whole world i don't suppose she will marry me i can't think it possible she ought not to but if she doesn't i shall be sure that the best thing i ever did was to fall in love with her and proud to have it known that i tried to win her it was only a brief time until the twichell fireside was home to him he came and went and presently it was mark and joe as by and by it would be livy and harmony and in a few years uncle joe and uncle mark aunt livy and aunt harmony and so would remain until the end end of chapter sixty eight the rev joe twichell read by john greenman this is section sixty nine of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter sixty nine a lecture tour james redpath proprietor of the boston lyceum bureau was the leading lecture agent of those days and controlled all or nearly all of the platform celebrities mark twain's success at the cooper union the year before had interested redpath he had offered engagements then and later but clemens had not been free for the regular circuit now there was no longer a reason for postponement of a contract redpath was eager for the new celebrity 
and Clemens closed with him for the season of 1868-9. With his new lecture, The Vandal Abroad, he was presently earning a hundred dollars and more a night, and making most of the nights count. This was affluence indeed. He had become suddenly a person of substance, an associate of men of consequence, with a commensurate income. He could help his mother lavishly now, and he did. His new lecture was immensely popular. It was a resume of the Quaker City letters, a foretaste of the book which would presently follow. Wherever he went he was hailed with eager greetings. He caught such drifting exclamations as, "'There he is! There goes Mark Twain!' People came out on the street to see him pass. That marvelous miracle which we variously call notoriety, popularity, fame, had come to him. In his notebook he wrote, fame is a vapor popularity an accident the only earthly certainty oblivion the newspapers were filled with enthusiasm both as to his matter and method his delivery was described as a long monotonous drawl with the fun invariably coming in at the end of a sentence after a pause his appearance at this time is thus set down. Mark Twain is a man of medium height, about five feet ten, sparsely built, with dark reddish-brown hair and mustache. His features are fair, his eyes keen and twinkling. He dresses in scrupulous evening attire. In lecturing he hangs about the desk, leaning on it or flirting around the corners of it, then marching and countermarching in the rear of it. He seldom casts a glance at his manuscript. No doubt this fairly presents Mark Twain, the lecturer of that day. It was a new figure on the platform, a man with a new method. As to his manuscript, the item might have said that he never consulted it at all. He learned his lecture. What he consulted was merely a series of hieroglyphics, a set of crude pictures drawn by himself suggestive of the subject matter underneath new head certain columns represented the parthenon the sphinx meant egypt and so on his manuscript lay there in case of accident but the accident did not happen a number of his engagements were in the central part of new york at points not far distant from elmira he had a standing invitation to visit the langdon home and he made it convenient to avail himself of that happiness his was not an unruffled courtship. When at last he reached the point of proposing for the daughter of the house, neither the daughter nor the household offered any noticeable encouragement to his suit. Many absurd anecdotes have been told of his first interview with Mr. Langdon on the subject, but they are altogether without foundation. It was a proper and dignified discussion of a very serious matter. Mr. Langdon expressed deep regard for him and friendship but he was not inclined to add him to the family. The young lady herself, in a general way, accorded with these views. The applicant for favor left, sadly enough, but he could not remain discouraged or sad. He lectured at Cleveland with vast success, and the news of it traveled quickly to Elmira. He was referred to by Cleveland papers as a lion and the coming man of the age. Two days later in Pittsburgh, November 19th, he played against Fanny Kemble, the favorite actress of that time, with the result that Miss Kemble had an audience of two hundred against nearly ten times the number who gathered to hear Mark Twain. The news of this went to Elmira, too. It was in the papers there next morning. Surely this was a conquering hero, a gay Lochinvar from out of the West, and the daughter of the house must be guarded closely that he did not bear her away. It was on the second morning following the Pittsburgh triumph when the Langdon family were gathered at breakfast that a bushy auburn head poked fearfully in at the door and a low, humble voice said, The calf has returned. May the prodigal have some breakfast? No one could be reserved or reprovingly distant, or any of those unfriendly things with a person like that, certainly not Jervis Langdon, who delighted in the humor and the tricks and the turns and oddities of this eccentric visitor. 
giving his daughter to him was another matter but even that thought was less disturbing than it had been at the start in truth the langdon household had somehow grown to feel that he belonged to them the elder sister's husband theodore crane endorsed him fully he had long before read some of the mark twain sketches that had traveled eastward in advance of their author and had recognized even in the crudest of them a classic charm as for olivia langdon's mother and sister their happiness lay in hers where her heart went theirs went also and it would appear that her heart in spite of herself had found its rightful keeper only young langdon was irreconciled and eventually set out for a voyage around the world to escape the situation there was only a provisional engagement at first jervis langdon suggested and samuel clemens agreed with him that it was proper to know something of his past as well as of his present before the official parental sanction should be given when mr langdon inquired as to the names of persons of standing to whom he might write for credentials clemens pretty confidently gave him the name of the rev stebbins and others of san francisco adding that he might write also to joe goodman if he wanted to but that he had lied for goodman a hundred times and goodman would lie for him if necessary so his testimony would be of no value the letters to the clergy were written and mr langdon also wrote one on his own account it was a long mail trip to the coast and back in those days it might be two months before replies would come from those ministers the lecturer set out again on his travels and was radiantly and happily busy he went as far west as illinois had crowded houses in chicago visited friends and kindred in hannibal st louis and keokuk carrying the great news and lecturing in old familiar haunts End of chapter 69 A Lecture Tour Read by John Greenman This is section 70 of Mark Twain, A Biography This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875 Chapter 70 Innocence at Home and The Innocence Abroad he was in jacksonville illinois at the end of january eighteen sixty nine and in a letter to bliss states that he will be in elmira two days later and asks that proofs of the book be sent there he arrived at the langdon home anxious to hear the reports that would make him as the novels might say the happiest or the most miserable of men jervis langdon had a rather solemn look when they were alone together clemens asked you've heard from those gentlemen out there yes and from another gentleman i wrote concerning you they don't appear to have been very enthusiastic from your manner well yes some of them were i suppose i may ask what particular form their emotion took oh yes yes they agree unanimously that you are a brilliant able man a, a man with a future and that you would make about the worst husband on record the applicant for favor had a forlorn look there's nothing very evasive about that he said there was a period of reflective silence it was probably no more than a few seconds but it seemed longer haven't you any other friend that you could suggest langdon said apparently none whose testimony would be valuable jervis langdon held out his hand you have at least one he said i believe in you i know you better than they do and so came the crown of happiness the engagement of Samuel Langhorne Clemens and Olivia Lewis Langdon was ratified next day, February 4, 1869. But if the friends of Mark Twain viewed the idea of the marriage with scant favor, the friends of Miss Langdon regarded it with genuine alarm. Elmira was a conservative place, a place of pedigree and family tradition, that a stranger, a former printer, pilot, miner, 
wandering journalist and lecturer was to carry off the daughter of one of the oldest and wealthiest families was a thing not to be lightly permitted. The fact that he had achieved a national fame did not count against other considerations. The social protest amounted almost to insurrection, but it was not availing. The Langdon family had their doubts, too, though of a different sort. Their doubts lay in the fear that one, reared as their daughter had been, might be unable to hold a place as the wife of this intellectual giant, whom they felt that the world was preparing to honor. That this delicate, sheltered girl could have the strength of mind and body for her position seemed hard to believe. Their faith overbore such questionings, and the future years proved how fully it was justified. To his mother, Samuel Clemens wrote, She is only a little body, but she hasn't her peer in Christendom. I gave her only a plain gold engagement ring when fashion imperatively demands a two hundred dollar diamond one, and told her it was typical of her future life, namely, that she would have to flourish on substance rather than luxuries. But you see, I know the girl. She don't care anything about luxuries. She spends no money but her astral year's allowance, and spends nearly every cent of that on other people. She will be a good, sensible little wife, without any airs about her. I don't make intercession for her beforehand, and ask you to love her, for there isn't any use in that. You couldn't help it if you were to try. I warn you that whoever comes within the fatal influence of her beautiful nature is her willing slave forevermore. To Mrs. Crane, absent in March, her father wrote, Dear Sue, I received your letter yesterday with a great deal of pleasure, but the letter has gone in pursuit of one S. L. Clemens, who has been giving us a great deal of trouble lately. We cannot have a joy in our family without a feeling, on the part of the little incorrigible in our family, that this wanderer must share it, so, as soon as read, into her pocket and off upstairs goes your letter, and in the next two minutes into the mail, so it is impossible for me now to refer to it, or by reading it over again, an inspiration in writing you. Clemens closed his lecture tour in March and went immediately to Elmira. He had lectured between fifty and sixty times, with a return of something more than eight thousand dollars, not a bad aggregate for a first season on the circuit. He had planned to make a spring tour to California, but the attraction at Elmira was of a sort that discouraged distant travel. Furthermore, he disliked the platform, then and always. It was always a temptation to him because of its quick and abundant return, but it was none the less distasteful. In a letter of that spring he wrote, I most cordially hate the lecture field, and after all I shudder to think I may never get out of it. In all conversation with Goff and Anna Dickinson, Nasby, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Wendell Phillips, and the other old stagers, I could not observe that they ever expected or hoped to get out of the business. I don't want to get wedded to it as they are. He declined further engagements on the excuse that he must attend to getting out his book. The revised proofs were coming now, and he and gentle Livy Langdon read them together. He realized presently that, with her sensitive nature, 
she had also a keen literary perception what he lacked in delicacy and his lack was likely to be large enough in that direction she detected and together they pruned it away she became his editor during those happy courtship days a position which she held to her death the world owed a large debt of gratitude to mark twain's wife who from the very beginning and always so far as in her strength she was able inspired him to give only his worthiest to the world whether in written or spoken word in counsel or in deed those early days of their close companionship spiritual and mental were full of revelation to samuel clemens a revelation that continued from day to day and from year to year even to the very end the letter to bliss and the proofs were full of suggested changes that would refine and beautify the text in one of them he settles the question of title which he says is to be the innocence abroad or the new pilgrim's progress and we may be sure that it was olivia langdon's voice that gave the deciding vote for the newly adopted chief title which would take any suggestion of irreverence out of the remaining words the book was to have been issued in the spring, but during his wanderings proofs had been delayed and there was now considerable anxiety about it, as the agencies had become impatient for the canvas. At the end of April Clemens wrote, "'Your printers are doing well. I will hurry the proofs.' But it was not until the early part of June that the last chapters were revised and returned." then the big book at last completed went to press on an edition of twenty thousand a large number for any new book even today. in later years through some confusion of circumstance mark twain was led to believe that the publication of the innocents abroad was long and unnecessarily delayed but this was manifestly a mistake the book went to press in june it was a big book and a large edition the first copy was delivered July twentieth, 1869, and 417 bound volumes were shipped that month. Even with the quicker mechanical processes of today, a month or more is allowed for a large book between the final return of proofs and the date of publication. So it is only another instance of his remembering, as he once quaintly put it, the thing that didn't happen. In an article in the North American Review, September 21, 1906, Mr. Clemens stated that he found it necessary to telegraph notice that he would bring suit if the book was not immediately issued. In none of the letters covering this period is there any suggestion of delay on the part of the publishers, and the date of the final return of proofs, together with the date of publication, preclude the possibility of such a circumstance. At some point of his life he doubtless sent or contemplated sending such a message, and this fact, through some curious psychology, became confused in his mind with the first edition of The Innocents Abroad. End of chapter 70 Innocents at Home and The Innocents Abroad Read by John Greenman This is section 71 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 71 The Great Book of Travel. The Innocents Abroad was a success from the start. The machinery for its sale and delivery was in full swing by August 1st, and 5,170 copies were disposed of that month a number that had increased to more than thirty-one thousand by the first of the year. It was a book of travel. Its lowest price was three and a half dollars. No such record had been made by a book of that description. None has equaled it since. Editor's note, one must recall that this was the record only up to 1910. Dash D.W. If Mark Twain was not already famous, he was unquestionably famous now. As the author of The New Pilgrim's Progress, he was swept into the domain of letters as one riding at the head of a cavalcade, doors and windows wide with welcome and jubilant with applause. 
newspapers chorused their enthusiasm. The public voiced universal approval. Only a few of the more cultured critics seemed hesitant and doubtful. They applauded, most of them, but with reservation. Dr. Holland regarded Mark Twain as a mere fun-maker of ephemeral popularity, and was not altogether pleasant in his dictum. Dr. Holmes, in a letter to the author, speaks of the frequently quaint and amusing conceits, but does not find it in his heart to refer to the book as literature. It was naturally difficult for the East to concede a serious value to one who approached his subject with such militant aboriginality, and occasionally wrote those kind. William Dean Howells reviewed the book in the Atlantic, which was of itself a distinction, whether the review was favorable or otherwise. It was favorable on the whole, favorable to the humor of the book, its delicious impudence, the charm of its good-natured irony. The review closed, It is no business of ours to fix his rank among the humorists California has given us, but we think he is in an entirely different way from all the others, quite worthy of the company of the best. This is praise, but not of an intemperate sort, nor very inclusive. The descriptive, the poetic, the more pretentious phrases of the book did not receive attention. Mr. Howells was perhaps the first critic of eminence to recognize in Mark Twain not only the humorist, but the supreme genius the Lincoln of our literature. This was later. The public, the silent public, with what Howells calls the inspired knowledge of the simple-hearted multitude, reached a similar verdict forthwith. And on sufficient evidence, let the average unprejudiced person of today take up the old volume and read a few chapters anywhere and decide whether it is the work of a mere humanist or also of a philosopher, a poet, and a seer. The writer well remembers a little group of the simple-hearted multitude, who during the winter of sixty-nine and seventy gathered each evening to hear the innocents read aloud, and their unanimous verdict that it was the best book of modern times. It was the most daring book of its day passages of it were calculated to take the breath of the orthodox reader, only somehow it made him smile, too. It was all so good-natured, so openly sincere. Without doubt it preached heresy, the heresy of viewing revered landmarks and relics joyously rather than lugubriously, reverentially when they inspired reverence, satirically when they invited ridicule, and with kindliness always. The Innocents Abroad is Mark Twain's greatest book of travel. The critical and the pure in speech may object to this verdict. Brander Matthews regards it second to A Tramp Abroad, the natural viewpoint of the literary technician. The Tramp contains better usage without doubt, but it lacks the color which gives the Innocents its perennial charm. In the innocence there is a glow, a fragrance, a romance of touch, a subtle something which is idyllic, something which is not quite reality, in the tale of that little company that so long ago sailed away to the harbors of their illusions beyond the sea, and wandered together through old palaces and galleries, and among the tombs of the saints, and down through ancient lands. There is an atmosphere about it all, a dreamlike quality, that lies somewhere in the telling, maybe, or in the tale. At all events it is there, and the world has felt it ever since. Perhaps it could be defined in a single word, perhaps that word would be youth. That the artist, poor true Williams, felt its inspiration is certain. We may believe that Williams was not a great draftsman but no artist ever caught more perfectly the light and spirit of the author's text. Crude some of the pictures are, no doubt, but they convey the very essence of the story. They belong to it, they are part of it, and they ought never to perish. A Tramp Abroad is a rare book, 
but it cannot rank with its great predecessor in human charm the public which in the long run makes mistakes has rendered that verdict the innocence by far outsells the tramp and for that matter any other book of travel end of chapter seventy one the great book of travel read by john greenman